The story starts with a girl desperately pleading for her innocence, but her father ignores her cries and forcefully drags her along. Earlier, inside the palace, chaos erupted as the princess was poisoned, and Lady Juvelian was accused by a former partner, Miko, sparking palace-wide suspicion. Despite Juvelian's vehement protests and their complicated history, the accusations persisted. The Emperor's harsh decision to imprison her in the ominous Chamber of Shadows left Juvelian feeling abandoned, invoking painful memories of her distant father. Her despair deepens as her father hands her a dagger, and her encounter with the tyrant Crown Prince adds to her fear. Tragically, the story concludes with Juvelian taking her own life, despite the Crown Prince's belated intervention. The narrative then shifts to a different scene, hinting at a mysterious reincarnation or rebirth, setting the stage for a complex and intriguing storyline. Juvelian contemplates ending her relationship with Mikio, a decision that initially surprises him, but she's determined to avoid the tragic destiny predicted in her novel. Miko, in response, angrily tells her not to show her face again, and her unexpectedly cheerful reaction leaves him baffled, wondering if it's all a ploy for attention. Later, she encounters her father, Duke Legis, and decides to break the news of her breakup with Miko. To her surprise, Duke Legis reacts unexpectedly. Juvelian seeks refuge in her room, where her maid mistakes her yawns for tears. Misunderstandings continue when the maid mentions Juvelian's heartbreak to Duke Legis. On a sunny morning, Juvelian wakes up with a sense of optimism, anticipating a good day. However, her routine takes an unexpected turn when her father, Duke Legis, who rarely shares meals with her, summons her for breakfast. The atmosphere at the table grows awkward as the Duke's demeanor changes, influenced by the information he received from the maid the previous night. Feeling self-conscious, Juvelian believes her father sees her as pathetic compared to his heroic legacy from leading the Empire to victory in a war. Duke Legis surprises her with a question about her ideal man, sparking concern that he plans to arrange her marriage for his succession. To avoid this, she boldly claims she seeks a man stronger than her father, a seemingly impossible feat, leading to doubts from her father. Soon after, he stuns her with an unexpected request to go out together, an unprecedented event in her 18 years of life. Their outing takes them to an arcade street filled with merchants promoting their wares. To Juvelian's bewilderment, her father purchases whatever catches her eye, leaving her perplexed. Amidst the bustling street, she encounters an uncomfortable crowd and seeks refuge in an armor store, where her encounter with a tall, sharp-eyed man adds an intriguing twist to the day. Juvelian's visit to the store takes an unexpected turn when a man's reaction annoys her. Initially attracted by his good looks, she quickly becomes irritated by his behavior and informs him that the item he's trying to buy is what she had her eye on, armor polish. Despite the merchant's confusion, Juvelian insists on her interest, making up an excuse about her accessories losing their shine. As the merchant fetches a large quantity of the polish from the storage room, the man takes what he needs, leaves a single gold coin, and departs. Juvelian approaches him to correct the price, inadvertently bumping into him, realizing he must be unfamiliar with the area. She discreetly explains that one gold coin is enough to purchase ten armor polishes. Back with her father, Juvelian, feeling exhausted and bewildered by her father's peculiar behavior throughout the day, stumbles on the stairs, prompting her father to swiftly catch her and carry her back to their carriage. Although she requests to be put down, her father insists on carrying her. However, as he carries her, he imparts an unusual message, urging her to find someone she likes soon. A mysterious sensation suddenly overcomes Javelian's body, causing her to faint in her father's arms leaving him in a state of panic and uncertainty. After being unconscious for four days, Juvelian awakens from a dream in which her father is crying beside her bed, only to discover that her father is nowhere to be found. Legis briefly visits her butt to parts, leaving her somewhat disappointed. In her room, she discovers numerous gifts, flowers, and letters inquiring about her condition during her illness. Determined to shed her past reputation as the villainess, she plans to personally reply to these messages. 
One of her goals is to become independent through rigorous study, despite her family's wealth. However, when she heads to the library to study, she encounters her father there, leading to a series of relentless questioning about the book she's holding. The quiz is finally interrupted when Legis receives a guest, but he immediately tasks her with reading a strategy and tactics book. Exhausted, she discovers a pendant under one of the books, intending to return it to her father. However, while searching for him, she overhears Legis and a man named Max arguing in the aisle. Curious, Yuvelian eavesdrops on Legis and Max's conversation, learning that Max is Legis's student. When she hears Legis say, Sometimes people become much stronger in order to protect that weakness, it triggers memories of her time in the Chamber of Shadows and leads her to suspect that Legis may have someone he wants to protect. Legis adds that Max will likely find someone to protect one day. However, Max arrogantly responds that he hasn't found someone to protect, but believes he has found a rat. Confused, Juvelian takes Max's words literally, thinking there's an actual rat in the house. Legis, realizing Max is referring to Juvelian, sternly warns Max not to harm her, stating that he won't show mercy even if it's Max. Despite Legis's protective words, Juvelian remains unaware that Max sees her as Legis's weakness, believing that Max is referring to a literal rat. Returning to Legis's room, the butler informs him that Mikhail has been persistently sending letters to Juvelian, pressuring her for a response. In his letters, Mikhail condescends to Juvelian, enraging Legis, who orders the butler to ensure that none of Mikhail's letters reach Juvelian, instructing him to burn them all. Meanwhile, Juvelian receives an invitation from Rose Mary, aimed at changing her negative fate in the story. She takes the opportunity to personally respond to the letter, adorning it with lace and flowers. Rosemary expresses her admiration for Juvelian despite her past unfriendly demeanor. The letter exchange becomes a topic of gossip among the ladies. Overhearing this discussion, Mikhail decides to attend Rosemary's party, perhaps seeking closure in his relationship with Juvelian. Juvel embarks on a shopping excursion to find the perfect present for Rosemary, accompanied by an excessive dozen of knights, as per her father's insistence. She visits Ian Fyodor's workshop, recognizing his future potential as a master craftsman, and commissions a gift for Rose Mary. Meanwhile, at the Floyan's Manor, the butler presents Legis with a list of potential suitors for Juvel. Upon seeing Maximilian Cassian's name on the list, Legis reacts with a frown and swiftly orders its removal. However, before he can fully address the matter, he receives urgent summons to the palace. While shopping, Juvel encounters a sparkling item that she believes would be perfect for her father, and as she contemplates the purchase, she is approached by Radian, Michael's cousin and a notorious gossip monger, who takes note of her choice with a mind full of curiosity. Legis is summoned to the Asha Empire Palace to investigate the assassination attempt, necessitating his stay there for a few days to safeguard the Emperor. Meanwhile, Max observes Legis' interactions with his knights, including inquiries about Juvel, and he derives satisfaction from the belief that Juvel is a vulnerability to Legis. In another part of the city, the Gossip King, Radian, relishes his favorite pastime by sowing discord, he informs Mikhail that he witnessed Juvel buying cufflinks for a new acquaintance. As night falls, Juvel anxiously awaits her father's return, wanting to return a pendant she found and gift him the cufflinks. But, in typical comedic fashion, her maid misunderstands the situation, assuming Juvel is upset because her father isn't at home. In a surprising turn of events, Max sneaks into Juvel's room, but his intentions remain unclear. However, Juvel, awakened by his presence, calmly informs him that he's entered the wrong room. Max is captivated by Juvel's fearless demeanor and recognizes her as the girl from the armor shop. They soon establish that Max is not an assassin, but rather her father's student, much to Juvel's relief. Despite her initial fright, thinking Max might be a ghost, the situation takes a tense turn when a palace guard hears voices in the ladies' room. In response, Max draws his sword, pressing it against Juvel's neck to ensure her silence. As Juvel and Max navigate the delicate situation, she catches on to Max's unspoken instructions regarding what to say to the palace guards, 
allowing them to return without raising suspicion. Once the guards are gone, she requests Max to release her. Max reveals that he has no home, prompting Juvel to feel sympathy and speculate that he was kicked out of his home, seeking her father for help, but getting lost in the process. She offers him a place to stay in her room for the night, providing him with a pillow, and then drifts into a deep sleep. This unexpected turn of events frustrates Max, whose original purpose was to eliminate Legis's perceived weakness, but now he finds himself next to Juvel, who seems to be his target, and he suddenly feels overwhelmingly sleepy. Startled awake, she discovers Max sleeping right beside her on the bed and can't help but notice his good looks. However, her worries about a potential scandalous situation taking place reach irrational heights as she fears they might end up in the newspaper. When she tries to wake Max up by reaching out, he defensively reacts, causing Juvel to fall to the ground. Max questions how he ended up there. While Juvel finds his demeanor reminiscent of a grouchy cat she knew when she was young. Anticipating the arrival of her maid, Juvel instructs Max to hide in the closet, explaining that it's to avoid any misunderstandings about them spending the night together. The maid attempts to enter Juvel's room but finds the door locked. Inside, Juvel closes the closet door with Max inside and responds to the maid, who's concerned about her locking the door. Juvel explains that she was simply afraid of someone barging in, but the maid reassures her that even thieves avoid the Floyan household. Meanwhile, Max waits patiently in the closet, contemplating his own irrational actions and reflecting on Juvel's unusual reactions. He hears strange sounds from Juvel's room, sparking eccentric thoughts in his mind. Unbeknownst to him, the maid is applying ointment to her bruises, caused by Max himself. Juvel eventually opens the closet door, inviting Max to join her for breakfast, and he can't help but blush at her kindness. Juvel unknowingly serves Max a cucumber sandwich, not realizing he despises cucumbers. Max decides to summon his courage and tries the sandwich momentarily forgetting his original purpose for visiting Juvel's room. Meanwhile, in the Ashet Empire Palace, Duke Elios meets with the Emperor and suggests setting a trap, rather than keeping Duke Legis exclusively to protect the Emperor. The Emperor appears displeased but is confident in his control over Legis through a mysterious ring. Back in Juvel's room, she reads a book, feeling drowsy as she watches Max sleep. When Max wakes up and questions why she's staring at him, Juvel wonders when he plans to leave, speculating that he might stay until Legis returns and kicks him out. However, she remembers she still has a gift for her father and asks Max's opinion about it, inadvertently fostering a false impression. Max's curiosity gets the better of him, and he asks Juvel to whom she intends to give the cufflinks. Juvel's ambiguous response only adds to the misunderstanding. Max, aware of Juvel's previous interest in Mikhail, assumes she's giving the cufflinks to him to mend their relationship, and he responds with a harsh tone. Annoyed by Max's reaction, Juvel clarifies that she wants to get along with her father and intends to give the cufflinks to him. Max smiles upon learning the truth but still comments on the impracticality of giving cufflinks to a swordsman. However, he reassures Juvel that her father will appreciate the gift. Meanwhile, in the Imperial Palace, Legis is resting in a tree but gets off quickly when his knight brings news about Juvel. The knight explains that Juvel has been anxious due to Legis's absence and is too sick to leave her room, prompting Legis to clench his fists and decide to visit the Emperor immediately. As Juvel struggles to write a letter for her father, Max secretly watches her. She asks Max about his usual conversations with Legis, but he decides to keep the truth to himself, not wanting to reveal that Legis often brags about her. Juvel then decides to write the letter on her own. An hour later, Max is surprised by the outcome. It's a letter of apology. He wonders how Legis will react when he reads it. Meanwhile, in the palace, the Emperor is angry because Legis hasn't caught the assassin. Legis suspects Max's involvement and realizes that Max may be trying to create conflict between him and the Emperor. Despite his anger, Legis gives the Emperor a hostile look. It's decided that Legis will stay one more day to guard the Emperor. Later, Juvel goes to her father's study to leave the present on his desk, but stumbles upon a list of suitors for her. One named Maximilian Cassian Ache, 
the crown prince is specifically circled, leading to another misunderstanding. Juval believes her father is planning to marry her off to the tyrant and psychopathic crown prince, unaware that Legis had actually wanted to remove that name from the list. Still reeling from looking at the suitor list, Juval recalls the first time Legis asked her about her ideal man. Sure, the crown prince has it all, but he's also a heartless psychopath who doesn't hesitate to kill people. Even in Juval's previous life, he tried to torture her. This realization leaves Juval feeling depressed, and she can't help but cry her heart out. Meanwhile, Max is waiting for Juval in her room and catches an assassin sent by the Empress to inform him that he needs to return to the Empire immediately. When Juval returns to her room, she starts thinking hard to come up with a plan to avoid being sold to the Crown Prince. However, Max is nowhere to be found. As she searches for him, her eyes catch a piece of paper on the table. It reads, don't come looking for me. I'll come back when it's time. It seems that someone has become attached to her, even though she never asked for it. While riding on his horse, Max thinks about the letter he left for Juvel on the table and wonders if staying with Juvel is a natural thing, if only the guard hadn't come to pick him up yet. Meanwhile, Juvel falls asleep and wakes up to find that Max is no longer around. When she sees the gift for Legis, she starts worrying that he will be upset about the pendant she found. The maid notices that Juvel has been acting strange lately and assumes it's because the Duke is not around. So she suggests that Juvel take a walk in the sun. The maids have already prepared snacks and cakes, but Juvel's favorite strawberry cake is missing. The maid freaks out and says she's going to make one, leaving Juvel alone. Juvel thinks it's for the best since she needs to solve the pendant and suitor problems before her father returns home. Shortly after, Legis arrives, which shocks Juval. She asks her father if he has eaten dinner and invites Legis to eat with her. Legis arrived earlier than Juval expected and tells her that he will never let her be alone again. Confused by what Legis said, Juval freezes up. Legis requests to have dinner with Juval, holding her hand as they walk to the dining room. Once there, he asks about the party she will attend and if she already has a partner. Juval becomes anxious. She then says she's still struggling to choose among the potential partners who have expressed interest in being her companion. Back in Juval's room, she found many letters requesting to be her partner. Among them were Sir Bormir, famous for his exceptional swordplay and manners as the Imperial Knight, Sir Edmund Rowain, renowned for his beauty and wit, and Sir Ronald Crocus, who was running as the next candidate for Minister of Foreign Affairs. After Marilyn, Juval's maid left the room. Legis notices that she's holding a letter and inquires if Juval has decided on her partner. Marilyn reveals that it's Sir Edmund. Legis asks her about Sir Edmund's reputation and the maid enthusiastically explains. However, suddenly Legis disappears and decides to personally investigate if Sir Edmund is the right partner for his daughter. Intimidated by Legis's glare, Sir Edmund can't utter a word and trembles the whole time. Then Legis stands up and declares, You are unqualified. Sir Edmund asks why Legis comes to visit him in the middle of the night, but all he hears is you're unqualified. At the Floyan residence, the item that Juval ordered from the Theodore workshop has arrived, and it's a magnificent gift. She is informed that Sir Edmund has come to reply to her letter. Fascinated by Edmund's face, she still remembers Max. Suddenly, Edmund falls to his knees to apologize to Juval for accepting another lady as his partner, saying that he thought Juval already had a partner by the rumor spread through society. She tells him that it isn't true, but she accepts his apology. Relieved that Juval forgives him, he asks her to have dinner with him, but Legis's glare makes him take back the invitation and decide to go back home right away. Juval looks perplexed. In the salon blooms, where the nobles gather to gossip, Max overhears them talking about Juval and who will be her partner at Rosemary's party. There are rumors that Juval has already moved on from Mikhail. Max becomes annoyed by the gossip and makes a commotion by dropping his glass. He declares that it's sickening to hear people gossiping. Max enters the room and is greeted by Madame Fresha, the owner. She remarks that it is unusual to see Max being affected by rumors. Madame Fresho wonders why Max has been acting strange since his return from Floyan's house. 
Max inquires about the rumors surrounding Lady Floyan. Madame Fresha explains that the gossip about Lady Floyan's love affair is untrue. She reveals that Juvel has sent a letter to Sir Edmund Rowain, inviting him to be her partner for the party. But he has declined. Max is angry upon hearing this. Madame Fresha then informs Max that Juvel has been rumored to be meeting a secret admirer at night, and the rumor is traced back to Sir Radian Droyal, Mikhail's cousin. Max stands up and asks Madame Fresha to find him something that could work as weapon against the Hessen and Droyal families. But right after he's gone, Madame Fresha realized that Legis already bought that information. Meanwhile, in Floyan residence, Juval is having a quality tea time with her father. Just five minutes ago after Sir Edmund left, Legis came and asked Juval to have tea with him. Legis suddenly asks if she already has a partner. Since she was previously rejected, Juval is afraid Legis is going to bring up matchmaking again. So she says she'll think about it. Legis states that if she can't find a partner, she has to inform him. But the way he asks creates another misunderstanding. Juval asks permission to leave first, but Legis says he also needs to take care of something, and the word something always misleads Juval. Max is waiting for Legis to leave and sees his carriage going away. Max then enters Juval's room, and now he feels like it's his own room. Max scans the room, searching for Juval. He wonders if she has gone to ask someone else to be her partner. It is strange that he suddenly cares about who Juval's partner is going to be. Then, he hears Juval's voice calling him from behind, and she asks him what he's doing in her room. Max corners Juval, demanding to know where she has been. Juval replies that she was downstairs and Max's face lights up with a smile. Juval sighs, and Max moving closer to her. He asks her what is wrong, and Juval is taken aback by how close he is to her. She tells him that she has a lot on her mind, and Max offers to listen. However, Juval is hesitant, so she asks Max to promise not to tell her father. Max readily agrees and even offers to give her everything he has if he tells Legis by accident. Hearing that, Juval laughs and wonders why Max is betting everything he has when he doesn't even have a house. Max blushes at her smile. Juval opens up to Max, sharing the burden of the negative rumors that have been circulating about her secretly seeing another man. She reveals that everyone who has asked to be her partner has run away because of the rumors. Max, blushing, imagines what he would do if Juval asked him to be her partner. In your dream! Juval confesses that actually she doesn't care if she doesn't have a partner, but the real problem is that her father is trying to marry her off to someone. Max is furious at the idea that Legis is forcing her to marry. Therefore, Juval has to show Legis that she already has a partner. Max suggests that there might be a suitable partner for Juval closer than she expected, and Juval thinks for a moment before realizing who Max means. She thanks Max for the suggestion, and Max's cheeks turn red as he thinks about being Juval's partner. However, Juval surprises him by saying she is going to ask Geraldine to be her partner. Max is shocked and enraged, demanding to know who Geraldine is as he had thought Juval was going to ask him. It turns out that Juval has someone else in mind. Who the hell is Geraldine? Max asks Juval about Geraldine and Juval explains that he is her cousin and also her knight. This puts Max at ease, but he can't help but wonder why he feels relieved just by knowing who Juval's partner is. As Max prepares to leave, Juval hands him a pouch of money and offers him a place to stay if he needs it, leaving Max blushing. Meanwhile, Legis intercepts Sir Ronald Crocus on his way to Floyan's Manor. Legis tries to intimidate Sir Ronald and tells him to turn back because he is not qualified to be Juvel's partner. But Sir Ronald is determined and insists that Juvelian will ultimately choose him. When Sir Ronald refers to Legis's daughter only by her first name, Legis becomes angry and Sir Ronald quickly retreats. At Floyan's Manor, Juval is contemplating the rumor about her secret lover, suspecting that Sir Droyal might have spread it. She believes that if Legis wears the cufflinks, the rumor will vanish immediately. Juval and Legis have tea together, and she presents him with the pendant and cufflinks, leaving him speechless. Judging by his reaction, Juval realizes it might be too much to ask Legis to wear the cufflinks. Juval brings up the topic of finding a partner for the upcoming party 
but before she can say anything, her father says that he will attend the party with her. Assuming that Juval was trying to ask him to be her partner and leaving Juval in shock. Max looks disturbed, his thoughts seemingly consumed by Juval. Madame Freja, it appears that she is one of Max's knights, interrupts his thoughts to inform him about Victor, who is acting as Max's proxy. The Emperor's men suspect something is amiss, and Max tells Fresha to instruct Victor to act more convincingly. Fresha then informs Max about the rumors surrounding Juval, warning him that the nobles will be on the lookout for Lady Rosemary's party to slander and embarrass her. In response, Max orders Fresha to attend the party over the weekend and carry out a job. At the party, some ladies are eagerly anticipating Juval's arrival and speculating about who her partner might be. Madame Fresha, overhearing their conversation, joins in and suggests that they can identify Juval's secret lover by finding the person wearing the cufflinks. This piques their interest, particularly since Mikhail is also in attendance. On their way to Rosemary's party, Legis assures Juval that he will be by her side, so she doesn't need to worry. When they arrive, the guests' attention quickly turns to the striking appearance of Juval and Legis as they step out of their carriage. Juval reflects on her past and how she craved attention after being abandoned by her father. She does not want to seek his love again and even plans to run away from him, as he arranged for her to marry the crown prince. She is curious about Legis's feelings towards her, as he treats her like she is precious to him. As Legis holds Juval's hand to steady her, everyone notices the cufflinks he is wearing. They realize that the cufflinks were a gift for her father, but some still doubt it and suggests that it might be another cufflink she bought last minute. Legis's angry glare frightens them. Mikhail sees that, and arrogantly assumes that means Juval is not interested in any man but him. Rosemary and her mother greet Legis and Juval. At first, Rosemary is hesitant to greet Juval, but she eventually does so cheerfully and expresses her gratitude for Juval's attendance. Juval gives Rosemary the gift, which makes her very happy, and the other ladies comment on how innovative it is. Rosemary asks Juvel where she got it, and to everyone's surprise, Juvel reveals that it came from the Fyodor workshop, making them view her in a positive light. Feeling tired from socializing, Juvel steps outside for some fresh air. Max secretly watches her from a nearby tree and is shocked to see her crying. As usual, the tears came after she yawned so hard. Max bounds down from the tree, noticing Juval's tears, and asks her why she is crying. Juval is taken aback by Max's sudden appearance. As he gently wipes away her tears, Max tells her not to cry. He inquires who caused her pain, sounding genuinely concerned. But Juval tells him that if he wants to help her, he should watch his manner towards others. Since she cares about him, she explains to him that if he talks casually to nobles, he could be sentenced to death. She emphasizes that respect towards her is crucial, as it impacts how others treat her. Max begrudgingly agrees. Curious, Juval asks Max why he's there. Max shyly admits that he had other business there, but in fact, he just couldn't resist seeing Juval. Max asks Juval where her partner is, but she tells him that her father is in the hall. Max had assumed that Geraldine was Juval's partner, but it turned out to be Legis instead. As they talk, the music starts to play, and Max asks Juval to dance with him. Juval is hesitant at first, but Max teases her by saying that he doesn't dance with just anyone, which makes Juval blush. To her surprise, Max turns out to be a great dancer. Suddenly, Juval trips on her foot, and Max catches her, causing their faces to be inches apart. Legis, who sees the situation from afar, becomes angry and tells Max to stay away from her. Before this situation happened, Legis was trying to blend in with the other guests. He saw Juval heading out to the terrace and thought she must have been looking for some fresh air. However, Mikhail assumed Juval wanted him to follow her out. But Legis noticed what was on Mikhail's mind and stopped him with a glare. Legis was upset with Mikhail because he dared to look down on his precious daughter. However, he then heard Juval talking with someone. And when he saw the silhouette, he realized it was a man she was with. As their faces got closer, Legis became enraged and rushed over to them to avoid anything happening to Juval. 
After discovering that the man with Juvel is Max, he can't believe that Max would pursue his precious daughter. Despite being furious, he recalls that he had taken Max as his student, fulfilling his promise to Max's mother. But Legis doesn't want Max to get close to Juvel, as he believes that Max is nothing more than a vicious and arrogant prince, despite his good looks and sword skills. Juvel worries that Legis may hurt his hand, as he crushes the wine glass in anger. Seeing her concern, Legis puts on a soft smile and gently asks her to leave from there. Max takes Juvel's hand and asks if her foot is injured, but Legis smacks Max's hand away and tells him it's none of his business. He then lifts Juvel into his arms and tells Max not to come to his house again, as he will be the one to visit Max. Everyone is staring at Legis carrying Juvel, making her feel uneasy. She asks him to let her down, but Legis declines and tells her not to push herself since she's hurt. Actually, Juvel feels embarrassed being looked at by others like that. The other guests are speaking ill of Juvel as they see Legis carrying her, commenting that she is an attention seeker. However, Rosemary interjects and reminds them that Juvel had been unwell in the past and may not have fully recovered yet. The other guests agree, adding that Juvel has always had a weak constitution. Meanwhile, Mikhail overhears their conversation and recalls a past incident when he had thought Juvel was pretending to be weak to gain his attention. But it turned out her condition was genuine. In Juvel's room, Legis advises her to rest and avoid going out for a few days. Juvel is puzzled by her father's sudden concern for her well-being. She begins to suspect that Legis is only concerned about her health so that he can marry her off to the crown prince. Juvel believed she had avoided any potential issues by ending her relationship with Mikhail, but now it seems she may have landed herself in even greater trouble. In Salon Blooms, Max can't stop thinking about Juvel since that day. He even dreams about the moment when he caught Juvel and imagines their faces getting even closer. He then orders Madame Freja to send an invitation to Juvel, but she tells him it will be difficult since Juvel has become very famous and receives many invitations from others. Meanwhile, Juvel is overwhelmed by the numerous invitations she receives. When the butler gives her another letter from Earl Herond, the Empress's mother's family, she doesn't even have the energy to respond. Juvel believes that Legis is busy trying to arrange a marriage with the Crown Prince and feels like she needs to find a way out soon. Suddenly, there's a knock on her window, and it turns out to be Max. Juvel comes up with an idea and invites him inside, asking him to date her. Apparently, the letter from Earl Heron was the one that Max had ordered Fresha to send to Juvel. Knowing that Juvel hadn't replied, Max comes to check on her. He even has to wait until Legis is not home so he can visit Juvel. And look what he got, a proposal to date from Juvel. Max is overjoyed and even starts to daydream about starting a family with Juvel, but his hopes are dashed when she reveals that the relationship will be strictly contractual. Juvel believes that Max would be the perfect candidate to pose as her partner, given his sword skills and his status as Legis's student. But Max seems displeased with that. Juvel tries to make a good offer to Max so that he will accept it, but his dissatisfaction only seems to grow. Then she reveals that the contract will come to an end when she leaves the house, which confuses Max. He asks why she would willingly enter into something that would make her miserable. Juvel explains that her father has arranged for her to marry someone she cannot refuse. Curious, Max asks who it is. Juvel insists on his promise of secrecy before revealing that it is Maximilian Cassian Ache. Max initially didn't pay much attention to what Juvel was saying, but soon realizes that she mentioned his name. He feels awkward and uncomfortable knowing the truth. Juvel wants to show Legis that she is dating someone to avoid being married off to the crown prince. However, Max tries to convince her that the crown prince might be like her, and that marrying the crown prince could benefit her since he will be the next ruler, but Juvel refuses and would rather be alone forever than marry the sadistic tyrant. Max is shocked and leaves, feeling dejected. Juvel wishes that Max would at least give her a yes or no answer. Max returns to Salon Blooms in a gloomy mood, perplexing Madame Fresha. He abruptly inquires about a woman's desire to avoid her future spouse, prompting Madame Fresha to ask if there could be any motive beyond simple dislike for the prospective husband. She suspects an encounter between Max and Juvel, but is met with his denial, 
which almost leads to a revealing slip about a previous conversation with Jovel. Max, sensing Madame Fresha's eagerness, avoids sharing further details and shifts the conversation. However, Madame Fresha discloses disturbing news that the Empress Isabel Rosti Ache, Max's stepmother, has dispatched another assassin to eliminate him. Max recalls Juvel's rejection of a marriage proposal from the tyrannical crown prince and, in an unexpected twist, chooses to spare the assassin's life, leaving Madame Fresha astonished as she's never seen him act this way. Max then inquires about any marriage proposals but, upon hearing none, swiftly departs Salon Blooms. In the Foyan residence, Juvel and Legis share a seemingly pleasant dinner together though Juvel secretly hopes her father won't bring up the topic of marriage. Out of the blue, Legis mentions the crown prince, catching Juvel off guard. She attempts to steer the conversation in a different direction, focusing on the history of the First Empire and its artifacts. This causes Legis to grow pale, and he abruptly excuses himself, claiming an urgent matter needs his attention. Juvel is left perplexed as this behavior is unusual for her father, leaving her wondering about the sudden turn of events. Legis is filled with anxiety after discovering that Juvel is researching the Imperial family, fearing that she might uncover the truth about the ring. He assumes that Juvel may have heard unfavorable rumors about the cruel crown prince, yet she seems accepting of it. In his concern for her happiness, Legis decides that he must take action. When Juvel addresses him, Legis is startled but she expresses genuine concern for him. Although she is curious if she did something wrong during dinner, Legis reassures her with a smile and suggests they go inside due to the cold. During their walk, he encourages Juvel to learn more about the Crown Prince, further confirming her suspicion that he intends to marry her off to the tyrannical Crown Prince. While Juvel outwardly agrees to her father's wishes, she secretly has no intention of complying. As Juvel departs, Legis makes a firm resolution to ensure her happiness and prevent her from ending up with Max. Meanwhile, Juvel contemplates proposing a contractual relationship to Max once again. Feeling down after recent events, Juvel receives a letter from Lady Rosemary inquiring about her health and inviting her to a tea party. Juvel sees this as an opportunity to learn more about the Crown Prince's reputation among high society and discover what he dislikes. Meanwhile, Lady Rosemary expresses her joy upon hearing that Juvel has recovered and is interested in attending the tea party. Other ladies are also excited to meet Juvel. Lady Rosemary then asks Lady Veronica Joanna Terence if she is okay with hosting the party, to which Veronica reluctantly agrees. Veronica is burdened by Rosemary's decision to invite Juvelian to the tea party without consulting her first. When Veronica mentions Juvelian, Mikhail flatters her and asks her to invite him as well, feigning concern for her. Caught up in the moment, Veronica agrees to invite him, unaware of Mikhail's ulterior motives. While shopping for a dress for a tea party, Juval is accompanied by many guards. A kind stranger offers her fashion advice, and the guards appreciate her kindness. Yup, she's Madame Frisia who advises Juval to choose a comfortable dress. Later, Juvel sees a commotion involving Max and Baron Gordon nearby. When the situation escalates, Juvel steps in to stop the argument, surprising Max. Baron Gordon, initially intimidated by Duke Floyan's daughter, Juvel, attempts to impress her but is met with her sharp observation of his mistreatment of others. Juvel reveals Max as her personal guard and warns Baron Gordon not to harm any guards of her household. When Baron Gordon tries to accuse Max of wrongdoing, it becomes clear he was merely jealous of Max's attention and planned to harass him. Tuval diffuses the situation by taking responsibility for Max's behavior, proposing that Baron Gordon insult her in return. Baron Gordon, unable to disrespect Juval, apologizes, and she instructs him to apologize to Max instead, who glares him into fleeing. Max thanks Juval but makes her uncomfortable with his gesture eventually expressing a desire for a contractual relationship. Juvel quickly covers Max's mouth with her hands, signaling him to keep quiet and not reveal anything important to others. Their actions appear to be causing further confusion for those around them. Juvel tells Max to follow her. And once they are inside the carriage, 
She explains that she thought Max was saying no since he didn't answer her. The reason for Max's delayed response is that the sadist tyrant Juval hates so much is actually him. But he can't reveal his identity yet. Juval then asks Max why he went to the arcade since he wasn't shopping. And Max becomes irritated and sensitive, saying what's wrong with that. Actually, the information that Madame Fresha brought to Max about the tea party that Juval will attend, and which will also have Mikhail in attendance, made Max upset. But knowing Max would go to Floyan residence, Madame Fresha informed him that Juvel wasn't there but was going to the arcade. And so here he is. Max becomes furious when he is reminded about Mikhail and decides to accept Juvel's proposal of a contractual relationship to protect her from him. Suddenly, Max asks Juvel why she proposed to him. Juvel explains that it's because he is her father's student. Max is shocked, thinking she was asking to date him, not because she likes him, while he was taking it seriously. But then Juvel adds that Max is the only man she is comfortable doing this with. Max is happy after hearing that, while Juvel thinks to herself that Max's face is definitely her style, despite his personality. Juvel then asks about the payment. But Max seems displeased by what he hears and says that he doesn't need the payment. He is just repaying his debt for getting her injured last time. Juvel suddenly grabs Max's hand, happy to find that he's so nice at heart. Feeling embarrassed, Max asks her to let go of his hand. Juvel tells him that they have to pretend to be lovers now so they can't avoid skinship. She also states that as long as they're in a contractual relationship, they need to hold hands, lock arms, and call each other by name romantically. Juvel then realizes they haven't introduced themselves yet. Just as Juvel is about to introduce herself, Max interrupts her and tells her that he has known her name all along. This revelation bothers Juvel as she realizes that despite knowing her name, Max has been referring to her as you. However, Juvel quickly adds that she knows Max's name as well, having heard her father call him by that name. As Juval thinks Max is a nice name, she believes that someday he'll become a great person as well. Suddenly, Juval resumes discussing the contract, causing an immediate shift in Max's mood. Although he has already declined payment, Juval insists that the contract is necessary for their mutual protection. Despite this, Max assures her that he trusts her and believes she won't harm him. Juval is deeply moved by the level of trust he places in her, as no one has ever trusted her like that before. Juvel explains that he can't be so naive and should not trust anyone, even those closest to him. She insists on making the contract. Though Max said he understands, Juvel is still hesitant and unsure if Max truly comprehends the gravity of the situation. Suddenly, Juvel pulls Max closer, insisting that they need to synchronize their mouth. Max is taken aback, and Juvel instructs him to come closer as it's imperative. Max is flustered, thinking it's too soon for such an intimate interaction and worried that it might be his first kiss. As Juvel approaches, Max shuts his eyes, only to hear her whisper that her personal guard, Geraldine, will inquire about how they met, and they must match their stories. As the carriage shakes, Juvel turns her head, and Max feels embarrassed as he comprehends what Juvel meant. So he got his hopes high again to be slammed down to the ground? Oh, my poor Max. Upon their arrival, Geraldine demands an explanation as expected by Juvel. Introducing Max as her lover, Juvel is met with disbelief from the guards, as they've been guarding her closely but never seen Max. Accusing Juvel only picks Max for his looks. However, Juvel calmly explains that they met at Count Misen's party, much to Geraldine's surprise. Despite his mercenary attire, Geraldine thinks that Max might be a noble and wonders which family he belongs to. Juvel clarifies that Max is not a noble but one of the hired mercenaries. This revelation further shocks the guards. Finally, Geraldine presses Juvel to tell him how they met. Before arriving, Max and Juvel had made an agreement in the carriage about what to tell Geraldine. Max reluctantly agreed to go along with whatever Juvel said. Juvel tells Geraldine that she saved Max and proceeds to tell the fake story. Max was surrounded by a group of noble women, but then Juvel arrived and asked the ladies if they had seen Michael. The ladies ran away, and Max claimed that Juvel had saved him and he wanted to repay her. 
The guards are left speechless and suddenly change their opinion of Max, saying that he may look scary but is actually a softy at heart. Juvel also adds that after meeting him several times, she thought he was the one. After telling the fake story, Juvel invites Max to come inside. Geraldine, who is still in shock, summarizes the story as Juvel being interested in Max just because of his looks. Before they go inside, Juvel is upset to find that Geraldine is glaring at Max because he's a commoner. But actually, Max is the one who's been glaring at them non-stop from the start. Geraldine notices that Max has an unusual aura and wonders who he really is. As Juvel grabs Max's hand, she tells him that she'll protect him no matter what happens. Although he thinks it's nonsense, it still makes him happy. Suddenly, they hear a crash sound of a cup falling down. Legis trembles in great shock upon seeing her precious daughter holding hands with Max. To make matters worse, Juvel introduces Max as the man she loves, leaving Legis even more shocked. Despite Legis having assigned guards to protect Juvel and nothing out of the ordinary happening, the sight before him was unexpected and disrupted his plans of having a peaceful evening with his daughter. Juvel is taken aback by Legis's reaction, which is much stronger than she expects. Legis appears irate as he demands to know what is happening. Juvel remembers that Legis usually doesn't care if she does something wrong, but now he seems furious. She guesses that it's because things aren't going according to his plan. Holding onto Max's arm tightly, Juvel confirms that she and Max are dating officially. Legis remains incredulous about what he heard. They move to the drawing room. Max courteously pulls out a chair for Juvel to take a seat. And in gratitude, Juvel returns a smile. Seeing this unfold before him, Legis can't reconcile Max's kindness towards Juvel with his own perception of Max's cruelty. He suspects that Max is manipulating his daughter into loving him and using her to hasten the rebellion. Legis inquires about how they met, causing Juvel to become apprehensive. She realizes that while she was able to deceive Geraldine and the guards, her father would be harder to trick. In order to make her story more convincing, Juvel decides to blend some truth with lies. She tells Legis that Max was searching for him when he wasn't at home, and because it was late at night, she invited him to sleep in her room since she believed he had nowhere else to go. The mention of the word sleep causes Legis to boil in rage, but Juvel quickly assures him that nothing happened, which Max confirms with a nod. Legis insists that nothing should happen between Juvel and Max, otherwise Max won't leave that place alive. Legis seems desperate, knowing that instead of informing Derek, the butler, to find Max a room, Juvel let Max into her room. Juvel argues that it was too late at night and that Max wouldn't hurt her since he's Legis' student. Legis, on the other hand, knows that Max is an unpredictable and dangerous person, and despite his attempts to reform Max's character, Max remains a tyrant who could potentially harm Juvel. As Juvel seems unaware of the potential danger that Max poses, Legis deeply regrets taking him in as his student. Juvel interrupts Legis' deep thoughts by saying that since she's only ever had unrequited love until now, having someone she loves who loves her back is a miracle. She also reassures Legis that she won't bring shame to his name and requests his blessing for her relationship with Max. Legis is speechless. He remembers Juvel as a child his beloved daughter, and he allowed her to do what she wanted because nothing she did would ever hurt him. However, this time, Legis states that he cannot give his blessing and asks them to break up. Juvel feels helpless, knowing her father is still determined to marry her off to the crown prince. But to their surprise, Max refuses to break up with Juvel. Max recalls the advice Legis once gave him, that people become stronger when they have someone precious to protect and that he would find someone like that someday. Max grasps Juvel's shoulder and proclaims that he has finally discovered his precious one, the person he wants to protect, and it is none other than Juvel. Juvel is impressed by Max's remarkable acting skills. Legis interrupts him, still skeptical of Max's sudden change, as he had previously referred to Juvel as a rat, and now calls her precious. However, Max's reaction is exaggerated stating that he won't just sit idly by if Legis gets in the way of him and Juvel, and that Legis, as his teacher, will take second place. Max's words only intensify Legis's anger, causing him to become even more furious, 
and he announces that he will no longer consider Max his student either. These beast fights are really something. Juvel turns pale as she never imagined things would happen like that. Max asks the confused Juvel to leave the room with him. As they step out, Legis shouts to stop and grabs Max's shoulder. Max glares at Legis and tells him not to tell him what to do. Juvel sees this as concerning and thinks that Max is going too far. However, she tells her father to calm down and assures him that she will handle the situation. Legis is surprised by how Juvel convinces him and loosens his grip on Max, watching them leave. While outside, Juvel expresses her gratitude towards Max for standing up for her, but also tells him that his actions towards her father crossed a line. She clarifies that she never wanted him to be disowned, nor did she want him to insult her father. Juvel believes that forcing something on someone who doesn't want it doesn't help them, but only benefits oneself. Max is taken aback and asks Juvel if she still needs his help. As Juvel takes Max's hand, she explains that she wants his help, but if he continues to help her in that way, she'll have no choice but to find another solution. Max then inquires about what Juvel would like him to do. Juvel requests that Max make amends with Legis and apologize to him. At first, Max is hesitant and almost declines the request, but seeing the sincerity in Juvel's eyes, he softens and agrees. Legis, who has been watching from a distance, is surprised to see Max give in to Juvel's request and begins to question if Max has truly changed. Max and Juvel enter the room, and Juvel offers her apologies for leaving earlier. She then tells Legis that Max wishes to speak with him. Max takes a bow and apologizes, but Legis is still skeptical of his sincerity. He suspects that Max is using his daughter to further his own agenda. Instead of accepting Max's apology, Legis rebuffs him and announces that he is no longer his student. Max is confirmed by this declaration that Legis never intended for him and Juvel to marry. Though Max doesn't understand how Juvel could have misunderstood things, his suspicious eyes indicate that he won't clear things up. As tensions rise between them, Juvel senses the need for a drastic action. She suddenly drops to her knees and apologizes, leaving both Max and Legis in shock. Juvel intends to ask for forgiveness from her father and assert that she will continue dating Max. Seeing this, Max is shocked and tells her to get up, insisting that he will do it instead. Juvel wonders why Max is so agitated and believes that he has no idea how scary Legis can be when he's angry. Juvel responds to Max by stating that she won't get up until she finishes talking to Legis. Upon hearing this, Legis shoves Max away and states that he understands and asks Juvel to get up. Juvel notices that both Max and her father suddenly seem to be getting along, but she believes it's too early to relax. She explains that Max's behavior was a result of his intense love for her and promises to help him improve. She asks Legis to forgive Max and he agrees immediately. Juvel is surprised by his swift reaction, realizing that it was easier than she had anticipated. While both Max and Legis continue to urge her to get up soon and back to square one. While Juvel considers what to say, Legis suddenly says he will forgive what Max said but he makes it clear that it doesn't mean he's approving of their relationship. Juvel tries to convince her father that he doesn't have to give permission right away and asks him to wait and see how things go for a little while. Deep down in his heart, Legis still cannot allow their relationship, no matter how much Juvel begs. However, he has a plan to show Juvel what Max is really like in the hope that they will break up. Eventually, Legis agrees to Juvel's request, which makes both Max and Juvel relieved. Juvel thanks Legis, but he feels guilty for lying to her as he believes he needs to protect her. In Juvelian's room, Juvel is ecstatic that her father has given his approval to her relationship. As she and Max enjoy their tea, Juvel reminds him to draw up the contract and asks if there is anything he wants from her. Enchanted by Max's graceful manner of sipping tea, Juvel speculates whether he might be a runaway nobleman's son. Out of nowhere, Max blurts out that the tea is the most disgusting he's ever had. Juvel takes this as a sign that Max isn't a noble, considering his reaction to the tea, which was supposed to be of the highest quality and his father's favorite. Max finishes writing the contract and hands it over to Juvel. After going through the contract that Max had written, 
Jubal realizes that it's a mess and needs fixing. She spends some time editing it and finally presents the final version to Max, asking him to review it and suggest any changes. However, as soon as he reads it, he tears up the contract that Juvel had painstakingly put together. Juvel is left stunned by Max's sudden action. She thinks to herself that if Max had any issues with the contract, he could have simply communicated them to her. She recalls how Max had never considered her feelings in the past. He would leave without a word after she took care of him for days, suddenly disappear without answering her requests, and get angry at her more than a few times. Juvel realizes that if they are in a contract, they will have to see each other frequently, and she doesn't want someone to look down on her anymore. Then Juvel asserts that she wants to terminate their contract immediately. Let's get back to the contract that Juvel has worked so hard on. She told Max to read it slowly, and this is how Max read it. He thought they would be agreeing on a few basic rules. It turned out to be a detailed and formal contract. When he read the part about both parties having to report their location, if they would be unreachable, Max found it to be excessive. He never even did that with his subordinates. The next section that bothered him was the clause that stated if feasible, the dates would take place in locations with a significant amount of people. Max ripped up the contract and threw it away, solely because of his pride. He felt like Juval was treating him like a pet to show off to others. But upon seeing Max's actions, Juval doesn't stay silent. She decides to break off the contract before they even sign it, which shocks Max to the core. Max explains that they have already obtained permission from Legis, so breaking off the contract is not an option. He brings up the fact that Juval has to marry the crown prince and even badmouths himself, saying that if Juval doesn't do the contract relationship with him, she'll have to marry the trash tyrant. It's as if he's fighting himself. But Juval sticks to her choice, saying that they are not suitable for each other and will only exhaust each other if they continue. Seeing Juval being stubborn, Max says she is being too hasty. Juval points out the contract he ripped up, which shows that Max has no intention of compromising, and says she cannot sign a contract with someone like that. Max is surprised and recalls his behavior towards his subordinates when he ripped and tossed away documents they gave him. Essentially, ripping up documents is a habit for him. Juval then tells him that she doesn't like it when someone ignores her opinions, as it hurts her self-esteem and makes her feel terrible all day. Max listens to her complaints, but his pride tells him why should he be careful with her since he's the one helping her. However, Juval seems to be able to read his mind and tells Max that if it's too difficult for him to help her, then it's better to end it since she's the one who asked him for help. Max is struggling to decide how to react. Part of him feels that if he continues to be stubborn, he may never see Juval again. However, his pride is telling him not to care about it. When he sees Juval's glum expression, he makes a quick decision to set his pride aside and apologize to her. Obediently, he signs the contract. His sudden change confuses Juval, but it's a good thing anyway. Juval is relieved that the contract is finally completed, while Max feels manipulated. Oh, come on! Your thoughts are the ones that manipulate you, Max. Juval is so excited to announce that they're lovers. She intends to ask Max to accompany her to the upcoming tea party at Count Terence's house. Max asks Juvel if she knows who's going to come to the party, and Juvel mentions her friend Lady Rosemary and some of her other friends. Judging by her answer, Max confirms that Juvel has no idea that Mikhail will also be there. Max suddenly stands up and tells her that he will be her companion to the party. Juvel wonders why Max looks so enthusiastic. The day of the tea party. To the surprise of everyone, Veronica brings Mikhail along with her. She explains that she followed the rules and invited whoever she wanted as the host of the party. Rosemary objects, insisting that everyone should have agreed on the guest list beforehand. Mikhail interrupts her, saying that Rosemary is the one who makes decisions without consulting others. He then grabs Veronica's shoulder and criticizes Rosemary for being strict with everyone except herself. The other ladies seem to agree with Mikhail, stating that Rosemary only obtained permission after she had already invited Juval. Therefore, they believe that it is not a big deal, as two guests are exceptions to the rule. Mikhail smirks and puts on a smile, thanking the ladies. 
Rosemary still feels uneasy about Juval and worries that she will become uncomfortable when she finds out that Mikhail is present. Suddenly, the door opens and Juval enters with Max, surprising everyone. Mikhail's expression turns dark upon seeing Juval with another man. As Mikhail believed he had already removed the obstacle to attend the party, seeing Juval with another man came as a shock. Rosemary politely asks Juval who the man accompanying her is, to which Juval introduces Max as her lover. The other ladies express their amazement at how handsome Max is, and comment that Juval and Max make a great pair. Max quietly hopes that the ladies would repeat their comments louder so that Mikhail can hear them. Juval thinks Max's acting isn't bad at all, and she should praise him once they're done. But they have forgotten something. Mikhail is still seething with anger. The first thing Max does upon meeting Mikhail in person is to glare at him, while Mikhail thinks that Max is looking down on him. The other ladies are excitedly watching a live drama unfold before them, a confrontation between the current and ex-boyfriend. Mikhail still believes that Juval is only pretending to seek his attention. He assumes that Max is a commoner since Juval did not mention his family name, and she randomly chose him to provoke a reaction from Mikhail. Mikhail quickly changes his mood and greets Juval with a smile. Upon seeing Mikhail's reaction, Max becomes angry, and Juval wonders if something is wrong with Mikhail for greeting her so happily. However, Juval ignores Mikhail's hand and responds to him normally. Then Juval turns to Max and expresses her gratitude for accompanying her. Max then takes Juval's hand and wraps his arm around her, as if to show Mikhail that Juval is now with him. While Juval assumes that Max is nervous based on his expression, Rosemary suddenly interjects and suggests that Max join the tea party, which causes Juval to become worried. The other ladies agree with Rosemary's suggestion, which only further exacerbates Juval's concerns. But what's on Max's mind is that since Rosemary is on his side, she must be on Juval's side, making her number one ally. Just as Juval is about to decline the offer, Mikhail suddenly disagrees, followed by Lady Veronica, who offers Max a room to wait in instead. Juval sees this as a blessing as she was worried about taking care of Max during the tea party, but now she feels safe thanks to Veronica. Mikhail attempts to impress Veronica with his charm, hoping that Juval will take notice. Observing Juval's reaction, he concludes that she will never be able to forget him easily and that he still has a hold on her, regardless of what she does. However, what Juval actually observes is the way Veronica behaves around Mikhail, which brings back memories of when she was deeply in love with him. Despite Mikhail being destined to marry the princess, he still pretends to act sweetly towards Veronica. Juval wishes that Veronica won't be a villainess if her story ends tragically. While waiting in the room as per Juval's request, Max realizes he can't just sit idly without knowing what Mikhail might do. Remembering Frege's account of how Mikhail mistreated Juvel, he stands up with a resolve to take action. Mikhail continues to work on his acting, trying to make Juvel jealous by asking Veronica to go on a picnic sometime, and Veronica takes it seriously. Mikhail's intention is to make Juvel see and hear everything he does with Veronica and act as if Juvel was in the past. However, Juvel is not paying attention to what Mikhail is doing, as she is engrossed in conversation with Rosemary and other ladies about Max. Failing to get the desired result, Mikhail feels defeated. Suddenly, Rosemary suggests that Juval join their tasting event as the newest member. But Juval is surprised and declines politely. Mikhail still can't believe what he sees. Juval's expression isn't addressed to him, but to the ladies. As the other ladies express their excitement for the new member, Juval struggles with the decision to join. However, Veronica is against it and reminds the ladies of the proper procedure for joining. Just as Juvel is about to decline again, she catches something out of the corner of her eye and is shocked to see Max watching her from a tree outside the window. Juvel worries that others might see Max and cannot concentrate on what Rosemary is explaining about the requirements. Seeing Juvel staring at the window, Mikhail's curiosity leads him to find Max on the tree, which shocks him. Juval is distracted by how to get Max back to the room quickly, so she simply answers Rosemary's question without much thought. Just as Mikhail's eyes meet Max's, Max gives him a rude gesture, which angers Mikhail. 
He rises from the couch and asks for permission to get some fresh air. Veronica tries to reach his hand and follow him, but Mikhail abruptly shoves her hand away and insists on going alone, leaving Veronica shocked. Meanwhile, Juvel is still worried that someone might spot Max on the tree, but when she looks back Max is nowhere to be found. As the other ladies express their excitement about trying Juvel's special tea, Juvel becomes confused. She had been too distracted by Max to pay attention to their conversation. When Rosemary also expresses anticipation for the tea, Juvel asks what they are talking about. They explain that they are looking forward to a tea party where Juvel will provide the special tea as a requirement for signing up. Juvel turns pale with shock. Mikhail suddenly rushes out of the room, holding a sword. While Max is already waiting for him outside and even comments that it took him too long, further enraging Mikhail. While in the restroom, Juvel let out a sigh at the idea of hosting a tea party she hadn't planned for. Suddenly, Veronica enters looking upset and calls out her name, asking why Juvel had been staring at her during the tea tasting and then sighing. Juvel is taken aback by the fact that her emotions were revealed without her awareness. She clarifies that she is angry with Mikhail because he also took advantage of her in the past and his kindness was not genuine. Hearing this, Veronica becomes angry and denies that Mikhail has taken advantage of her like he did to Juval. Juval empathizes with Veronica, knowing how difficult it is to admit it, just as she once did. She apologizes for making Veronica uncomfortable and expresses her concern for her since Veronica reminds her of herself. Despite that, Juval decides to leave first, reassuring Veronica that she will host the tea party and that she doesn't have to attend if she doesn't want to. Meanwhile, Mikhail is fuming with anger and his hand instinctively reaches for his sword. But before he can draw it out, Max's knee catches him off guard, causing him to fall to the ground. Surprised by Max's strength, Mikhail demands to know who he is and why he is with Juvel. Max glares back, refusing to answer. But suddenly, Mikhail's sword is at his throat. With a smirk, Max reveals that he and Juvel are lovers. This revelation only fuels Mikhail's fury, but Juvel interrupts, shouting at him to drop his sword. As he turns to face her, he calls her Juvelian, but she corrects him, insisting that he address her as Lady Floyan instead. As Mikhail puts his sword back, he can't help but feel that Juvel is distancing herself from him because of Max. In Juvel's presence, Mikhail approaches and questions her about her relationship with Max. Juvel, in turn, asks Mikhail why he drew his sword on her lover. As Mikhail begins to explain himself, he once again refers to Juvel by her name, prompting Max to remind him to address her by her title, Lady Floyan. This upsets Mikhail, and as he is about to draw his sword again, Juvel reminds him that her father will not be pleased to hear that a knight of the palace drew his sword so hastily. In a surprising turn, Juvel runs to check on Max's well-being, leaving Mikhail in disbelief. Upon seeing Juvel's concern for Max, Mikhail grabs her hand and implores her to hear him out. Max's anger flares up, and he demands that Mikhail release Juvel's hand. But Juvel calms him down and requests to speak with Mikhail for a bit. This causes Max to furrow his brow, while Mikhail takes it as a sign that he has won Juvel's favor. When Mikhail suggests they go somewhere to talk, Juvel firmly commands him to let go of her hand. This catches Mikhail off guard, while Max appears to be the victor in the situation. After Juvel teaches Mikhail a lesson and lets go of his hand, he shouts at her, accusing her of ignoring him and choosing an uneducated commoner. Juvel and Max turn around in confusion, realizing that Mikhail still thinks of her as the old her. Dude, people change. Juvel makes it clear that she has no interest in him anymore, but Mikhail confronts her, claiming that she said she loved him. Juvel clarifies that she did love him, but now she doesn't. As she and Max walk away, Juvel tells Mikhail that she doesn't want to talk to him or get involved with him anymore. The other ladies witnessing the situation slowly move away, but Veronica tries to comfort Mikhail. However, he brushes her off and tells her to stop clinging to him like an insect, causing Veronica to fall to the ground in shock. She recalls what Juvel had told her in the restroom, and tears start to stream down her face as she realizes how Juvel felt before. While in the carriage, 
Juval fixes her gaze on Max and thinks about the need to instill discipline in him. She warns him about being cautious in front of others, specifically about the altercation with Mikhail, as it could lead to serious consequences. However, Max brags about his strength and insists that he can even take on 10 Mikhails at once. Juval clarifies that she is not underestimating his abilities but is concerned about his safety. Nonetheless, Max remains arrogant and claims that nothing can harm him. Juval then stands up, facing him directly, emphasizing that she is concerned for his well-being. Even though he may be powerful, he cannot afford to be complacent and show any weakness, especially if he has multiple enemies who may be waiting for the right moment to strike. Juval recalls how her previous life ended due to the enemies she had made with her actions, causing them to abandon her at a critical moment. Seeing Juval's expression, Max says he'll do what she wants, which surprises her. She hesitates, unsure if Max fully understands that his life is on the line. But Max assures her that he understands she doesn't want him to attack or fight back against nobles. Juval is relieved that Max finally understands and thanks him for agreeing. However, Max admits that what really satisfies him is teaching people who annoy him a lesson. Despite this, seeing Juval worried about him makes him feel like being nice is a good choice. In the Floyan residence, Max looks shocked to learn that Juval's invitation to dinner is not just for the two of them, but also includes her father. Legis, with his sharp glare, tells Max to take a seat. However, Max remains frozen in shock prompting Legis to repeat the command more fiercely. Um, Dad? Could you be a little nice to our Max? Unbeknownst to Juval, her father was actually home, which resulted in this unexpected situation. Max takes a seat beside her and the servants begin to serve the food. Juval instructs Max to use the outermost spoon for the soup, but he becomes confused as he already mastered table manners at a young age. Before he can say anything, Juval's reassuring expression prompts him to trust her guidance. The servant then asks how they would like their steak cooked, to which Juval quickly orders both hers and Max's to be medium rare. Max's face pales as he hates undercooked food. Despite this, he obediently follows Juval's guidance on which utensils to use, causing him to miss his chance to object. Legis watches them as Juval wipes the sauce from Max's face. He thinks to himself that Juval has been tricked once again and believes that she should not trust men so easily. When the steak arrives at the table, Juval insists on cutting Max's steak for him, which he finds somewhat embarrassing. Observing this, Legis calls Juval over, unhappy that Max is making her use her delicate hands to cut his food. Max becomes alarmed when he sees Legis pointing a knife at him, fearing for his safety. However, Legis merely wants Juval to pass him Max's plate so that he can cut the steak for him. Juval interprets this as her father's attempt to reconcile with Max. While cutting into the meat, Legis observes that the inside looks different from the outside and uses this as a metaphor to comment on Max's behavior towards Juval. Max, on the other hand, points out the metaphor to Legis, who is pretending to accept their relationship. However, Juval thinks that what Legis said refers to the medium-rare steak. Legis then suggests they drink some tea together later. Juval interprets this as a sign that Legis cares about Max, although Max really just wants some alone time with Juval. Despite this, Juval agrees and even offers to serve them some tea that she made. Legis and Max are touched to hear that Juval will serve them her personally made tea. However, the butler interrupts and informs Legis that the Emperor has urgently summoned him to the palace. Juval reassures Legis that he can go and that they can drink the tea later, but Legis declares that he cares more about Juval's tea and is joined by Max in agreeing with him. So there they are, having a tea time together. Meanwhile, Juval appears worried about the Emperor's potential disdain towards her. Legis compliments her tea, which pleases Juval. Afterward, Legis requests that Juval leave first, stating that he needs to speak with Max. After Juval leaves the room, Legis confronts Max, asking about his intentions towards Juval. Max gets defensive and stands up, asking Legis what he means by Max planning something. However, Max suddenly pauses, realizing the depth of his feelings for Juval. Despite this, Legis continues to confront Max and tells him to stop pretending to be Juval's lover. Max blushes as he confesses his love for Juval, 
leaving Legis in shock. Max tries to convince Legis that his feelings towards Juval are genuine and that he has fallen in love with her. He recalls the moments he spent with her, initially approaching her with ulterior motives, but finding comfort and ease in her presence. He no longer feels the need to act tough around her and is even willing to do things he normally hates. Losing to her doesn't feel bad anymore, as he is afraid that she might leave him. All of these experiences have led him to the realization that he has come to love Juval. Legis cannot believe Max's confession. However, Max stresses that he will not change his mind, even as Legis looks at him in disbelief. Max also explains to Legis that he is hurting his feelings by treating him like a demon, when he is not. Despite Max's explanation that he is not a demon, Legis still thinks of him as one who has taken his daughter. Max firmly tells Legis that he has no plans of breaking up with Juval and leaves him stunned. Meanwhile, Juval is wondering if Max and her father are having a nice conversation. While I can say that it was a nice confession, despite not planning any of it, Juval sees their dinner together as a positive thing. She imagines the way Max and her father looked at each other and finds it truly mesmerizing. Suddenly, Max knocks on the window, interrupting Juval's daydream. She is surprised but pleased that Max is showing an improvement in his behavior by knocking first, despite entering through the window. As Juval opens the window, she sees Max's face is red and asks if something happened to him while grabbing his face. Max's heart beats faster and louder. Yeah, I can hear it from here. And his smile softens as he squeezes Juval's hand. He says he gets it now. The day has come when Max feels the darkness within him is suddenly covered by a beautiful light. However, Juval doesn't understand what he means by getting it. Max sits close to Juval and keeps staring at her, making her feel uncomfortable. Juval asks what he talked about with her father, and Max answers that Legis was doubting their relationship. This news stuns Juval, despite her efforts to act affectionate towards Max. Max proposes that they spend more time getting to know each other, and they share their interests with each other. However, Juval's mood abruptly shifts as she worries that Legis will discover the truth, given his persistence in pursuing the prince. Surprised by Juval's words, Max asks if she hates the crown prince that much. Juval admits that the crown prince is frightening, and there are rumors that he killed his closest servant without warning. Max cannot even reveal the reality that the servant was trying to poison him. Despite trying to convince Juval not to judge the crown prince based on rumors, Juval remains scared that the crown prince might threaten her life. Max feels helpless, but then he asks Juval if she would marry the crown prince if he promised not to kill her. Juval feels a shiver run through her body, thinking that Max is obsessed with the crown prince, but she says that she would consider it if the crown prince promised not to kill her. Max is happy to hear Juvel's answer and believes that as long as he tells Juvel that he won't kill her, they will get married. Meanwhile, Juvel cannot stop shivering as she keeps seeing the crown prince's image in her head. Abruptly, Max rises to his feet and requests permission to depart, driven by a desire to improve his reputation. It's time for him to return to the palace. As Juvelian slumbers, she experiences a sense of unease drifting into a dream of her childhood with her mother. In this dream, her mother informs her they are about to play hide-and-seek, instructing her to remain concealed inside the wardrobe until her mother grants permission to emerge. The young Juval inquires if her father will join the game, but her mother suddenly exclaims that the other person is a monstrous entity and advises her not to reveal her whereabouts. Anxious, Juval queries what might occur if the monster discovers her. However, before her dream mother can respond, a large hand seizes her tiny neck, revealing itself as the crown prince who ominously informs her that she will meet her demise. Startled, Juval awakens in a state of shock. She feels unwell and contemplates calling a doctor. Her mind lingers on the dream of her mother, even though she lacks any real recollection of her. In the palace, the Emperor appears furious as he reads the news. Legis finally arrives and greets the Emperor, who responds with a complaint about the long wait for Legis' arrival. Legis apologizes and informs the Emperor that unforeseen problems had arisen. However, the Emperor appears indifferent to his explanation and promptly orders Legis to depart for the South immediately. This comes as a shock to Legis. 
The Emperor reveals that he has received information indicating that Margrave Lennox is planning a rebellion, as he audaciously assembled an army without the Emperor's knowledge. Margrave Lennox, the southern lord and a brilliant tactician, has consistently upheld a formidable army. His current assembly of troops at this particular moment strongly suggests that he is preparing for a potential invasion by the neighboring Reagan. Legis believes that the Emperor, who often misinterprets the loyal actions of Lennox's subjects, is making another misguided assumption. He feels that he shouldn't be separated from Juval due to an arbitrary and seemingly useless order like this. Legis attempts to convince the Emperor by offering an explanation regarding Lennox's unwavering loyalty, highlighting how Lennox has consistently protected the Empire from Reagan. The Emperor, wearing a smirk, retorts that Lennox's loyalty is rooted in the fact that he is not under the Emperor's control. He also expresses no doubt about Legis's loyalty, reasoning that Legis has no option but to remain at his side. Hearing this, Legis experiences a mix of distress and powerlessness. He harbors a strong desire to eliminate the Emperor, but recognizes that he cannot do so at this moment, with his primary concern being the worry that would consume him if he left Juval behind. His beloved daughter, who bears the wounds he has inflicted, has suffered such misfortune merely for loving a father who he believes doesn't deserve that love. Legis is resigned to the idea that it's acceptable if Juval harbors everlasting resentment towards him, for he acknowledges that his actions are unforgivable. Nonetheless, he remains steadfast in his love for her, and it has never wavered for even a single moment. Legis contemplates whether he can simply remove the collar encircling his neck, thus granting him the freedom to love Juval without restraint. However, his thoughts are abruptly interrupted as someone enters the room causing both Legis and the Emperor to be taken aback. It is Max, appearing in his Crown Prince guise, who exclaims that he has missed his father, the Emperor. The Emperor is utterly shocked by Max's unexpected appearance, and Max questions if they were engaged in a crucial discussion. With an intimidating gaze, he presses the Emperor to divulge the subject of their conversation. This strikes fear into the Emperor's heart, as he realizes that Max has grown significantly and now poses a potential threat to him. The Emperor is concerned that Max might take action against him in Legis's absence. Legis then explains to Max that he is currently receiving a confidential order and politely requests Max to depart. However, Max raises his tone and asserts that Duke Foyan has the audacity to issue orders to him. In response, Legis informs Max that refusing to leave would equate to disobeying an imperial command. As Legis confronts Max in front of him, the Emperor realizes that he still has his loyal enforcer and considers the need to retain Legis by his side to keep Max in check. Consequently, he decides to send someone else to the south. The Empress becomes enraged upon discovering Max's return to the palace, and her frustration mounts as her attempts to dispatch assassins to eliminate Max have proven futile. Suddenly, the princess approaches and soothes her mother, suggesting that if her brother is returning, they should extend a welcoming embrace. Legis departs from the palace, contemplating the recent turn of events where the emperor rescinded the order to send him to the south, choosing instead to maintain his protection duties. A satisfied smile forms on Legis's face as he recognizes that Max's presence can be a means to exert pressure on his own father, sparing him from the journey south. However, as Legis proceeds down the hallway, Max intercepts him and expresses his desire to have a brief conversation with Legis, seeking his approval for this discussion. In Max's room, the servant serves drinks for them, and as she exits the room, Max removes his helmet. Legis inquires about the topic Max wishes to discuss. Max, in turn, asks Legis what transpired during his conversation with the Emperor. Legis reminds Max that it was a confidential order he discussed, to which Max displays his discontent and contemplates alternative ways to compel Legis to reveal the information. Max then attempts to broach the subject of the earlier assassination attempt on his father, but Legis dismisses Max's concern. In a satirical tone, Legis remarks that the mastermind behind the attempt remains undiscovered. His stern glare hints that he is aware of Max's involvement but will overlook it if Max steers clear of Juval. Max endeavors to assert his authority over Legis, but once again, he fails. 
Legis then asks permission to leave, whispering to Max that he managed to avoid being sent to the south, thanks to Max's interference. With a piercing gaze, he warns Max to keep his distance from his daughter. Frustrated, he hurls the cup near him. But fortunately, the knight in his room skillfully intercepts it, remarking that the cup is incredibly expensive. Meanwhile, Max contemplates his next move. His first idea is to send Juval a letter from the crown prince. But he realizes that Legis is likely to instruct his butler to destroy any letters from him. Subsequently, Max makes the decision to seek advice from Fresha. However, the knight informs him that if advice is what Max seeks, he is capable of providing it as well. Max calls out to Victor, leading Victor to open his helmet. Max then hands his helmet to Victor, cautioning him that it won't bode well for him if his true identity is ever discovered. After this exchange, Max departs. Annoyed, Victor hurls the helmet to the ground and begins to grumble. But then Max calls out to him from behind. In response, Victor quickly makes an excuse, claiming that his hand slipped due to the helmet's polished surface. Max proceeds to ask Victor how to send a letter without alerting the master of the house. Victor appears puzzled by Max's question, prompting Max to point out that Victor is renowned as the biggest playboy in the army. Max's expression grows stern as he insists that Victor provide him with the answer. Max is in the process of tying a small piece of paper to a bird's foot and issues a threat to the bird should it fail to deliver the letter to its intended recipient. As the bird takes flight, Max wonders if Juval, upon reading the letter, will be relieved of her concerns. In Juval's room, she is engrossed in scribbling something on a piece of paper. Anxieties about the upcoming tasting event gnaw at her, particularly concerns that her confrontation with Veronica might deter guests from attending. While gazing out the window, she suddenly lets out a startled cry upon seeing a bird aggressively pecking at the windowpane. Trembling with fear, Juval observes the persistent pigeon's desperate attempts to breach the window. Her maid, Marilyn, enters the room bearing a tray of desserts and is taken aback by Juval's obvious distress. Juval implores her to shoo the persistent pigeon away. Marilyn hastily seizes the tray and flings it toward the bird. As the pigeon takes flight, Marilyn notices a letter fastened to its foot. She then informs Juval that the bird is a carrier pigeon, which leaves Juval puzzled. Carrier pigeons are typically employed for the transmission of confidential messages, a mode of communication that is deemed inappropriate among nobility as a matter of courtesy. This method is primarily reserved for use on the battlefield. Juval hastily jumps to the conclusion that the letter delivered by the carrier pigeon is a threat, while Marilyn entertains the notion that it might be a love letter. Juval ponders the situation, her instincts alerting her to the likelihood of something more sinister lurking behind this mysterious message. The pigeon returns to Max, who reacts with anger, causing the bird to tremble. Suddenly, Frisia emerges from behind Max, noting his attempt to send a letter using a pigeon. Max explains that the letter was intended for Juval but failed to reach its destination. Frisha inquires about the content of the letter, and Max responds that he had written, I will not kill you. Frisha feels relief that the message didn't get through, and she elucidates her thoughts on the idea, which felt like a figurative knife to Max's heart. She also advises him that if he wishes to meet Juval as the crown prince, he must find a suitable pretext for the meeting, to which Max agrees. As he releases the bird, he inquires about the latest news from the palace. Fresha informs him that rumors of Margrave Lennox amassing an army have reached the Emperor's ears. Max ponders this news and deduces that the neighboring Reagan might be indicating preparations for an invasion. Fresha adds that aside from an increase in food supplies, there haven't been any other suspicious signs. And the reason given is famine relief. Hearing these explanations, Max decides to arrange a meeting with Margrave Lennox. This decision shocks Fresha as she believes it's too perilous since Lennox has fallen out of favor with the Emperor, and such a meeting could be seen as treason. However, Max views it as an opportunity, explaining that if successful, they would not only gain control of the South, but also rally the entire Empire to their cause. The stage has been set for him, and now he just needs to win the hearts of the people and leverage this opportunity to strengthen his position.
On the day of the tasting event, Jewel feels weary after her shock with the pigeon the previous night, though she's relieved that she managed to resolve everything. Marilyn informs her that the guests have arrived, with Rosemary being among the first to greet her cheerfully. Following her is Veronica, whose presence surprises Juvel as she didn't anticipate Veronica's attendance. According to the Empire's customs, both the master and mistress of the house should come out to welcome guests, even for a small gathering. However, given her father's personality, Juvel assumes that he wouldn't concern himself with such formalities and intends to handle it herself. While Juvel is lost in thought, the guests are taken aback by something behind her. One lady quietly asks Rosemary if Juvel has an older brother, to which Rosemary clarifies that he is not Juvel's brother. This leaves Juvel bewildered, pondering the lady's remark about a brother. When she turns around, she is astonished to find her father descending the stairs to greet all the guests. Juvel is taken aback to see Legis, as she hadn't informed him about the party, knowing he wouldn't come out for such occasions. The guests bow in greeting to Legis, but he promptly suggests putting aside formalities. Legis then expresses his pride in Juvel for arranging the party all by herself, while affectionately patting her head. Juvel is flattered and extends her gratitude. She senses that Legis has changed, appreciating the way he now treats her as if she were his cherished daughter. As it's time to serve the tea, Rosemary is impressed by the tea's taste, and other guests also offer compliments about Juvel's tea. One lady inquires about the method to achieve the unique flavor. However, Juvel appears to be spacing out and becomes distracted when someone calls her name. She then explains how she infuses the tea with the scent of flowers by storing flower petals or fruit alongside the tea leaves, which imparts the scents into the tea and enhances the flavor. Her explanation leaves the ladies even more astounded. Yet, in reality, it's the result of her hard work and dedication, and it also serves as a tribute to the flowers she has guarded with her life. Legis observes Juvel from a distance and smiles upon seeing the happiness in her face. He contemplates whether Juvel is aware that she is the reason he has found a purpose to keep living. His mind drifts back to an event 13 years ago, when he had returned home, covered in blood, visibly frustrated as he lay on his bed. His hands, stained with blood, represented his sense of helplessness and the question of how much longer he would have to endure his life as the Emperor's enforcer. This frustration only intensified. However, his mood shifted abruptly when the door creaked open, and the young Juval entered the room, greeting her father with cheerfulness. She approached the bed, but Legis believed he couldn't face her in his current state. With her father's lack of response, Juval climbed onto the bed and nestled in Legis's arm. She then began to say a prayer while patting her father, her words asking for his protection and for the world to become bright and beautiful, allowing him to smile brightly too. Legis was deeply moved and tears welled up in his eyes as he realized that Juval was his source of solace and his savior. He pledged eternal love for her. Legis's demeanor changes as he reflects on this past memory. Juval notices the shift in his expression, and when their eyes meet, Legis abruptly turns away and departs, leaving Juval puzzled by her father's unusual behavior. Suddenly, Veronica shares some news that the crown prince has returned to the capital, this revelation stuns everyone in the room, particularly Juval. Shortly thereafter, Max arrives, offering apologies for his tardiness. As Max walks in, all the ladies are totally smitten by his looks. Juval tells him to grab a seat next to her. When Juval and Max catch everyone's attention, Veronica blurts out with relief that Juval has a partner, so she won't be considered for the crown princess role. This shocks both Juval and Max, but they have different perspectives. Juval is terrified at the mention of the crown princess, while Max sees it as his mission to make Juval the crown princess. The other ladies are horrified too, and they start gossiping about the crown prince. Max, hearing their hurtful comments right in front of him, can't help but feel invisible pain. He looks at Juval, hoping she won't join in the bashing. The ladies continue spreading nasty rumors about the crown prince, saying he not only has a hideous face, but also a monstrous personality, which is why the previous empress banished him from the palace. Max is stunned and Juval feels they've crossed a line. Trying to prevent things from escalating, 
Juval suggests that they shouldn't judge the crown prince since they haven't met him in person. She believes he could be much better than they assume. Max is touched by Juval's words. The other ladies agree with her, but Juval's true concern is that the more they trash talk the crown prince, the more danger they're putting themselves in. She just wants to prevent anyone from facing consequences for insulting the imperial family. Max is impressed by Juval's refusal to judge someone solely based on rumors. Rosemary agrees with Max, admitting that she initially thought Juval was scary, just like the rumor suggested. Juval tries to avoid eye contact, feeling like she was indeed a villainess not long ago. Rosemary admires Juval, mentioning how kind and gentle she has been, and other ladies join in, praising Juvel's acts of kindness, like sharing the secret behind her tea. Suddenly, Veronica interjects, insisting that the judgment on Juvel's membership in the tasting party should be fair and objective. She explains that the tea was a plain Darjeeling tea, but shifts the focus to complimenting it, shyly acknowledging Juvel's inclusion as a member of the tasting event. After the party ends, Juvel feels exhausted and reflects on joining the tasting group, not feeling particularly thrilled about it due to her discomfort around many people. Max recalls what Fresha told him about Juvel, how she was always the subject of gossip in society, which might explain why she treated people poorly and avoided them. Max realizes that he is drawn to Juvel because they share similar experiences. Thirteen years ago, people accused young Max of killing animals and labeled him as a demon who committed brutal acts. Max sought reassurance from his mother, tearfully denying his involvement and begging her not to hate him. His mother hugged him tightly and revealed the real reason she told him to stay away from her. She was worried that Isabel might have hidden poison nearby. And that she always trusted him. Remembering this memory brings comfort to Max. Turning to Juval, Max puts on his best smile and gently pats her head, assuring her that she will do great in the tasting group. Juval blushes, moved by Max's reassurance. Suddenly, Max reveals that he has a job to take care of and won't be able to see her for a while. Juval is surprised and asks if it's a mercenary job. Max assures her not to worry, saying it's a piece of cake for him. Feeling relieved, Juval thinks Max must be stronger than he appears. Max notices her smudged makeup, and when Juval tries to clean it with her handkerchief, he playfully takes it away, leaning on her and jokingly telling her not to flirt with other men. He emphasizes that they are a couple now, even though it's just a contractual relationship. Then Max bids her farewell and suddenly disappears without a word from Juval. Two months have passed since the tasting party test, and they've had four more tea parties. Juval has gotten close to the members of the tea party, but she still feels empty and lonely. Her father has been busy lately and Max hasn't reached out to her at all. While pondering her loneliness, Juval overhears some ladies talking about Reagan declaring war on Ashet. She and Veronica, who are on their way to the temple, stop and listen to the conversation. Veronica notices Juval's concern and assures her there's no need to worry. She heard that Ashet had a great victory thanks to the crown prince. Veronica explains that she overheard Rosemary's big brother saying that the Crown Prince and Margrave Lennox successfully defended the Empire with preparations they started two months ago. The Crown Prince bravely charged into the enemy camp, beheaded their commander, and ended the battle. The palace is planning a victory celebration a month from now, and every noble will attend without exception. Juval is taken aback by the news. Meanwhile, Legis is in disguise, meeting someone at a bar. He apologizes for seeing the man in such circumstances. The man says it's all right, considering they're both busy. He mentions how Max showed off by winning the war. And for him, as a magician unable to set foot in his homeland, it brings a glimmer of hope if Max becomes the emperor. Revealing his purpose meeting in secret with the man, Legis came to see the man regarding Cersei's ring. Back at the temple, Veronica notices Juval looking like she's about to collapse any second and tells her to take a rest while she seeks help from a knight. While Juval waits for Veronica, a priest approaches her and asks to borrow her hand. Before Juval can inquire about the priest's intentions, she forcefully grabs her hand and begins speaking as if delivering a prophecy. She mentions something about a time traveler and how Juval has made a wrong choice that could lead to tragic sadness and sacrifice from someone who loves her. 
Juval pulls her hand back, feeling both uncomfortable and furious, and walks away from the priest. However, the priest stops her and asks for a donation of one gold coin in exchange for the prophecy. Meanwhile, near a fountain, people are whispering about a crying lady. The lady is Princess Beatrice, seeking solace by shedding tears alone. Her mother, Isabel, became angry with her after learning about the palace's plans to hold a victory celebration near Beatrice's upcoming age ceremony. While walking away from the priest, Juval appears annoyed and accidentally bumps into the princess. They lock eyes, and Juval apologizes, unaware that the lady is the princess. Noticing the lady's tears, Juval considers leaving her alone. However, hesitating, Juval turns back and offers Beatrice her handkerchief. Instead of expressing gratitude, Beatrice becomes angry and accuses Juval of pitying her. Nevertheless, Beatrice uses the handkerchief to wipe her nose. She then confides in Juval, sharing how people's expectations weigh heavily on her and how she sometimes wants to give up. Juval suddenly asks if Beatrice has a coin and tells her to throw it into the fountain and make a wish, even though Beatrice doesn't believe it will make a difference. Beatrice reluctantly tosses the coin into the fountain, and to their surprise, it lands right in the center. Juval tells her that means her wish will come true. Beatrice remains skeptical, stating that it won't solve her problems. However, Juval smiles and tells her that sometimes gestures like that can uplift her spirits. Just then, Juval hears the knights and Veronica searching for her, so she bids farewell to Beatrice, expressing her hope that things work out for her. Recalling her mother's teachings to be perfect and not show weakness, Beatrice thinks she shouldn't rely on acts of kindness like that. She stomps on Juval's handkerchief and walks away feeling annoyed. In the Floyan residence, Legis is anxious, waiting for Juval who hasn't shown up yet. But then Juval finally rolls up in the carriage, looking exhausted. She's taken aback when Legis calls her out for being late. Juval explains that she got caught up in a long chat at the temple, which is why she ended up coming home late. Legis gets it and expresses his worries. Juval is surprised to see that Legis isn't angry at all. Juval then reveals about feeling frustrated and wanting a change of pace, which made her lose track of time. Seeing Juval's face, Legis wonders if she's been feeling down ever since Max went off to battle. Legis starts to think that maybe he has no choice but to accept Juval and Max's relationship, as Max will be the one protecting her when he's not around. In the dining room, Juval has zero appetite, even the cherry tomato reminds her of Max. She regrets not asking Max to send her a letter while he's away. Noticing Juvel's gloomy expression, Legis brings up the fact that the Crown Prince has won a major victory and will be back soon. He also mentions the victory banquet, assuming that Juval must be looking forward to it. Juval is caught off guard. She starts slicing her meat aggressively and tells her father that attending the banquet is more of an obligation than something she's excited about. Legis asks if she has a dress ready for the party. Handing her a blank check, Legis tells her not to worry about the cost and that she can buy any dress she wants. Juval is shocked and wonders if Legis wants her to look stunning in front of the crown prince. Locking eyes with Legis, she can't refuse and ends up thanking him. Meanwhile, Max is tearing through the fields on his horse. His knight tells him to slow down before he kills the horse, but Max insists on keeping up the pace. He can't wait any longer to see Juvel. Spotting Juvel still awake by the window, Max feels a sense of relief. His face turns red as he knocks on the window. The horses and knights are beyond exhausted, exclaiming that Max must be superhuman since he traveled a distance that would take them four days in just a single day. The knights wonder why Max was in such a hurry, aside from his plan to make his men's lives miserable. Nervously, Max wonders if Juval will still welcome him. He notices her with her maid and decides to wait outside. It seems that Juval is pleading to use something to help her sleep, but her maid advises against it due to potential side effects from excessive use. However, seeing Juval's desperation, her maid feels helpless. Despite her efforts to fall asleep, Juvel's mind continues to race with thoughts of tomorrow's schedule, making the party outfit and meeting her friends afterwards. Suddenly, she hears a soft voice calling her name. Max appears before her. Wondering if it's a dream, Juvel reaches out and pinches Max's cheeks. 
Unsure if it's reality or a dream, she suddenly bursts into tears, expressing her worry about him and her anger that he didn't contact her at all. Amidst her tears, Juval admits that she thought something terrible had happened to him, or that he had grown tired of her and left. In response, Max hugs the teary-eyed Juval, reassuring her that he will send her a letter if he ever leaves her side for a while. Gradually, Juval calms down and falls asleep in Max's arms. Observing her peaceful sleep, Max steals a glance at the sleeping potion by the bedside, acknowledging its effectiveness, but also realizing that it dulls the sense of reality, almost like being intoxicated. Max plans to come back tomorrow but is suddenly taken aback as Juval grabs his collar and pulls him closer while still asleep. Max's heart races as if Juval is insisting he stay the night. He gently strokes her hair and decides to sleep beside her. Meanwhile, Legis visits his wife's grave, reminiscing about their past moments together. He recalls a time when they both cried after something happened, and Amelia blamed herself for ruining Legis' life. However, Legis reassured her, expressing that everything would be fine because his love for her was eternal. Suddenly, Legis notices a card attached to the flower on the grave, sent by the magician he had met before. The magician informs Legis that he is looking into what he requested and will reach out soon. He also mentions Juval, referring to her as Legis' treasure. Memories flood back from their past life when Juvel died. Legis knows that he can never be forgiven for her death back then. He declares that this time, he swears to save her. In Juval's dream, Max looks totally fine, which really ticked Juval off. If he was okay, he could have at least hit her up. So attacking him seems like the right move. Letting it all out on him was a major stress reliever for Juval. She feels so freaking refreshed after that. But when she opens her eyes, there's someone hugging her in her sleep. And Juval freaks out instantly. So last night when she was bawling and going crazy and clinging to him, it was all for real. Thinking about it now, Juval's face turns beet red with embarrassment. Suddenly, Max grabs her hand and asks what she's up to. Juval nervously claims she just had a terrible dream. While stroking her face, Max asks if it was a nightmare and assures her not to worry. He promises to be there for Juval from now on. He playfully teases Juval, saying he never imagined she would miss him so damn much that she'd cry like that. Unable to hide her bashfulness any longer, Juval jumps away and invites him to grab breakfast. While they're chowing down on breakfast, Juval puts on her best poker face, pretending she doesn't remember a thing. She figures if she plays dumb, Max won't be able to do anything about it. But why does Max keep grinning like that? In Max's head, he's thinking how awesome it is to have breakfast with his sweetheart. Suddenly, he brings up Juval's nightmare and asks what it was about. Juval starts feeling nervous about spilling the beans, so she quickly makes up a story. Avoiding Max's gaze, she says something about the crown prince appearing in her dream. Hearing this, Max feels like his efforts were pointless. Even though the prince's reputation has improved lately, Juval's still terrified of him. Changing the subject swiftly, Juval asks Max where he's been all this time. He gives a curt response, saying he's been on the battlefield. That surprises Juval, and she asks if he was drafted. Max, feeling bitter, wishes he could just tell Juval he's the crown prince right then and there. Shaking off those thoughts, Juval expresses her concern for Max. Meanwhile, Max is thinking that if he reveals his true identity now, all the trust he's built with Juval will crumble away. He brings up the upcoming victory banquet for the prince and throws a sudden question at Juval. If the prince asks her to dance that day, what will she do? A shiver runs down Juval's spine as she hears Max's question, but she confidently declares that she won't be anywhere near the prince. In fact, she plans on hiding so well that he won't even be able to find her. Curious and somewhat annoyed, Max asks where she'll be hiding, and she honestly answers, the terrace. Max, determined to have some private time with Juval at the party, suggests a spot quieter than the terrace. Juval wonders how Max knows about it. Standing up, Max reveals that he heard it from the palace knights. He's determined to clear up all the misunderstandings. Moving closer to Juval, he gently brushes some dirt off her face while suggesting she hide herself really well there. 
And, of course, that crown prince she's been avoiding like crazy will definitely find her. In the Ashet Empire, where nobles are busy praising the crown prince for taking down the Reagan, the sneaky emperor smirks and claims the crown prince got his bravery from him. Um, excuse me, sir? But then he goes on to say it's nothing compared to Legis' achievements, and all the nobles are trying their best to hide their displeasure. Legis can tell the emperor is propping him up in front of everyone to show he's not happy about the crown prince's success. The main reason the empire's citizens follow the emperor, aside from Legis' support, is because they're scared of the heir, Max, since he's been known as a tyrant in the past. But hey, Max Rep has definitely improved quite a bit. Legis thinks that if people start shifting from fearing Max to respecting him, they have about six months until the Empire's Foundation Day. Out of nowhere, Max shows up in front of the nobles and the Emperor, startling them. Behind his mask, Max's face is beaming with joy as he announces he's back from the battlefield to greet his dad, the Emperor. Legis glances at Max's arrival and puts his trust in him, hoping that this time Max will become the shining star of the Empire. The Emperor puts on a fake show of welcoming Max, praising his magnificent work. Max humbly responds, giving credit to the Emperor's guidance. Surprisingly, Max's calm reaction actually annoys the Emperor. Max also expresses gratitude to the Emperor for arranging the victory banquet. Speaking of the banquet, the Emperor mentions that it's happening close to Max's sister, Beatrice's coming-of-age ceremony. With a smirk on his face, the Emperor asks for Max's opinion on letting Beatrice host the party. But before Max can answer, the nobles quickly chime in, saying it's a brilliant idea. They claim that a successful party organized by the princess will enhance both Max's prestige and the apparent affection between the prince and the princess, creating a positive atmosphere. Legis can tell that all the nobles present are supporters of the Empress, and he believes they want to make the princess the star of the party. However, Max doesn't argue or object. He calmly understands their intentions and allows them to proceed as they wish. But, truth be told, none of that really matters to Max. The main goal of the party is to clear up any misunderstandings with Juval. Glancing at Legis, Max realizes that, at this moment, he needs to be most careful around Legis, who still hasn't fully accepted Max as Juvelian's partner. Max then asks for permission to leave, with a firm determination to never give up on Juval, no matter how hard Legis tries to tear them apart. Let's take a look at the Empress's side now. The Empress, Isabel, expresses her frustration, realizing that all the money she wasted on spreading rumors about Max seems pointless now that he has returned and gained people's praise through his work. Isabel blames her daughter, Beatrice, for not doing anything to win people's hearts. She goes as far as saying she should have had a son instead of a daughter, which deeply saddens Beatrice. Isabel instructs Beatrice to ensure that the prince's party is meticulously prepared. Approaching her daughter, Isabel gently strokes her hair and claims that everything she does is for Beatrice's own good. She asserts that Beatrice must not disappoint her again. In a swift change of expression, Isabel emphasizes that Beatrice must make the party a resounding success, while also making Max appear like a total lunatic. Despite her tears, Beatrice agrees to her mother's demands. And so the day of the victory banquet, which nobody was really excited about, finally arrived. Inside Floyan's residence, the maids are in awe of Duval's stunning appearance, assuring her that she will be the star of the party. Little do they know, Duval intentionally chose a dark dress to avoid standing out. Suddenly, Legis approaches from behind, looking as radiant as ever. He informs Juval that the carriage is ready. Juval feels grateful that her father will overshadow her. As they ride in the carriage, Juval appears gloomy. She thinks to herself that this is her first time back in the palace since her rebirth, and she had hoped she wouldn't have to come back here. The memories of all her past misfortunes flood her mind. Suddenly, Legis calls out her name, complimenting her beauty, catching Juval off guard. She never expected her father to praise her. However, Legis quickly adds that he's certain the crown prince will love her appearance, which only adds to Juval's worries. 
He also mentions that the people of the Empire no longer view the prince as a tyrant, but as the hero who saved the Empire. Legis believes that Juval must be proud of him. However, Juval, who is unaware of the true situation, wonders why she should be proud. She admits to Legis that she was a little surprised and never thought the prince would do so well on the battlefield. Juval mentions that she had assumed Legis would naturally be the one to save the Empire in the war against Reagan. Based on the previous story, Legis is taken aback by Juval's statement, assuring her that he's certain she did believe in him. But deep down, what Legis wanted to save more than anything else wasn't the Empire itself. Finally, they reach the palace, and as Juval steps out of the carriage, Legis gently holds her hand. Juval realizes that she's once again faced with an unavoidable problem, her encounter with the crown prince. However, she reassures herself that she'll be fine because she won't be in the ballroom. Entering the palace, they spot the emperor and empress seated on their thrones. Juval can't help but think that she's now face to face with the people connected to her past death. Legis whispers to Juval, instructing her to keep her eyes down and avoid raising her head if possible. They greet the emperor and empress, and the emperor, with his cunning gaze, remarks that they finally get to meet Legis' precious daughter. In response, Legis tightens his grip on Juval's hand, leaving her feeling confused about her father's reaction. The current emperor of Ashet, Darius Chepron Ashet, is a heartless father who doesn't even treat his son like family. By his side is the current empress. Isabel Rosti Ashe, a woman who derives twisted satisfaction from tormenting her daughter. Juval decides it's best to avoid getting involved with them, so she keeps her head down, just as Legis advised. The Emperor expresses his pleasure at meeting Juval in person, sporting his sneaky smile. He asks if Legis' daughter will be coming of age soon, and Legis replies that Juval's ceremony will take place in three months. With a devious plot in mind, the Emperor smirks and tells Juval to show her face. Juval is taken aback by his words, but fortunately, the announcement of the Crown Prince's arrival interrupts the conversation, saving her. The Emperor grows annoyed at Max's tendency to appear without warning. Way to go, Max! Eventually, the Emperor allows Juval and Legis to leave and enjoy the party. Juval can't believe she's finally face to face with the sadistic tyrant Prince. Seriously? You're so close to him, but you don't even realize it. Max descends the stairs, his face concealed behind a mask, dressed impeccably in dark attire that befits his status as the crown prince. His expression appears cold. I guess he's just freaking out about finally meeting Juval as the crown prince. However, that icy demeanor sends a wave of nervousness and curiosity through the attendees, who can't help but wonder what lies behind the mask. Juval had planned to memorize the prince's face before making her escape, but with the mask on, it seems impossible. Suddenly, Max's gaze locks onto Juval, sending a shiver down her spine. Yet, to Max, Juval's expression is simply adorable, while she herself is absolutely terrified by it, and Legis can't help but wonder what's going on with Max. Legis calls out to Juval, informing her that her friends are looking for her and urging her to join them. Juval quickly rushes over to her friends while Max silently wishes he could call out to her as well. Standing next to his father on the throne, the Emperor questions Max about why he's wearing a mask that has become the talk of the nobles. Not missing a beat, the Empress interrupts, claiming that the Prince clearly lacks fashion sense due to his early battlefield experiences. She smirks at Max with her wicked grin. But Max, cool as a cucumber, explains that the mask was a gift from his sister, who had informed him it would be a masquerade ball. Apparently, he's the only one who got the memo. As the nobles overhear this, they start murmuring about the princess making a deliberate mistake. Catching on to the situation, Isabel, unable to contain her anger, shouts at Max, accusing him of disregarding Beatrice's hard work. However, Max remains composed and acknowledges that he's fully aware of Beatrice's contribution, expressing gratitude for the attention he's receiving. He even mentions that he managed to conceal his war injury thanks to Beatrice's considerate gesture. Isabel is left speechless, her expression clearly showing her frustration at Max's unexpected counterattack. The nobles, impressed by Max's explanation, express their appreciation for his bravery in defending the Empire, 
remarking that the mask adds to his mystique. As for that conniving empress, she can only seethe with anger, unable to retaliate in front of everyone. Meanwhile, Juval, witnessing the entire scene and feeling a sense of impending danger, desperately searches for a hiding spot. Finally, Juval manages to find some much-needed alone time, feeling a sense of relief although she can't help but feel guilty for leaving her friends behind. She recalls the hideout that Max had suggested, and as she searches for the place, she scans her surroundings. Suddenly, she hears someone crying nearby. Although she still doesn't recognize the lady as the princess, Juvel remembers seeing her at the temple. Aware that the palace knights are on the lookout for someone, Juvel knows she can't let them discover her. Wanting to calm Beatrice down and guide her back to the banquet, Juvel approaches her, asking if she's alright. However, the knights' calls for the princess become louder, and Juvel eventually realizes that the tearful lady standing before her is none other than the princess herself. In that moment, memories of her past life flood back, reminding Juvel that the princess's existence poses the first risk to her own survival. With tears streaming down her face, Beatrice turns her gaze towards Juvel, instinctively covers Juvel's mouth and signals for her to remain silent. Still keeping Juvel hidden and covering her mouth, Beatrice urgently instructs her to remain quiet and follow her lead. Juvel can hardly believe that the girl she had a conversation with at the temple just a few days ago is actually the princess. In her past life, Juvel's first encounter with the princess would have been during the princess coming of age ceremony. But now, she finds herself meeting her at the prince's banquet. As Beatrice pulls her along, Juvel can't help but wonder if her efforts to avoid the prince were in vain. They enter a chamber and Juvel can't shake off the worry that this situation might bring her closer to her own death flag. Suddenly, Beatrice's expression turns furious as she accuses Juvel of witnessing her cry while she herself is still in tears. She quickly comes up with an excuse, claiming that she was crying due to some dust in her eyes. Beatrice warns Juvel that if she ever reveals that she saw her crying, she won't forgive her. Meanwhile, in the banquet hall, Max scans the crowd, realizing that Juvel has managed to slip away just as she planned. Right when he's about to spot her, the Emperor interrupts him, asking where he thinks he's going. Max quickly comes up with an excuse, saying he's feeling a bit tired and needs some rest. However, the Emperor doesn't seem to buy it, showing his disbelief and annoyance. Max figures that his old man must be irritated because all the nobles have been showering him with attention all day. Despite trying to escape the situation as quickly as possible, Max tells his father that the fatigue from the war must be catching up with him. But the Emperor, looking down at his own son and comparing him to Legis, who had a similar accomplishment but stayed by the Emperor's side the whole time, expresses disbelief at Max's lack of stamina. Max wonders what delusional thoughts are in his father's head, believing that Legis is loyal to him. Max keeps quiet and eventually, his father reluctantly allows him to leave. As Max makes his way out of the hall, he contemplates what the Emperor might be holding over Legis' head. He has been noticing certain behaviors from his father that indicate a blind faith in Legis never betraying him. Max can't help but wonder what lies beneath their relationship. There must be something hidden between them. As Max arrives at the hideout, he suggested to Juval, he's taken aback to find it empty. Meanwhile, Juval and Beatrice are still caught in an awkward situation. Trying to reassure the princess that the knights must have left by now, Juval asks for permission to leave. However, Beatrice questions Juval's sudden politeness and urges her to act as she used to. Feeling trapped and unable to find a way to escape, Juval realizes that she can't stay entangled with the princess. But then, Beatrice opens up about her current situation. She explains that she did everything she could to gain her father's approval that day, but nothing seemed to work. No matter how hard she tried, they wouldn't acknowledge her. Juvel can sense the sadness in Beatrice's words and asks her if it's really necessary to go to such lengths for someone else's validation. Drawing from her own experiences, Juvel shares that she used to base her self-worth on how others perceived her. Turning her gaze toward Beatrice, Juvel asserts that it's up to her to determine her own worth. If she acts based on her own thoughts and beliefs, that's what truly defines her. 
Beatrice had never considered this perspective before, putting her own thoughts first. In the future that Juvel knew, Beatrice shone brightly above everyone else. Blushing, Beatrice avoids eye contact and suggests that Juvel can call her Rick. Juvel is taken aback by this sudden intimacy, as she thought nicknames were usually reserved for close friends. But it seems they are quickly becoming entangled with each other. Meanwhile, Max is frantically searching all over the palace, asking anyone who might have seen Juvel. He's getting frustrated as he can't sense where she is, and worry starts to gnaw at him, fearing that something might have happened to her. But suddenly, Legis appears from behind, expressing his disappointment in Max for not paying enough attention to protect his own daughter. Back with Juvel, Beatrice abruptly stands up and asks Juvel to leave the chamber with her. Juvel wonders if Beatrice is feeling better now. Beatrice hands Juvel's handkerchief back to her and thanks her for it. But Juvel says it's okay and that she can throw it away. Beatrice, blushing, confesses that she can't bring herself to throw it away and actually kept it on purpose to give it back to Juvel. It appeared that after their encounter at the temple, she had to come back to pick up the handkerchief after purposely stomping on it. Holding Juvel's hand, Beatrice leads them towards the exit. But as they are about to leave, the door suddenly opens. To Juvel's surprise, there stands the crown prince, his death glare making him look terrifying and furious that he has finally found her. Let's see what happened between Max and Legis before. Max begged Legis to tell him where Juvel was, even bowing and showing his respect. Seeing Max's determination, Legis finally revealed Juvel's whereabouts, urging Max to find her before the Empress Knights do. Max was shocked by this revelation and expressed his displeasure, questioning why they would be searching for Juvel. Legis explained that Juvel was currently with the princess, which made Max feel uneasy, suspecting that the Empress was using his sister to get to Juvel. Seeing Max's worried expression, Legis reassured him that nothing serious had happened yet. This somewhat calmed Max down, realizing that his feelings for Juvel were still unknown and they wouldn't use her to harm him. Determined to find Juvel, Max turned away and told Legis that they could discuss it further once he had brought Juvel back. As Max hurriedly left, Legis placed his trust in him, believing that Max was the only one who could protect Juvel now. And that's how Max managed to find Juvel here. Both Juvel and Beatrice are taken by surprise to see Max's presence. When Max locks eyes with Juvel, he feels relieved to see that she's all right but his relief expression only manages to scare Juvel even more. Even Beatrice notices that Juvel is scared of her brother. Max and Beatrice silently communicate through their eyes, with Max urging Beatrice to stop causing so much trouble, especially for Juvel. Beatrice, in return, conveys through her eyes that Juvel is scared because of Max. Meanwhile, Juvel has a sinking feeling that she has brought together their worst enemies, in the original story, the prince and princess despise each other, and all the nobles are aware of the strained relationship between the pro-empress and the anti-empress. Caught in this situation, Juvel believes that Max is there to harm Beatrice. Max extends his hand, seemingly trying to reach out to Beatrice, while Beatrice appears to challenge him to strike her instead. Juvel can't let the situation escalate any further, so she musters up her courage and greets the prince, introducing herself. She then gazes into Max's eyes, causing him to blush. Smiling at Max, Juvel internally regrets acting without thinking. But seeing Max's expression, which seemed like he could attack at any moment, Juvel tries to maintain her composure. Summoning her courage, she apologizes to the prince, explaining that she and her friend got lost and ended up wandering there. Juvel admits their ignorance due to the lack of guards and sincerely hopes that the prince can find it in his heart to forgive them. Seeing Max's intense gaze, Juvel feels a wave of terror wash over her, causing her to tremble in fear. The prince hasn't said a word yet, but his glare alone is enough to unsettle her. Little does she know, Max's face is turning red from blushing as he finds Juvel even more beautiful up close. With a gentle expression, he extends his hand towards her and asks her to accompany him outside. Juvel is taken aback by this unexpected invitation, her mind racing to comprehend the situation. Gradually regaining her composure, she is shocked to realize that the prince himself is offering to escort her. Observing her brother and friend holding hands before her, 
Beatrice can't help but feel annoyed. Max seems like a different person. Even his voice has softened. She wonders if he's just putting on an act to win people over. However, her irritation turns to curiosity when she notices a change in Max's expression. Juval then turns to Beatrice and asks if she plans to return to the banquet hall with them. Beatrice hesitates for a moment before saying she has something else to attend to. Juval squeezes Beatrice's hand and warmly invites her to visit her house any time for tea and a chat. Beatrice, touched by Juval's kind offer, blushes and reciprocates the sentiment, telling Juval she's always welcome as well. Seeing the closeness between the two, Max starts to feel uncomfortable, wondering when they became so friendly. With the princess now safely gone, Juval knows she needs to make her exit without any trouble. She bows in gratitude to Max for escorting her and requests permission to leave. But just as she's about to step out, she accidentally steps on her own dress, causing her to lose her balance. In a quick reflex, Max reaches out and catches her just in time, preventing her from falling. Their faces are so close to each other, creating an awkward moment. Juval quickly tries to create some distance, expressing her gratitude to the prince for saving her. But as she attempts to free herself, she realizes that the prince's grip tightens, leaving her confused. Max continues to stare at Juval without even blinking, making her feel uneasy. She asks if there's something the prince wants to say to her. Still blushing, Max pulls Juval even closer, embracing her tightly. He tells her to stop avoiding his gaze and look at him directly. Max reveals that he is, in fact, Max himself. Juval becomes even more perplexed by Max's sudden statement. Max touches his mask, indicating his intention to remove it and reveal his face. With a red face and hesitation, he asks Juval if he appeared that scary to her. Max apologizes for lying all this time, and Juval reaches out her hand, gently touching Max's face, showing her happiness upon realizing that the prince is Max. Their lips begin to draw closer, and Max closes his eyes, ready for a kiss. However, let's snap back to reality. Max finally regains his footing as Juval thanks him and asks for permission to leave. She swiftly departs, leaving Max behind without saying a word. Sorry to burst your bubble, but all the scenes mentioned above were actually Max's imagination. As Max finally comes to his senses, he realizes that Juval has already disappeared. Juval, who managed to escape from the prince's clutches, considers Max to be a complete weirdo. In reality, Max had been hugging himself and smiling while Juval looked at him with confusion. Meanwhile, Max is feeling helpless, expressing his deep regret over his actions in front of Juval. He can't believe that his love for Juval has caused him to lose control like that. He is determined to do something about it and realizes that now that they've met, he just needs to find a way to contact her again. Back inside the banquet hall, Juval feels completely drained. All she wants now is to get home as quickly as possible. She glances at her father and is amazed to see how beloved he is by everyone. Legis notices his daughter looking at him and approaches her in the middle of a conversation. With a smile on his face, he reaches out his hand and tells Juval that it's time to go. Juval is taken aback by her father's reaction, as it seems he is being considerate of her. As they walk together, Legis wonders that Juval might have been alone somewhere as usual. But now that he sees her, he assumes that Max has brought her back safely. In Juval's mind, she's already thinking about enjoying a slice of strawberry cake as soon as they arrive home. Walking side by side with his daughter, the nobles shower Legis and Juval with compliments, commenting on what a perfect father-daughter duo they make. However, as Legis hears those praises, he actually feels disgusted. It reminds him of the past when those same nobles accused Juval of poisoning the princess and called for her immediate execution. In that moment, Legis, who had just lost his beloved daughter, was consumed by rage and swiftly eliminated all those nobles without hesitation, expressing his profound sadness. Suddenly, the voice of the emperor breaks Legis' train of thought, asking if he's already leaving. In a drunken state, the emperor wonders aloud who will protect him if Legis is not around. Legis firmly asserts that he attended the party as the duke and that the palace knights are more than capable of safeguarding the emperor. Hearing this, the emperor remarks that Legis has been getting on his nerves lately, 
which terrifies Juval. The Emperor then attempts to intimidate Legis, wearing an evil grin as he asks if Legis isn't concerned and demands that he snap out of it. Without hesitation, Legis locks eyes with the Emperor and coolly states that he's drunk. The Emperor appears unfazed, provoking Legis by questioning what he plans to do about it. In that moment, a vivid image flashes in the Emperor's mind, an image of Legis severing his hand. Overwhelmed with fear, he hastily reminds Legis that if he were to kill the Emperor, Legis himself would perish as well. The Emperor envisions Legis, drenched in blood, raising his sword and proclaiming that he doesn't care about his own life because he can't live without his daughter. A shiver runs down the Emperor's spine as he grants Legis permission to leave. Still trembling, the Emperor wonders what was behind Legis's gaze, unable to comprehend why Legis would defy him despite the Emperor possessing the ring that can control him. As he watches Legis and Juval depart from the palace, the Emperor ponders the motives behind Legis' recent insolent behavior. Max approaches Madame Fresha and asks her for some guidance on how to write a sweet letter to a woman, something he's never attempted before in his life. After Madame Fresha shares her advice, Max becomes completely absorbed in the task of crafting a heartfelt letter to Juval, showering her with praise and affection. Max dedicates his day and night to this endeavor, and eventually, he completes a 20-page love letter. He then wraps it up and entrusts it to a pigeon, not forgetting to issue a comical threat to the bird if it fails to deliver the message to Juval. The following day, Juval is taken by surprise when she receives the letter and begins reading it. At that moment, Max decides to make an unexpected entrance through the window. He inquires about what Juval is up to, and she informs him about the letter she has received, which she believes is from Lady Christine and contains a threat. Max, feeling unsure, asks if Juval has received any other letters, but it turns out that is the only one she has received. Max can't help but wonder if the pigeon has failed to deliver the letter correctly and has flown off to avoid the promised consequences. Unbeknownst to Max, the carrier pigeon has actually delivered the letter to the Floyan house. But it is intercepted by Legis's pet bird, which promptly leads to the burning of Max's painstakingly crafted 20-page letter. Juval is now prepared to pay a visit to Lady Christine's residence. Legis, concerned for Juval's safety, is about to assign a dozen knights to protect her, as is their usual practice. However, Juval insists that such a large guard detail is unnecessary and that Geraldine assures her he can protect her alone. Juval is well aware that the true sender of the letter is Mikhail's mother, and she is now ready to deliver a much-needed lesson to them. Upon arriving at Viscount Mersha's place, Juval receives an awkward greeting from the Lord and Lady, who promptly guide her to meet Mikhail's mother waiting there. Juval wastes no time and gets straight to the point, asking what she wants to discuss. Mikhail's mother reveals that Mikhail is unwell, to which Juval offers a simple prayer for his recovery. As she's about to leave, Mikhail's mother suddenly becomes furious, blaming Juval for her son's illness and insisting that she must take responsibility. She even attempts to reach out to Juval while demanding her presence at her residence to see Mikhail. Marilyn senses the danger and intervenes, resulting in a slap on her face from Mikhail's mother, who claims she had dared to interrupt. She lectures Juval on how to manage those beneath her. Shocked by the scratch on Marilyn's cheek, Juval turns to Mikhail's mother, puts on a fake smile, and reluctantly accepts the invitation to visit the Hessen residence. Upon their arrival, Juval stops Geraldine from following her, even though he's deeply concerned. Juval insists that Geraldine waits there and arranges for a doctor to attend to Marilyn instead. Inside the house, Giselle, Mikhail's sister, greets Juval with a request for a jewel, much as Juval had provided in the past. Without a word, Juval responds with a swift slap to Giselle's face, leaving Giselle and her mother in shock. With a resolute gaze, Juval explains that she's merely training those beneath her. Still, Giselle addresses Juval by her name, prompting Juval to question how a Marquis's daughter dared to address her, a duke's daughter, by her first name, with a stern expression. Juval is absolutely furious, and she storms in there, venting her anger by breaking things she had purchased for them. The sculpture, the portrait, 
and just as she's about to lay waste to more stuff stashed in the closet, Mikhail's mother attempts to slap her. However, Mikhail suddenly materializes, calling out to Juval. He looks terribly sick, and Juval hadn't intended to see him at all, but Mikhail approaches her and admits how much he's missed her. Observing this scene from outside, Max feels a surge of disgust toward Mikhail. Juval spots Max outside and is left bewildered, wondering why he's there. As it turns out, Max was sent by Legis, who's deeply concerned about his daughter. Earlier, Legis had noticed that Max had been hiding in the tree the whole time and called him to come down. Legis revealed that he had read Max's letter to Juval before burning it to ashes, and he couldn't believe Max had used a tiny carrier pigeon to deliver his 20-page letter. Max felt that Legis was being overly protective, crossing their privacy boundaries. Legis then turned serious and asked Max if what he had written in the letter truly represented his feelings for Juval, to which Max confirmed. Turning away, Legis instructed him to protect Juval no matter what, leaving Max to wonder if Legis had finally accepted him. And that's how Max had ended up in this situation. Spotting Max there, Juval decides it's time to wrap up her business at the Hessens' residence. However, Mikhail follows her and insists on having a chat. He pleads to start their relationship anew, realizing his mistake. Juval firmly states that she wants no more involvement with him, especially because she has a lover now. Hearing this, Max can't help but smile from his hiding place. Mikhail becomes infuriated and forcefully pulls Juval, declaring that she belongs to him alone. Max jumps down, shoves Mikhail away, and shields Juval while issuing a threat to Mikhail. He then gently asks Juval if she's alright, but for some reason, Juval recalls the moment she danced with the crown prince. Max then turns his attention back to Mikhail, prepared to give him a lesson. Suddenly, Juval's heart races as Max holds her hand tightly. With Max seething in anger and Mikhail continually provoking him, Max reaches a breaking point and attempts to silence Mikhail. Worried that it could escalate and make things worse, Juval steps in and implores them to stop. Max is furious with Mikhail, accusing him of not truly loving Juval but instead wanting to possess her. Mikhail casually retorts that Juval belongs to him, further infuriating Max by treating Juval like an object. Hearing Mikhail belittle her feelings during their time together, Juval slaps him across the face boldly stating that she genuinely loved him and labeling him as trash. Mikhail is left in disbelief and responds with arrogance. Max silences him, issuing a stern warning that if Mikhail dares to harm Juvel, he'll go as far as to take his life if necessary. Max firmly declares his intention to protect Juvel, emphasizing their plans to live together happily forever. Suddenly, Geraldine arrives, offering to take care of Mikhail and leaving Juval in Max's care. Inside the carriage, Juval expresses her gratitude to Max for coming to her aid. As she tends to the wound on Max's hand, she thanks him for rescuing her and taking her side back there. She also admits that even though Max might have been putting on an act when he spoke about living together happily forever, his words touched her. Max squeezes her hand and clarifies that he wasn't just saying it. As he kisses Juval's hand, he confesses his love for her, and suggests putting an end to their contract relationship. Juval finds herself wondering if everything Max has done up to this point has been genuine. Max openly expresses his desire to terminate the contract and date her for real. Juval contemplates whether the feelings of comfort when he's around and loneliness when he's not are signs of love. She tells Max that she needs some time to think it over. Her heart pounds loudly but Max reassures her that he'll wait for her answer regardless of how long it takes. Deep down, he begins to worry and feel nervous about the possibility of Juval saying no. He ponders when the right time might be to reveal that he's the crown prince. As he frets, Juval dozes off, seemingly forgetting that someone confessed his feelings to her just 30 minutes ago. Max gently rests Juval's head on his shoulder, ensuring that her head doesn't droop. But despite his calm exterior, Max's heart races uncontrollably. At the Floyan residence, Legis waits for Juval to return. When she arrives, he demands an explanation. Spotting Geraldine there, Juval wonders if Legis has already received a report from him. 
She decides to come clean and spill the whole story from start to finish. She also admits that she broke all the gifts she had given to the Hessen family, so they can't claim damages against them. Realizing that Legis had always covered her with his money whenever she caused a scene, she felt guilty about it. This time, she decided to cause a commotion that wouldn't be too costly. Hearing her explanation, Legis smiles and even thanks her for considering his feelings. Legis finds Jubal's consideration adorable and can't help but laugh. Juval feels like a massive weight has been lifted from her shoulders and proceeds to tell her father that she met me, Kyle, and ended up talking with him a bit. As she tries to explain the details, tears suddenly pour from her eyes, taking Legis by surprise. She wonders why she's crying. Without wasting any time, Legis mounts his horse and, with a piercing glare, declares that he'll tear into those who dare to hurt his daughter. Gently wiping Juval's tears, Legis reassures her not to cry and promises to be right back. Juval feels a rush of happiness, knowing her father is on her side. Seeing how furious Legis is, Max can't help but think that that Mikhail guy is in deep trouble. Back at the Hessen residence, a breathless servant rushes in to inform Mikhail's parents that they need to leave as the main entrance has just collapsed. Before they can fully grasp the situation, Legis dramatically breaks through another wall entering with his piercing glare. Marcus Hessen, seething with anger, demands an explanation from Legis. Suddenly, Legis tosses a bag of money as compensation and tells them to step aside. He then proceeds to lay waste to the Hessen house in a single strike. This leaves Marquis Hessen and his wife begging Legis to stop. But Legis makes it clear that he won't, pointing out that some lowlifes who don't know their place have harmed his daughter. Mikhail suddenly appears, shocked by the situation, and with a cocky attitude, demands an explanation from Legis. Legis replies that he's there because a worm like Mikhail hurt his daughter, and now he's there to obliterate the place. He also mentions that he's aware of how the Hessen family mistreated his daughter all this time, and the only reason he stayed quiet was because Juval didn't want him to take any action. After saying this, Legis leaves them still trembling. In her sleep, Juval has a dream from her childhood when her father approached her with blood-stained gloves and clothes. At that time, young Juval was scared, but as Legis turned to leave, she begged him not to go. Suddenly, Juval awakens and grabs Legis, who is visiting her chamber to check on her. Tears stream down her face as she pleads with Legis not to leave. Regaining her composure, Juval asks Legis why he's there. Legis explains that he was concerned she might be stressed about what happened that day. With a newfound courage, Juval expresses her gratitude, thanking Legis for going to the Hessen family to protect her. She tells him how happy she was that he was on her side. Hearing this, Legis gently takes Juval's hands and reassures her that he's always on her side. This time, with tears streaming down her face, Juval reveals that she's been wanting to talk to him because he's been exceptionally kind to her recently. In the past, he often acted indifferent and didn't pay much attention to her, which made her think that Legis had given up on her and would eventually abandon her. Hearing this revelation, Legis can't hold back his tears anymore. He apologizes to Juval and admits that it's all his fault, acknowledging that everything he did to protect her left her with so many scars making her think that he didn't love her. Legis gently pats Juval's head and tells her to rest for now, assuring her they can discuss it further next time. He then plants a tender goodnight kiss on Juval's forehead, wishing her sweet dreams. This gesture surprises Juval, leaving her to wonder if she's dreaming. Meanwhile in the palace, Max barges into the Emperor's room without knocking, startling the Emperor, who is in a private meeting with his loyal subject, Count Pyrex. Seeing Max's sudden entrance, Count Pyrex requests permission to leave. Max assumes there must be some sort of plotting going on, and he contemplates sending his people to tail Pyrex immediately. The Emperor informs Max that he'll be Beatrice's partner for her upcoming coming-of-age ceremony. Max can hardly believe it, and he's like, seriously? Earlier, Beatrice's mother, the Empress, suggested that she choose Mikhail as her partner for her coming-of-age ceremony, but she refused. Then the Emperor suggested she select the Reagan King as her partner to solidify their kingdom's relationship. 
However, Beatrice felt terrible, thinking that her father only used her and didn't care about her, especially since he had chosen the old pervert king as her partner. Left with no other choice, Beatrice told the emperor that she had picked Max as her partner. Meanwhile, in Juvel's chamber, she's delighted that the item she ordered from Ian Fyodor has finally arrived, a whistle she plans to use when she's in danger. Suddenly, Max appears through the window, blushing as he watches Juvel cutely blowing the whistle. He asks her how such an item can help protect her. Juvel proceeds to blow the whistle so loudly that it even startles Max. She explains to Max that it can be heard by others even from a distance. Max then reveals that he has something for Juvel. He kneels down and declares that he's presenting himself for her, so she can call on him whenever she wishes, whether it's for protection, sharing cake, or just keeping her company when she's lonely. Hearing Max's earnestness, Juvel is moved and smiles as she realizes her feelings for him. She's just about to confess her feelings when Geraldine knocks on the door and insists that Juvel open it, as he heard some strange sounds coming from her room. Juvel finally opens the door, assuring Geraldine that she's fine and nothing happened. She complains that the guards have become overly protective lately. Geraldine spots Max ready to make a hasty exit and mentions that it's because there's a stray cat that likes to visit her room. Geraldine then tells Max to come with him, escorting him to meet Legis. With a stern gaze, Legis tells Max that there's something he needs to discuss with him. Legis warns Max not to sneak into his daughter's room like he used to and instructs him to use the door. Max inquires if that's all Legis wants to discuss, but Legis asks if Max has noticed anything suspicious about the Emperor. Max informs Legis that he saw Count Pyrex having an audience with the Emperor, implying that they might be plotting something. Legis then discloses that the Emperor's high-ranking knight, the Shadow, has been watching over Juval, and this deeply concerns him. His expression shifts as he earnestly implores Max to keep an eye on the Emperor with his men, as he believes that only Max is capable of doing so. Max can hardly believe what he's hearing, seeing Legis pleading like that, acknowledging Legis's overwhelming strength and calling him the God of Battle. Max has personally witnessed that Legis's reputation is not exaggerated at all. Max brushes off Legis's hand from his shoulder and raises his tone, suggesting that if Legis wanted, he could eliminate the Emperor's men and Pyrex in an instant. He questions Legis about how much longer he plans to be afraid of the Emperor. Still not comprehending what's going on with Legis, Max asks what Legis is so afraid of. Upon hearing Max's question, Legis doesn't offer a direct response. He simply turns away and instructs Max to leave, citing that it's already late. Legis cannot bring himself to admit it directly, but what he truly fears isn't the Emperor or anyone else, it's himself. On the day of the princess's coming-of-age ceremony, Beatrice is feeling a bit anxious and hopes that the party will go smoothly. However, she is suddenly surprised by Max's appearance. This marks the beginning of their sibling rivalry. Eventually, they walk together side by side to the hall. The ongoing rivalry continues as they make their way, but they manage to maintain their smiling faces in front of the attendees. Max tries to stay composed because the person he truly wishes to meet at this party is Juvel. When their eyes meet, Juvel experiences a sudden chill, and Beatrice is filled with disgust, feeling like she can almost see Max's expression under his mask. As the party gets underway, the Empress insists that Beatrice should have a dance with Mikhail, despite her earlier refusal. The mother's insistence continues. Suddenly, Mikhail appears before them, greets them, and boldly asks Beatrice for a dance. This leaves Beatrice wondering why Mikhail is approaching her so aggressively. Earlier, Mikhail had a private meeting with the Empress, during which he revealed that he knew about the Empress's pregnancy. She became furious and asked if Mikhail was attempting to threaten her. In response, Mikhail calmly explained that he only wanted to protect her treasure. He pointed out the Empress's constant worry about Beatrice being overshadowed by the Crown Prince, and offered his hand to stand by Beatrice's side, helping her act in line with the Empress's wishes, so they both could get what they wanted. This is why the Empress keeps pushing Beatrice to get closer to Mikhail. Left with no other choice, Beatrice reluctantly agrees to dance with Mikhail. However, a commotion occurs when a servant accidentally drops the glass in front of Max. 
Surprisingly, Max doesn't get angry and even shows grace to the servant. This draws attention to him, and Beatrice seizes the opportunity to leave Mikhail and decline the dance with him. Juval, who is observing the scene from a distance, wonders if the crown prince did that intentionally. However, when the crown prince turns his gaze toward Juval, she sees his smile, which terrifies her. As she turns away, Juval spots her father and immediately rushes to him, eager to have a conversation with him. Previously, Legis had a conversation with the magician, but they couldn't uncover any clues on how to nullify the contract tied to the Circe ring. Nevertheless, Legis became convinced that the Chamber of Shadows held the key, as he believed it was the ideal hiding place chosen by the Emperor. So, at that moment, they struck an agreement to investigate the chamber. The time has come for this pursuit. Legis becomes aware of the Emperor's men scrutinizing his every move from a distance. As he exits the hall, he craftily ensnares the Emperor's men. But suddenly, Juval's voice rings out from behind, jolting him. Legis feigns a concerned smile, fearing that Juval may have witnessed his actions. Juval conveys her wish to spend more time with him. Upon hearing this, Legis expresses his gratitude to Juval, and promises to join her after attending to some other matters. Out of the blue, Beatrice approaches and seeks permission to share some time with Juval. Meanwhile, in the hall, Max surveys the area but fails to locate Juval. He begins to fret that people might be making advances toward her. Back with Juval and Beatrice, Beatrice extends an invitation to Juval for a tea gathering. As they stroll to Beatrice's chamber, they spot Mikhail already in attendance. Mikhail initiates flirting and offers excuses, but Beatrice forthrightly asserts her lack of interest and orders him to leave promptly. Mikhail's demeanor shifts as he brings up the threat to Beatrice's position due to the Empress being with child. This revelation startles Beatrice, causing her to feel anxious. Observing this, Juval doesn't stand idle. She hastens to Beatrice and gives her a comforting hug. Spotting Juval in the scene, Mikhail is surprised but persists in pressuring Beatrice to accept him. Juval reminds him to leave, reiterating Beatrice's earlier instruction. However, it becomes evident that Mikhail is unwilling to yield, as he commands the guards, who were placed there by the Empress, to bring Beatrice to him and escort Juval away. Faced with this dire situation, Juval resorts to blowing her whistle with all her might, but Mikhail wrests it from her and steps on it. She maintains hope that either Max or Legis will come to their rescue. Just as the tension peaks, an unexpected figure arrives and swiftly intervenes, delivering a swift kick to Mikhail. Juval and Beatrice are left in shock as they witness the Crown Prince, who appears genuinely enraged by the situation. Juval finds herself pondering the unexpected presence of the Crown Prince. However, the Crown Prince's anger is uncontainable, he swiftly incapacitates the guards, and as he is about to strike at Mikhail, Beatrice intervenes, pleading with him not to take a life. Max, on the other hand, readies his sword, but Juval's cry reveals his injured hand, prompting her to insist they attend to the wound. Max relents, leaving Mikhail be. While tending to Max's wound, Beatrice expresses her gratitude for his timely rescue. However, Max swiftly shifts his attention to Juval and retrieves her whistle. Beatrice instructs Max to escort Juval back to the banquet hall, as she needs to speak with her mother. Thanks to Beatrice's intervention, they return to the banquet hall together. Max is anxious, fearing that Juval might be frightened of him due to the earlier events. As he prepares to part ways with Juval, she unexpectedly calls out to him, asking him to be her dance partner. Max is taken aback unable to believe that his dream is coming true. His heart races so vigorously that he can't even hear the music. The thought of dancing with Juval as the crown prince is overwhelming. Juval smiles at him, drawing him closer and whispering in his ear, asking if he had fun playing with her, all while mentioning Max's name. Max attempts to evade the situation, feigning ignorance of Juval's words. Unyielding, Juval asserts that she has something important to discuss with him and will be waiting for him on the terrace. She excuses herself and leaves Max behind, who appears deeply concerned. Max is bewildered by what has transpired, it's not what he had envisioned. While waiting, Juval experiences a tumult of emotions. 
The revelation that Max is the crown prince explains many things his occasional arrogance despite his humble origins and his sporadic displays of elegance. To realize that he was the one person she had been avoiding the most leaves Juval feeling disappointed. Max eventually appears, still concealing his identity behind his mask. Evidently, he wishes to maintain the pretense. Juval brings up Max's proposal to date her and decides to decline it, leaving Max surprised. She expresses her disappointment in Max for concealing his true identity as the crown prince. Suddenly, Max kneels down, expressing regret and admitting his mistake. He explains that he didn't purposefully hide who he was, but did so out of fear that Juvel would leave him if she found out. He pleads with Juvel to reconsider and allow him to remain by her side forever. As Max repeatedly apologizes, Juvel wonders why he is going to such lengths. Recalling a past moment when Max expressed his love for her, which now confuses her regarding his true feelings. Gently, Juvel removes Max's mask, revealing Max's tears, and Max, setting aside his pride, confesses his love for her. He implores her not to leave him, tears streaming down his face. Deep down, Juval wants to believe him and realizes that if the Max she knows is the crown prince, then everything she thought she knew about him in her past life must have been a misunderstanding. She gently caresses Max's face and asks him to stop crying. She then bestows a tender kiss on his forehead. Seeing Juval smile, Max feels a weight lifted from his heart. He leans closer to Juval and places a gentle kiss on her lips, expressing his profound love for her. Their kisses continue, and it becomes evident that they both share deep feelings for one another. As their lips finally part, Juval admits that she's out of breath, prompting Max to immediately apologize. At that moment, Juval asks Max to promise her that he won't lie to her again and that he'll respect her and listen to her. Max nods in agreement, and Juval can't help but find Max adorable. She brings up the fact that Max should have told her the truth earlier when she mentioned the crown prince. Max explains that he couldn't say anything because every time she spoke of the crown prince, it seemed as though she were describing a demon from hell. Juval can't deny the accuracy of that observation. Max seeks confirmation from Juval that she now believes him and that the Empress was the one spreading the malicious rumors about him. Placing her hands on his face, she reassures him that she believes in him, knowing that he is a kind and caring person. Max is overjoyed to hear those words from Juval. Meanwhile, in the palace dungeon, Legis reluctantly revisits the place in search of clues about the Circe ring, even though he had no desire to return. He requires the assistance of Devon, the magician he is about to meet to break a magical barrier. Spotting the artifact given to him by Devon, it signals that Devon is nearby. However, Count Pyrex suddenly appears and notices Legis. Holding Devon's artifact, Count Pyrex threatens Legis, urging him to come out if he wishes to save his friend. The Emperor and his men have already captured Devon and realized that he is a magician from the same place as Amelia, Legis's late wife. The Emperor reminds Legis of Amelia's death and threatens him with Juval suffering the same fate. Unable to contain his anger, Legis unleashes his power to attack the Emperor. However, the Emperor remains unfazed, as his Circe ring now possesses the power to release the demon it has bound within Legis all this time. As the demon is set free, he questions Legis about turning back time and reassures Legis that only he can hear the demon's voice. The demon then brings up Juval's suicide and, not stopping there, also references the death of Legis's beloved wife, attempting to provoke Legis into causing utter destruction. As Legis struggles to resist, he eventually succumbs, and the demon takes control of his body. Once the demon fully takes control of Legis, the Emperor commands him to kill Devon. As he is about to strike Devon, fleeting memories of his late wife, Amelia, emerge, attempting to pull him back to his senses. In a desperate bid to resist the demon's influence, he suddenly stabs his own thigh and instructs Devon to escape. However, Legis remains partially under the demon's sway, despite his efforts to defy it. Meanwhile, in the banquet hall, Juval grows increasingly concerned about her father, who has yet to return. As she searches for him, her worry eases when she spots him walking alongside the emperor. When Legis exits, Juval attempts to approach him, 
but all she receives is a stern glare. Puzzled by his behavior, Juval is joined by Max, who inquires about the situation. Juval abruptly questions Max about what he would do if she were imprisoned for attempting to assassinate the royal family, asking if he would torture and execute her. Max vehemently assures her that he would never harm someone he loves, emphasizing that Juval and Legis are his only family. Juval then queries what would have transpired if this had occurred before their romantic involvement. Max, feeling uneasy, explains that if such a situation had arisen, Legis would have taken action, either by going to her himself or by sending Max. He conveys the depth of Legis's love for her. Hearing this, Juval reflects on her past life and starts to realize that she had misunderstood Legis entirely. She acknowledges that Legis genuinely loves her and wonders why he distanced himself from her before. Juval speculates that Legis may have a secret he couldn't share, prompting her determination to uncover the truth behind his actions in her past life. A full week has slipped by, yet Juval finds it increasingly impossible to have a meaningful conversation with her father. Every time she attempts to engage him, he provides excuses that leave Juval deeply frustrated. It's becoming evident to her that Legis is actively avoiding her. Meanwhile, Marilyn stands by with a tray of snacks, but Max intervenes, silently signaling her to hand the tray to him. Lost in thought about which snack to choose, Juval remains oblivious to the person feeding her until she discovers it's Max, leaving her pleasantly surprised. With a concerned expression, Max questions what has been occupying Juval's thoughts so intensely that she didn't hear him approach. He then wraps his arm around Juval from behind, confessing how much he's missed her and explaining that he's been extremely busy during the past week. The simple act of being embraced by Max fills Juval with a sense of warmth and comfort. However, a fleeting memory of Legis carrying her when she was a child resurfaces, causing Juval a twinge of emotional pain. Max, concerned, urges her to lie down to feel better. Meanwhile, Legis stands outside Juval's chamber, listening to their conversation. He knocks on the door and, upon entering, finds Max and Juval in close proximity. Legis gazes at them with a dark aura, shocking both. When Legis questions the mention of lying down, Juval, in a panic, tries to clarify that it's not what it appears to be. However, Legis, still exuding a foreboding presence, informs Juval that he needs to have a private conversation with Max. In the hallway, Max inquires about Legis's leg, but Legis denies any injury. It's clear that Legis is concealing something. Earlier, Max received information from his men about a suspicious incident in the Chamber of Shadows, where they couldn't investigate further due to the high risk involved. However, they did observe Legis present there with his leg covered in blood. Max wonders why Legis is bearing this burden alone. They eventually find themselves in the sparring room, and Max can't help but feel a sense of bewilderment. Legis tosses a sword his way, and as Legis retrieves his own, he brings up his earlier conversation with Juval about her ideal partner. With his sword unsheathed, Legis discloses that Juval's ideal match is someone stronger than him. In essence, if Max hopes to win Juvel's heart, he'll need to exceed Legis in strength. After the Emperor harnessed the ring's power, it took Legis half a day to regain control of himself following the princess's coming-of-age ceremony. While the ring's hold on him dissipated rapidly, the real concern lies in the fact that the Emperor is now aware of Devon. Legis can't help but worry that the Emperor would activate the ring, which he hadn't used in ages and manipulate him like a mere pawn, potentially turning him into a monstrous threat that could harm those dearest to him. However, from this ordeal, Legis deduced that the Emperor activated the Circe's ring by absorbing Devon's mana. In essence, as long as there is no one to siphon mana from, the Emperor can't control Legis. As long as Devon remains free, Legis can buy some time. Hence, he embarked on a mission to locate Devon which is why he had to decline Jevil's invitation as he tirelessly searched for Devon, who sadly remained elusive. It becomes clear to Legis that this is the only way to protect his beloved daughter. He announces that Max must surpass him. Pointing his sword at Max, Legis instructs Max to engage in a fight and emerge victorious. Max's determination surges as he proclaims that he won't lose to Legis if becoming Juval's partner is at stake. The battle commences, 
with Max launching a hasty attack that Legis effortlessly evades. Legis continues to provoke Max, goading him into launching aggressive attacks. Legis doesn't offer Max any openings, even declaring that he won't grant approval for Max to marry Juvel with his current skill level. During the intense sparring, Max's face is nicked by Legis in an unrelenting assault. Legis has never been lenient. He was just as demanding when Max was younger, consistently urging him to grow stronger for the sake of those he holds dear. Max, driven by determination, vows to surpass Legis, but unfortunately, Legis's skill remains superior, pushing Max to the brink. As Legis prepares to strike the defenseless Max, Juvel intervenes, frantically calling out to her father. Juvel's cheeks flush with embarrassment as she realizes she's been calling Legis dad, sounding like a five-year-old child. However, a flood of memories from her childhood with her parents suddenly returns, moments when they were genuinely happy back then. These kinds of memories, which Juvel didn't think were part of her recollections, cause her considerable emotional distress. Legis, noticing her distress, becomes concerned. Juvel eventually calms down and offers an apology for addressing Legis as dad. In response, Legis, with a gentle expression, pats her head and reassures her that she's welcome to call him dad if she wishes. Unexpectedly, tears start to stream down Juvel's face, although she's not entirely sure why. This deeply worries both Legis and Max, with Legis even inquiring if he did something wrong. Juvel expresses her concern that Legis might return to treating her coldly, as he did in the past. Hearing this, Legis has mixed emotions and proceeds to hug Juvel as he offers an apology. Meanwhile, Max also attempts to reassure her, suggesting that fathers-in-law are usually on the quieter side, which elicits a laugh from Juvel in agreement. As they enjoy their tea time together, Max affectionately shows his care for Juvel. Watching this lovey-dovey display before him, Legis reminds Max that he hasn't officially accepted him. Legis explains that unless Max can defeat him in a sparring match, he expects Max to refrain from excessive physical contact with Jevil and avoid crossing boundaries, like addressing him as father-in-law. Max offers the excuse that he was merely comforting Juvel. However, Legis insists that a piece of cake is more than sufficient for comfort, and instructs Max to keep his hands off her. Juvel suddenly reflects on how not long ago, she was terrified of the crown prince, leading Max to express his previous sadness about the situation. Observing this, Legis grows serious and questions Max about whether he had been hiding his true identity from Juvel all this time. Juvel then reveals that she discovered Max's identity during the princess's coming of age ceremony. Legis, with restrained anger, admits he thought Juvel was dating the crown prince despite knowing who he was. However, Juvel calmly explains that she initiated a contract relationship with Max because she believed Legis intended to marry her off to the crown prince. Max attempts to lighten the mood by mentioning that at least they now know the crown prince is a cute and adorable guy, punctuating his remark with an awkward laugh. This only infuriates Legis who regrets that he took Max as his student instead of Max just going to hell to become the devil's student. In response, Juvel stands up and asks for permission to leave, allowing Max and Legis to continue their conversation without her. Legis finds it difficult to believe that Max dared to lie to them, but Max calmly clarifies that he merely refrained from sharing the truth. Max then brings up the Circe's ring and the need to understand what it is which leaves Legis pale and shocked. Max obtained the identity of the magician who had been in the Chamber of Shadows with Legis through his sources. After the current emperor assumed power in the Ashet Empire, a law was enacted that prohibited anyone except the royal family from using magic. People were told that the empire's magicians had all hidden themselves away in exile. But rumors among the higher-ranking nobles suggested that the truth was different. It was said that the Emperor had kidnapped them and was conducting experiments on them in the palace dungeons. Fresha informed Max that a mysterious letter had arrived at the salon. The characters on the container were entirely unfamiliar to her, leading her to believe it might be some form of code. Observing it closely, Max recognized it as the same code that Legis had told him to use on the battlefield. When Max deciphered the code, the container opened, revealing the letters inside. 
As he read the contents, he was taken aback. Returning to Max and Legis, Max continues to press Legis for an explanation about Cersei's ring. Legis takes a drag from his cigarette, attempting to appear composed, and coolly informs Max that he has no knowledge of what he is talking about. Max, however, isn't easily deterred. He inquires about Legis' activities in the Chamber of Shadows, mentioning that he has already investigated the individual who had been with Legis that day. When Max brings up Devon, a resident of the Floyan territory and a magician Duke Floyan had officially declared dead a decade ago, Legis is visibly taken aback. Max also reveals why Legis had falsely declared Devon dead to protect him from Darius, the Emperor. Max then presents the letter he has received, which he believes is from Devon and related to the magician who had assisted the Emperor's last will. In the letter, it is written that this magician confesses his sins, acknowledging that he acted as a sort of demon-aiding Darius. He expresses his intention to end his life in an effort to save the world. The confession details his compliance with Darius's instructions, which involved stealing the mana of numerous colleagues and offering it to the Emperor. He did this fully aware that those from whom the mana was taken would soon perish, but he lacked the courage to relinquish his own mana, which prevented him from stopping. As the war raged on, the Emperor's insatiable greed for more mana led to extreme measures, including the kidnapping of women and children. This prompted the magician to question why the Emperor required mana when he could neither feel nor utilize magic. Through his investigations, he uncovered the historical origins of the Ashet Empire, its first emperor, the malevolent dragon Fafnir, and the protector of Asher Empire's magicians, the goddess of magic, Circe. He learned about the magical stone known as Circe's Eye, within which Circe had utilized all her mana to confine and seal Fafnir. The emperor consistently wore the ring containing Circe's Eye, treating it as an extension of his own body. The letter also revealed that only the royal family could wield the power of the ring, and in exchange for being supplied with mana, Fafnir, sealed within the ring, granted the ring's owner absolute control. However, some parts of the letter are damaged and illegible, and Max is diligently working to restore them. Yet, even with these missing details, he has gleaned the information that piqued his curiosity the most, the fact that the ring's contract holder, the one bound to serve the Emperor is none other than Legis Audrey Floyan. Max, unrelenting in his quest for answers, demands a thorough explanation from Legis regarding why he entered into such a binding contract. Legis, clearly reluctant to delve into further explanations, simply instructs Max to leave. Nevertheless, he proposes a challenge to Max. They will spar twice a week, and if Max can defeat him, he will divulge all the information Max seeks and grant permission to marry Juvel. In truth, Legis didn't forge the contract for the Emperor's sake. His sole motivation was to protect his beloved wife, Amelia. At the Hessen residence, an aura of frustration surrounds Mikhail as he grapples with the failure of his plan. Witnessing Mikhail's visibly distressed state, Radian steps in with a suggestion. Radian raises the notion that the first Ashet Emperor was a magician, and for three generations, no one has exhibited magical abilities. He subtly hints that the princess might be the one born with magic. This wickedly amuses Mikhail as he begins to devise sinister plans for his own advantage. At the Floyan residence, Juvel extends a warm invitation to her friends and introduces Beatrice to the gathering. The other ladies initially feel somewhat uneasy in the presence of the princess. However, as Beatrice engages in conversation with Juvel, sharing smiles and warmth, the apprehension among the ladies gradually dissipates. They've gathered here to assist Juvel in preparation for her upcoming coming-of-age ceremony. Amidst their lively discussions, Beatrice catches a glimpse of Max observing them from outside. Beatrice approaches Max's location, inquiring about his presence there. Max surprises her by claiming that Juvel is his wife, but Beatrice dismisses it as a mere figment of Max's imagination. Max then raises the subject of Mikhail's meeting with the Empress. Beatrice promptly reassures him, explaining that she's already provided the Empress with all the necessary information about Mikhail's trustworthiness, assuaging any concerns. The conversation takes an unexpected turn when Juvel appears behind them. 
Max discreetly instructs Beatrice not to reveal the secret that Juvel is, in fact, his wife. Ultimately, the situation seems to be a product of Max's imagination, and Beatrice proceeds indoors. When Juvel suggests that Max greet her friends, he politely declines, especially in the presence of Beatrice. He's aware of Beatrice's acting shortcomings and worries that her behavior might inadvertently unveil his true identity as the crown prince. Max explains that he hides his royal status because there are always opportunists seeking to exploit any weaknesses, which is why only a select few, like Legis, a handful of trusted comrades and Jovel herself, are privy to his true identity. Max then confides in Juvel about the troubling events following his mother's death. After her passing, Isabel ascended to Empress and attempted to poison Max. When her nefarious plan failed, she resorted to spreading malicious rumors about him. Paradoxically, Max used these rumors to his advantage, instilling fear in people to the extent that no one dared to confront him. Regrettably, these actions also had the unintended consequence of alienating Juvel, the person he cares for deeply. Max's revelation touches Juvel's heart, prompting her to envelop him in a warm, reassuring hug. Later, back at his place, Max inquires if the restoration of the letter is complete. As he reads its contents, Max is visibly taken aback by what he discovers. The letter contains a startling revelation that the contractor and the master share a life bond, implying that if the master dies, the contractor will also meet the same fate. Max has been unwavering in his pursuit of two objectives, Darius's demise and seizing the throne. However, Legis repeatedly delayed and concealed any signs of Max's rebellion rather than actively supporting him. Max's discovery that this was motivated by the life-bond connection shakes him profoundly. He realizes the grave consequences it could have and how it nearly led to Juvel's descent into despair. Determined to prevent such a tragedy, Max instructs Frasia and Victor to closely monitor Pyrex's actions. He also urges them to delve into the ancient palace records and artifacts, specifically investigating Cersei's ring. In the Eshet Palace, a significant meeting takes place as Mikhail holds an audience with the Emperor. Drawing from his findings in the ancient book, Mikhail firmly believes that Beatrice is the Empire's hidden magician, given her distinctive red hair and eyes. The Emperor, on his part, recalls a time when he shared the same belief. When Beatrice was born, someone reported that they sensed mana emanating from her, only for this hope to be cruelly shattered when it was proven false. As Beatrice failed to meet the Emperor's lofty expectations, he had to resort to wielding Cersei's ring to enslave the hero of the Empire to regain his throne. Mikhail is well aware that the Emperor still clings to the possibility that Beatrice might be the Empire's magician. He boldly proposes a plan to awaken her latent power. The first Emperor awakened her magic when she found herself in perilous circumstances. Mikhail suggests a similar approach placing Beatrice in a life-threatening situation. Upon hearing this audacious proposal, the Emperor breaks into laughter and ultimately consents to the deal. In the Floyan residence, Legis is engrossed in his work, and upon hearing knocks on the door, he assumes it's Derek, his butler. Without even looking, Legis instructs Derek to prepare the most splendid coming-of-age ceremony for Juval. However, when he finally lays eyes on Juval, who has brought him some food, Legis is taken aback. Juvel expresses her desire to organize her own celebration now that she's come of age, displaying her determination to take charge. Her resolve deeply moves Legis. Nevertheless, when a pigeon approaches through the window, Juvel is stricken with terror and quickly seeks permission to depart. Observing Sally, his pet pigeon, Legis realizes that Juvel still holds a fear of small birds. His attention is then drawn to a letter fastened to the bird's foot, compelling him to begin reading its contents. Evidently, the letter is from Devon, who provides Legis with an update on his well-being. Devon also informs Legis that he has sent the item they were seeking to Legis student, Max. He expresses his regrets, explaining that he wishes to assist Legis, but he can no longer set foot in the Empire. Consequently, Legis finds himself with no alternative but to help Max ascend. This is why Legis has been training Max so rigorously, even though it may sometimes seem excessively intense. 
In one instance Max nearly suffers a neck injury during training, narrowly avoiding a life-threatening accident. Geraldine approaches Legis with a report about an upcoming hunting competition. In a sudden shift of topic, Max spills the competition's prize. It is revealed to be a treasured necklace crafted from the rare underground flower, traditionally passed down within the royal family as an engagement gift. Max further discloses that the Hessen family also has its sights set on this flower due to rumors circulating in the salon that Mikhail plans to propose to the princess. Max asserts that he cannot allow his little sister to marry Mikhail and intends to win the competition to thwart Mikhail's plans. He adds that he will give the prize to Juvel when he proposes to her at her coming-of-age ceremony. This declaration visibly irks Legis, who sternly insists that Max must defeat him before proposing to his daughter. Following a grueling day of training, Max confides in Juvel about his near-death experience during training with Legis. Although Juvel tries to comfort him, Max still appears somewhat upset. Consequently, he asks if he can rest for a while and Juvel consents to his request. However, Juvel comes to regret granting him this permission when Max embraces her, causing her to blush. As Juvel attempts to pull away, Max firmly holds her, gently kisses her fed, and questions whether she was waiting for him. Juvel denies it, but Max's bold reaction takes her by surprise. Max proceeds to tease her, suggesting that he might leave now. However, before Juvel can respond, Max places a soft kiss on her lips. Max returns the handkerchief he had borrowed from Juvel, expressing his desire for her to embroider it with a design for the upcoming hunting competition. Juvel contemplates the significance of giving an embroidered handkerchief among nobles, and is uncertain whether Max comprehends the implications. She grapples with the decision, and Max reassures her that it's okay if she doesn't want to do it. Deep down, he genuinely wishes to receive a beautifully embroidered handkerchief from Juvel. Reflecting on her failure to express her feelings to Max adequately, Juvel ultimately agrees, and Max is delighted to hear her decision. Later that night, Juvel ponders the safety of Beatrice, feeling concerned for her well-being. Originally, it was Mikhail who was expected to win the hunting competition and gain favor with the princess. A twist occurred when a monster suddenly attacked Beatrice, and Mikhail happened to be the one to vanquish it, intensifying their love. However, based on Mikhail's recent behavior, Juvel suspects that the incident with the monster might not have been a mere stroke of luck. As a result, Juvel is determined to prepare for the future. Her current dilemma is creating the embroidered handkerchief for Max, which should depict a dragon but, to her chagrin, resembles a cat. Amid her frustration with the embroidery, Legis enters her chamber and notices Juvel engrossed in her work. He inquires about what she's doing and Juvel hastily covers her project, claiming, it's nothing. Legis then presents her with a box containing a beautiful necklace. Initially intended as a gift for her coming-of-age ceremony, he had a change of heart and instructs Juvel to wear it at the hunting competition. Confused, Juvel asks Legis about the necklace's significance. He explains that it was a treasure left to him by his one and only love, a precious heirloom that will protect Juvel. Legis proceeds to elucidate that the necklace is a precious keepsake that Amelia had intended to gift to Juvel once she reached adulthood. Memories of Juvel as a baby flood back, along with recollections of Juvel's mother, Amelia. She had diligently prepared the necklace, imbuing its monostone with her own magic every day and explained that it would serve to protect Juvel. Reflecting on this past, Legis's expression turns somewhat bitter. Suddenly, Juvel poses a heartfelt question to Legis, inquiring whether her mother loved her. She reveals that her memories of her mother are hazy, and that only recently has she had fleeting recollections of their happy moments together as a family of three. Legis embraces Juvel tenderly and assures her that her mother loved her deeply, emphasizing that Juvel, by her very existence, was a precious gem to both Amelia and Legis. Finally, the day of the hunting competition dawns, and participants are filled with eager anticipation. The arrival of the Floyan contingent draws the attention of everyone present, with even the Floyan knights catching the eyes of the ladies. Noticing Geraldine's peculiar expression, Legis questions Juvel about it, to which she speculates that Geraldine may be trying to appear alluring to the ladies. 
Geraldine suddenly exclaims that the Floyan Knights are the Asha Empire's protectors, responsible for the safety of its women. This statement takes Legis and Juval by surprise and causes them both to blush profusely. Legis resolves to give his knights a lesson in decorum once the competition concludes. As all the participants assemble, the Emperor inaugurates the hunting competition. Meanwhile, in another location, Mikhail stands before the beast's cage, promising it that it will be released soon. Juval finally succeeds in slipping away with just a single guard, after instructing the guard to remain in place. She rendezvous with Max at their customary meeting spot, handing him the delicately embroidered handkerchief she's prepared, complete with a small pouch. Juval explains that the fragrant scent will serve as his protection. Max is genuinely touched by Juval's thoughtful gesture, expressing his deep gratitude before planting a tender kiss on her lips. Meanwhile, from the royal family's designated viewing area, Beatrice requests her parents' permission to watch the competition with her friends. To her surprise, the Emperor not only grants her request, but also informs Beatrice that he's already arranged a location for her and her friends to enjoy the event. This news fills Beatrice with joy. As she sets off to gather her friends, Beatrice encounters Juval. Unexpectedly, someone with a hidden presence collides with Juval, causing her mana stone necklace to shift from purple to yellow. Turning toward the source of the impact, Juval finds herself face to face with Devon, who wears a smile and remarks that she now resembles Amelia more than ever. Curious about what has captured Juval's attention, Beatrice inquires, but Juval ponders whether she's the sole witness to the enigmatic figure and wonders how he knows her and her mother. Legis suddenly appears wearing a concerned expression as he reveals that he has been searching for Juval. Noticing the transformation of the mana stone on Juval's necklace, his anxiety intensifies. He inquires about the direction from which Juval arrived and, upon receiving the information, informs her that he needs to depart briefly. He instructs his knights to escort Juval and Beatrice back before hurrying away with a disquieted countenance. Juval hastily calls out to Legis, reaching out to hand him the charm pouch she crafted, confidently claiming it will serve as his protection. A gentle smile graces Legis's face as he pats Juval's head in appreciation, thanking her warmly before heading into the forest. Upon returning to their seats, Juval thoughtfully offers her friends the same protective charm she bestowed upon Max and Legis. She advises them to keep it close, no matter where their paths may lead. Meanwhile, deep in the forest, Legis tirelessly searches for Devon. He astutely discerns that the altered mana color on Juval's necklace was deliberately left by Devon as a signal. It matches the shade of the mana stone when Darius drained Devon's magic. Suddenly, Devon's voice resonates in Legis's ears, warning him not to turn around due to the Emperor's concealed agents lurking nearby. Devon elucidates his purpose, cautioning Legis that Juval will soon reach adulthood, which means her memories, sealed on the day of Amelia's funeral at Legis's request, will soon become recoverable. Legis's face is etched with worry, dreading that Juval will recall the harrowing memory of her mother's tragic death. He fervently expresses his desire to spare Juval from reliving those painful memories. Devon gently reminds Legis that Amelia's death was not his fault, and he should relinquish the guilt that could prevent his daughter from regaining her memories. He points out that the seal on Juval's memories encompasses not only the painful recollections, but also the precious moments from her early years. Legis then confides in Devon revealing that he fears that unsealing those memories will make Juval acutely aware of the depth of his love for her. And when he eventually departs this world, she will endure the same excruciating heartache he experienced when he lost Amelia. Devon imparts a crucial piece of information. If Legis repeats the words he uttered to Juval when the memories were sealed, her recollections will return. However, their conversation is abruptly interrupted when Darius materializes alongside Count Pyrex, appearing seemingly out of thin air, catching Legis and Devon off guard. Seated in the audience area, Juval is consumed by worry as her father has not yet returned. Unbeknownst to her, Legis finds himself in a dire predicament, cornered by Darius. Darius, frustration evident in his voice, demands to know the whereabouts of Devon, as he overheard Legis conversing with someone. 
He boasts about his ability to wield the same magic that the ring's owner could employ, reveling in his power. Devin's own power has ironically ensnared him. Legis, exasperated by Darius's words, fixes a piercing glare upon him and remarks that Darius tends to talk excessively for someone who depends on the ring for his abilities. This bold statement ignites Darius's fury, and he proclaims that a rebellious slave like Legis requires a lesson. Before Darius can continue his threats, Legis unexpectedly places a dagger against his throat and issues a stern warning. He cautions Darius that activating the ring will result in Legis's immediate demise. Darius initially denies the assertion that their lives are connected, but Legis persists in his threat, causing Darius to grow increasingly apprehensive. Fafnir, who has a contract with Darius, acts not out of loyalty but with the intention of freeing himself from the ring's control and destroying the Empire. In the grand scheme, Legis's death is something Fafnir cannot permit, making the situation comprehensible. Darius remains skeptical of Legis's warning, accusing him of bluffing due to desperation. Legis resolutely states that, for him, death represents freedom. Unexpectedly, Juvel emerges on the scene, precisely when Legis asserts his determination to terminate the contract. Darius seethes with anger, vowing not to allow that to occur. In her panic, Juvel calls out to Legis, and simultaneously, the mana on her necklace disrupts the barrier Darius had erected. Meanwhile, deep within the forest, Max's unease grows. Although they have ventured quite far into the woods, they have yet to encounter any monsters. He senses that something is amiss and swiftly orders a retreat. Years earlier, when Amelia crafted the necklace for Juvol, she had shared that should Juvel possess the same capabilities as herself, those powers would manifest during her coming-of-age ceremony. As Juvel desperately attempts to intervene, Legis is momentarily caught off guard, and in that instant, Darius seizes the opportunity, utilizing his ring to transform Legis into a monstrous entity. Despite his immense struggle, Legis fights to resist the transformation, going so far as to inflict harm upon himself. The scene unfolds before Juvel's eyes, leaving her consumed by worry for her father. But Legis persists in resisting his transformation, determined not to reveal his monstrous form to Juvel. Nevertheless, the malevolent Emperor's relentless commands eventually succeed in subduing Legis through the power of the ring. With Legis now under the Emperor's control, a chilling order is issued to end Juvel's life. Terrified, Juvel finds herself haunted by vivid memories from her dreams. As Legis, influenced by the ring's sinister power, advances menacingly, Devon intervenes with swift protective magic, observing the absence of the sword aura in Legis's dagger. Devon deduces that Legis is exerting an extraordinary effort to combat the ring's influence. Unable to remain passive in this dire situation, Juvel, with tears in her eyes, calls out to Legis. She fervently reminds him of the profound declaration he once made to her, emphasizing that she is an irreplaceable treasure to both him and her mother. In her plea, Juvel implores Legis not to succumb to the ring's malevolent control. Legis comes to a halt upon hearing her words, and he struggles desperately to reclaim his shattered senses. In this critical moment, Devon is unwavering in his determination. He urges Juvel to flee the scene, stressing that Legis had never wished for her to witness him in such a wretched state. Juvel grapples with a tumultuous mix of emotions, torn between concern for her father and the grave danger she faces. Yet Devon's unwavering insistence prompts her to make a harrowing decision. She departs the scene, her heart heavy with worry. As they sprint towards the safety of the crowd, Juvel is unable to contain her curiosity. She turns to Devon and inquires whether her father has been under the Emperor's control all along. In response, Devon implores her not to harbor resentment toward her father explaining that this was a sacrifice he made for the greater good. Just before parting ways, Devon assures Juvel that her long-lost memories will soon be restored. In her seat, Beatrice scans the area anxiously, desperately seeking any sign of Juvel. When she finally spots Juvel's arrival, relief washes over her. However, her relief turns to concern as she takes in Juvel's drenched appearance. She immediately leans in and asks Juvel what transpired. Moments later, Max hurries to the scene, 
his face etched with worry. Juvel's unexpected plea leaves Max in shock, his mind racing. But before anyone can react, a monstrous beast charges toward their position. Fear grips Juvel and Beatrice, causing them to freeze in their tracks. In a split-second decision, Juvel pushes Beatrice to safety. Even though leaving her friends and loved ones behind is the last thing she desires. Max dashes forward, his heart pounding, determined to come to Juvel's rescue. In this harrowing moment, Juvel can't help but fear that this might be the end of her life's journey. However, as Beatrice extends her hand to reach Juvel, an unexpected radiance emanates from deep within her. In this fleeting moment, Beatrice finds herself silently making a fervent wish. Regardless of its brevity, she begs for time to stand still. Astonishingly, time freezes momentarily, allowing the monstrous beast to only seize Juvel's cloak. Witnessing this, a wave of terror sweeps over everyone, prompting them to scatter in panic. Thankfully, Max manages to reach Juvel just in the nick of time. Holding Juvel tightly, Max can't hold back his tears, believing he has narrowly averted losing her. Juvel, comforting him, assures Max that she is unharmed. Through her teary eyes, Beatrice implores Juvel not to recklessly endanger herself like that. However, as Beatrice speaks, the monster redirects its attention toward them. In a swift and selfless move, Victor shields Beatrice from the oncoming monster's attack. However, to their shock, the beast's strength seems to surge even more. Amid the chaos, Beatrice can't help but ponder the extraordinary occurrence from within her earlier. She wonders if it had been an outpouring of magic. In a moment of reflex, Max leaps forward and thrusts his weapon into the monster's eye. This brave act creates a window of opportunity for Juvel and Beatrice to make their escape. They hurriedly flee, but Juvel's misstep leads to a painful fall. The relentless monster closes in on her. Suddenly, Legis emerges from the shadows, confronting and ultimately defeating the creature. Although he has to exert extraordinary control over himself, evident in his one red and one blue eye, Legis apologizes to Juvel for his belated intervention saying, Daddy's a bit late. Juvel rushes towards Legis, relieved to see him there. Legis, in turn, expresses his relief that Juvel is safe. Suddenly, Fafnir seizes control of Legis once more, transforming him into a monstrous entity. Juvel is filled with terror as she witnesses this transformation. However, in an unexpected turn of events, the Emperor approaches them and congratulates Legis. At that moment, Legis manages to regain control of himself. The Emperor acts as though he had come because of the commotion. Expressing his luck in witnessing the Empire's hero, Legis single-handedly defeating the monster. With a sharp glare, Legis proclaims that protecting one's daughter is what any father should do. It becomes evident that Legis is subtly warning Darius not to harm his daughter. Observing the monster's unexpected secondary evolution, Darius believes he has secured the victory. Dire wolves have a tendency to lose control when they approach mana sources, and in their frenzy, they consume the mana to further evolve. The way this creature moves and evolves right before Beatrice suggests that she has indeed awakened her latent powers, likely as part of Mikhail's scheme. With this realization, Darius plots to harness Beatrice's newfound mana to satiate Fafnir's insatiable appetite, assuming that Legis's resistance will come to an end at this point. The Emperor proceeds to announce the competition's winner and calls Max to the forefront. Just as the Emperor is poised to present the prize, Max unveils his masked face, revealing his identity to Darius, who is taken aback by the sudden revelation. Max fixes a piercing gaze on Darius and remarks that it's been decades since Darius last saw his son's face. He questions the solemn expression on Darius's countenance. The Emperor's initial scheme likely followed this sequence. Firstly, Mikhail would eliminate the monster and secure victory in the competition. And secondly, during the award ceremony, his engagement to Beatrice would be publicly disclosed. However, Max's unexpected appearance disrupted Mikhail's involvement and Juvel's intervention in rescuing Beatrice further foiled the Emperor's plans. As the situation deviated due to the monster's attack on the nobility, the Emperor found himself compelled to adapt his strategy. 
Consequently, Max intends to make the most of this altered opportunity. Then, he shifts his attention to the gathered guests, unveiling his face with a surprising revelation that leaves everyone in astonishment. Even Mikhail, who has been covertly watching from his concealed position, is caught off guard. Max proceeds to address the audience about the disturbance caused by the appearance of a dire wolf, a creature typically residing deep within the distant forests far from the venue. He highlights the inexplicable fact that this beast materialized within the vicinity in under an hour after the event's commencement, suggesting that such an occurrence could only have transpired if someone had intentionally brought the creature to the location. Max proclaims his determination to identify the mastermind behind the orchestration of this monster incident, one that caused harm to both his beloved and cherished younger sister. Darius's countenance betrays fear as Max asserts that there will always be consequences for those who harm his loved ones. Max is unwavering in his resolve to seize his father's throne and consign him to the depths of oblivion. Inside the carriage, Legis approaches Juvel, who still appears weak and shaken from the recent events. The sight of her father brings immense relief to Juvel, and she clings to him in a tight embrace. Legis, Realizing the toll his actions have taken on his daughter, apologizes for the fear he caused her back there. Overwhelmed by her emotions, Juvel lets her tears flow freely and asks Legis how long he had been shouldering that heavy burden alone. She makes it clear that she never wants him to bear such a weight in solitude and expresses her determination to protect him just as he has always protected her. Tears are shared between them, a testament to their mutual desire to safeguard one another. As Juvel eventually succumbs to exhaustion and drifts into slumber, Legis allows her to rest within the carriage. After closing the carriage door, he notices that Max is already waiting, and he takes the opportunity to question Max about his readiness to ascend to the throne and become the new emperor. Max is momentarily taken aback, but then resolutely articulates his determination to rise as the empire's new son and rescue the people. Legis, having reached a decision, reveals that he entrusts his precious daughter to Max, the future emperor. In the carriage, their conversation continues. Legis has finally made his decision after all this time because he's concerned the emperor might target Juvel. Now that Juvel knows the situation, Legis is feeling more at ease. Legis also discloses what happens when the ring controls him, forcing him to obey the Emperor's orders, even if it means harming Juval. Hearing this revelation, Max feels a profound sense of guilt for not knowing the extent of Legis' suffering. He resents Legis for not sharing his strength all this time, but now realizing it was all to protect Juval, Max is deeply ashamed. As Max mentions that the Emperor dies if the Contractor dies, Yuval, who has been listening to their conversation, recalls the moment when Legis threatened the Emperor to take his own life. She suddenly awakens and pleads with Legis not to sacrifice himself. At that moment, Legis is taken aback. Max agrees with Juval, asserting that Legis cannot trade his life for the Emperor's. They even suggest binding the Emperor and sustaining him with sugar water and sewing his mouth shut so he can't speak. These thoughts weigh heavily on Legis every day but breaking free from the contract won't be easy. If anything happens to Darius, Fafnir will undoubtedly seize control of Legis to prevent it. The only way for Legis to break free from the contract without dying is likely to change the ring's owner. Since only someone of Imperial blood can own the ring, and Fafnir must agree to the transfer, it won't be a simple task. Legis goes on to explain that Fafnir is the father of the first emperor, who once sought to destroy the Empire and was known as the Evil Dragon. He is an ancestor of the Ashet Imperial family. What's crucial is that Fafnir has control over the Ring, not the Emperor. Only someone who wants to use Legis to destroy the Empire would become the new Ring's master. With Legis opening up about this, it's clear he has no desire to die, and Max is now determined to find a way out. Meanwhile, in Hessen's residence, the Emperor pays a visit to Mikhail to reward him for discovering Beatrice's magical abilities. However, Mikhail doesn't appear pleased. The Emperor inquires about Mikhail's true motives, and Mikhail kneels down, firmly stating that he desires the destruction of the Floyan family. 
The Emperor reacts with anger, viewing Mikhail's use of the Imperial family for personal matters as petty. Nevertheless, the Emperor admits they share the same goal and reveals that Beatrice's magic is potent enough to bring about the downfall of the Floyan family. At Salon Blooms, Fresha is utterly taken aback when she learns of Max's intention to propose to Juvel on her birthday. Fresha can hardly fathom Max's plan for a public proposal. Max envisions it as the most magnificent proposal in the Empire's history, with all the nobles in attendance offering their congratulations. However, Fresha fears the opposite will occur, with the attendees casting disparaging remarks behind their backs. Max persists, believing that even the typically reserved Legis will shed tears of joy. But Freysha insists that, to the contrary, Legis may become infuriated. Not stopping there, Max anticipates Juvel's shy yet loving acceptance, envisioning it as the perfect ending. Nevertheless, Freysha believes Juvel may be scared and exclaim, Father, I don't want this marriage! Max is resolute and displays no intent to yield, even requesting that Frisia prepare a gift for Juvel on the day. Frisia musters a forced smile and contemplates what to do about the situation. She then broaches the topic of the current rumors circulating among the nobility. Upon discovering that Juvel's commoner lover is, in fact, the crown prince, Juvel's reputation has suffered. Frisia predicts this will spawn more gossip, with people suggesting that Legis is exploiting his daughter's marriage to the crown prince to foment rebellion. Although Max appears concerned, he remains steadfast in his plan, emphasizing that the opinions of the nobles and high society are irrelevant. He views the proposal as an opportunity to demonstrate to the world that Juvel belongs to him, ensuring her safety from further harm. Recognizing her inability to change Max's resolve, Freja suggests that Max make the proposal as extravagant and romantic as possible, to alter his image. She underscores the importance of showing the ladies that his role as emperor may not lead to an undesirable future. She believes that if Max proposes to Juvel in a manner that leaves other women envious, Juvel will undoubtedly say yes. Somewhat embarrassed, Max agrees to Freja's suggestion. Unexpectedly, Max tasks Freja with investigating Fafnir, a request that surprises her due to the taboo nature of such an inquiry in the Empire. Max insists on uncovering why Fafnir sought to ruin the Empire and the details of his sealing. He stresses that Fresha must gather all available information about him. Meanwhile, at the Floyan residence, Juvel is engrossed in preparing for her upcoming birthday party, so much so that she doesn't even realize Legis is there to feed her. Legis gently reminds Juvel that she mustn't skip meals, no matter how busy she is. Juvel is initially surprised to see her father there, but she eagerly shares her work and what she has been planning. Suddenly, Legis invites Juvel to take a leisurely stroll around the Floyan lands, believing it might provide her with a fresh perspective. Juvel is overjoyed and readily agrees. The following day, Legis and Juvel are prepared for their outing, accompanied by the Floyan knights. As they are about to enter the carriage, Max makes a surprise appearance, expressing his hurt feelings that Juvel was planning to go without him. He insists on joining them on the trip to the Floyan lands, sporting a radiant smile and mentioning that he even warmed Legis's seat for him. This sudden turn of events startles Juvel and irks Legis. As Max draws nearer to Juvel and expresses his affection, leaning closer to her, Juvel attempts to resist his advances. Observing their increasing proximity, Legis becomes agitated and promptly instructs Max to release Juvel, declaring that today's outing is meant for family and not suitable for Max. It's as if the mental battle between them is on the brink of reigniting, but Max maintains his cheerful demeanor, insisting on his presence. Legis, although wearing a forced smile, indicates he won't allow it. However, Juvel intervenes suddenly, clutching Legis's arm and imploring him to let Max join them, expressing her desire to show Max where she grew up. Legis finds himself torn, but his beloved daughter's pleas eventually persuade him, and he agrees. Just as Max and Juvel are about to embrace, Legis sternly reminds them that public displays of affection are not allowed. Juvel and Max reluctantly concur, and as Legis turns away, Max manages to steal a kiss on Juvel's cheek, leaving her pleasantly surprised. Finally, 
they arrive at the country house, the former Floyan residence. Upon stepping inside, Max senses the warm and inviting atmosphere, understanding why Legis had such an attachment to the place in the past. He notices a childhood picture of Juvel and can't help but admire how adorable she was as a child. Upon spotting a picture of Legis as a child with his parents, Max is equally surprised to see how serious and solemn Legis appeared in his youth. When Max comes across a picture of Legis and his wife, Amelia, he notices that even Legis could smile when he was with the person he loved. Legis then takes Juvel for a walk to her mother's grave, their first visit together since the funeral. The reason Legis wanted to go there was to pay his respects to Amelia. In his heart, Legis apologizes to Amelia for taking so long to visit with Juvel. When Legis and Max are alone, Max inquires whether Legis loved his wife deeply. Legis affirms that he still does. Max then questions if the contract with Cersei's ring was made for the sake of his wife. But Legis cryptically responds that Max will find out soon. Legis hopes that Juvel won't be hurt by the memories of the past. In the palace, Beatrice is enjoying her tea time with the Empress. The Empress starts to speak ill of Juvel, asserting that Juvel had schemed to win Max's favor in order to become Empress. Upon hearing this, Beatrice stands up for Juvel, defending her but the Empress becomes infuriated that Beatrice takes Juvel's side over hers. Unbeknownst to them, Victor watches from his concealed vantage point. Earlier when Victor realized that the appearance of the monster at the hunting competition was orchestrated by the Emperor, he understood that Beatrice's life was put at risk by her own father. He felt that he was the only one in the palace who could protect Beatrice, so he declared to Max that he would do everything in his power to safeguard her. That's why he continues to keep a watchful eye on Beatrice from a distance. Unexpectedly, Beatrice brings up the topic of the child in the Empress's womb, asking when she intends to inform the Emperor. However, the Empress appears uneasy, avoiding Beatrice's gaze and stating that she will tell him once the baby is stronger. Out of the blue, the Emperor appears, startling the Empress. He informs Beatrice that he has something to discuss with her. As they depart from the Empress, the Emperor briefly glances at her stomach, indicating he may have overheard the conversation between Beatrice and the Empress earlier. Beatrice is taken aback when they arrive in front of the dungeon's door. She looks concerned as she inquires about the reason for being brought there, but the Emperor, wearing a sly expression, reassures her not to worry as there is no danger. Meanwhile, Victor, who has been silently shadowing them, is unable to proceed further and wonders about the Emperor's intentions. Inside the dungeon, the Emperor calls out to Fafnir, and suddenly a shadowy hand reaches for Beatrice, remarking that her red hair makes her resemble him more than Darius. Terrified, Beatrice screams and covers her ears. She hears a dreadful screeching sound of metal that makes her ears ring uncontrollably. The Emperor forcefully removes her hands from her ears, instructs her not to block them, and urges her to greet Fafnir, the Empire's founder and the first emperor. Seeing Fafnir, Beatrice can't help but feel overwhelmed with fear. Fafnir reassures her not to be afraid, explaining that since her magical potential is inherited from him, he will personally teach her magic and help uncover the hidden truths of the Empire's founding, making her the world's greatest magician. The Emperor then states that if Beatrice follows through, he will pass the throne to her. Beatrice finds it hard to believe what she's hearing. The position her mother had desired so greatly, the seat her father had seemed reluctant to relinquish, is now being offered to her. She senses that something is amiss. Back in her chamber, Beatrice reads a letter from Juval, in which Juval talks about her upcoming birthday preparations and expresses her desire to see Beatrice there. This prompts Beatrice to venture out in search of a special present for her dear friend, while walking in the street, a sudden gust of wind blows her hat off her head. To her surprise, Victor appears and catches her hat, remarking that it's a pleasant surprise to encounter her there. In front of the secret auction house, Beatrice is surprised to find Victor there as well. Victor quickly clarifies that he wasn't intentionally following her, but had come under the orders of his lord. As the auction gets underway, the centerpiece is introduced, a hidden artifact of the imperial family, a precious tiara imbued with protective enchantments that the first empress wore until her final days. 
Beatrice has her eyes set on this item as the perfect gift for Juvale. Suddenly, Victor inquires about what she and the Emba Emperor discussed in the dungeon the day before. He discloses that the events at the hunting competition were orchestrated by the Emperor himself. This revelation shocks Beatrice to her core. Victor goes on to recount what he knows about the incident, revealing the Emperor's attempt to harm her. Beatrice can't help but tremble upon hearing this, as she comes to terms with the shocking revelation that her own father tried to end her life. The tiara's auction is drawing near its conclusion, and regrettably, the bidding surpasses the budget Max had provided to Victor. In this moment of desperation, Victor proposes a partnership with Beatrice. Meanwhile, at the Floyan residence on the eve of the party, Juval meticulously inspects every detail, finding everything perfectly arranged. Legis approaches and expresses his pride in her, which brings a radiant smile to Juval's face. However, Juval suddenly feels like she's forgetting something. It's then that Marilyn brings up the matter of Juvel's first dance partner, and Juvel realizes she hasn't made a decision. She's torn between choosing to dance with Max or Legis. As the night descends, Legis grows increasingly worried about the impending day when Juvel's memories might be unlocked. Once her memories are revealed, Juvel won't be able to conceal her mana any longer. Legis is concerned that her mana might spiral out of control, as indicated by Juvel's recent fainting episode. To prevent any harm to Juvel, Legis instructs Derek to ensure a doctor is on standby at the party the following day. On the day of Juvel's birthday party, the guests begin to arrive, and Juvel and Legis welcome them with their stunning presence. Max appears to be plotting something, as his men discreetly hide behind the bushes, signaling to each other to remain silent. Freysia emphasizes that there must be no mistakes today. None at all. She proclaims their determination to make the proposal an absolute success, and signals Max from outside when all is ready. Max, seeing their reassuring signals, feels relieved that he's in capable hands and believes this will be the most extraordinary proposal the world has ever witnessed. Juval delivers a heartfelt speech, expressing her gratitude to the guests for attending her party. Legis steps forward and extends his hand, indicating to Juval that he's ready to be her first dance partner. However, Juval informs him that she will share her first dance with Max. Max is overjoyed by this, while Legis tries to hide his disappointment but ultimately understands and accepts her choice. Oh, poor dad! How about you dance with me instead? The enchanting Juval and the handsome Max share a joyful dance together. Legis watches them from a distance, and Derek, who stands beside him, asks if he's upset. Legis admits it's a bit disappointing, but he asserts that if Juvel is happy, that's what truly matters to him. While dancing, Max whispers in Juvel's ear, expressing his desire to share something with her in front of everyone once the dance is over. Juvel gently touches Max's face and tells him that she'd prefer to discuss important matters in private. Hearing this, Max realizes he needs to adjust his plan and invites Juvel to meet him on the terrace once the party concludes. Juvel pulls Max closer and surprises him by agreeing with her brightest smile. Meanwhile, Beatrice pulls Victor out of the hall, saying she needs to speak with him. Once they reach the terrace, Beatrice inquires about the present they purchased for Juvel last time. Unexpectedly, fireworks illuminate the sky near them, accompanied by wishes for eternal love. The guests witness this and offer enthusiastic congratulations, leaving Beatrice feeling embarrassed and shocked. She questions Victor if he was planning to propose to her, to which he, equally taken aback and embarrassed, retorts that she was the one who dragged him out there. All right, let's leave them be and get back to Legis. Juval invites Legis to dance with her, and he's taken by surprise as he was quietly enjoying a drink alone. Juval explains that the first dance is traditionally the lady's last dance with her family, and she doesn't want it to be that way. She asks Legis to dance with her until the party's end, making him feel grateful and relieved that Juval cares for him deeply. As they dance together, Juval reminds Legis not to do anything untoward while she's not around. Pausing for a moment, Legis softens his gaze and assures her that he won't. Beatrice appears displeased as she approaches Max questioning what he had in mind. As she's about to ask if Max intended to propose to Juval, Max places his finger on her lips to silence her. 
With a serious expression, he questions her, asking who in their right mind would stage a public proposal and asserting that important discussions should take place in private. It was totally you, Max. Changing the subject, Max inquires about something that transpired in the dungeons. The party finally wraps up, and after all the guests have gone home, Juvel hurries to find Max. Earlier, Max had hinted that he had something important to discuss with her, and he's been patiently waiting for her. Seeing Max looking all nervous, Juvel can't help but smile. The same guy who confidently led everyone to victory earlier, now looks like a shy kitten in her presence. Max, all fidgety and jittery, approaches with a gift in his hands. He takes a tiara out of the box and explains that it was crafted by an ancient king who poured half of his mana into it to protect his beloved. Max gently places the tiara on Juvel's head and, with a slight quiver of nervousness, says that the king essentially gave half of his heart to his wife out of love. Then, dropping down on one knee, Max goes on to express that just as the sun covers half of the day, he proposes to Juvel, asking her if she'll be the moon of the empire and be his other half forever, and if she'll marry him. Seeing Max bearing his heart with all that nervousness, Juvel realizes just how much he wants her. She nods and says yes to his proposal. In an instant, Max springs up and enfolds Juvel in a tight embrace, expressing his gratitude and telling her that he loves her. Nervously, Juvel reciprocates with the same feelings, and Max is so over the moon that he hugs her even tighter. Juvel's filled with happiness but can't help wondering if she's allowed to feel this way. She's been praised by many people. Her father and friends are always by her side, and she's even with the person she loves. But then, suddenly, Juvel faints and falls, which shocks Max to the core. He swiftly catches her before she hits the ground and wakes her up, with Legis also arriving with a deeply concerned expression. Seeing Juvel unconscious, Legis is taken aback. The moment he had been so afraid of finally arrived. As Juvel is carefully placed on the bed, Max, deeply worried about her, anxiously questions what might be wrong. Legis explains that magicians can lose consciousness if they can't control their mana properly. This leaves Max baffled and Legis promises to explain later, assuring Max that Juvel is merely asleep to regain her sealed memories. Legis has mixed feelings about this, as he had hoped Juvel would never regain her memories. He despised Amelia's death and resented himself for being under someone's control so much that he never wanted to share that with Juvel. However, he also recognizes that Juvel is far stronger than he is, he leans in close to Juvel's ear and repeats the same words he said on the day her memories were sealed. He tells her he'll seal all her painful memories, and when she wakes up, he won't be as close to her as he used to be, won't be by her side as often, and he's doing it all to protect her. But no matter how he treats her, he'll love her forever. As Legis finishes his heartfelt words, tears start streaming down Juvel's eyes, and her mana starts emanating from her body. As Juvel's eyes flutter open, she's taken aback to find herself in the form of a child. Suddenly, her mother's voice calls out to her, and when she sees her mother alive right in front of her, Juvel can hardly believe her eyes. Amelia presents her with the flower wreath she had made for Juvel, radiating happiness. Realizing that she's reliving a forgotten moment from her past, Juvel is overwhelmed with emotion and begins to cry. Legis, who had just returned from work, rushes to comfort her. In this shared moment where her parents lovingly care for her, Juvel wonders how she could have forgotten this precious memory all these years. But then, Juvel finds herself standing in a corridor, overhearing her parents in the midst of an argument. Legis is urging Amelia to flee to a different country under an assumed name, believing it's the best way to protect her. However, Amelia is upset and vehemently disagrees with Legis's suggestion. Despite Legis's pleading for her to understand, Amelia stands firm. Legis, struggling to find a way to keep Amelia safe, attempts to calm her down and tenderly kisses her. He expresses his deep love for her and reveals his fear of the Emperor ordering him to harm her and take her mana. Feeling helpless, Legis confides in her, but Amelia, now calmer, reassures him that she'll stay by his side until the end and make sure he doesn't bear any guilt, no matter what may befall them. 
When Amelia discovered that Legis made the contract with the Emperor as soon as she revealed her pregnancy with Juval, she realized the depth of Legis's love for them. Juval watches these memories unfold, finally understanding what happened. Legis made the contract with the Emperor to protect her mother and herself. The memories then shift to a moment when her mother instructs her to hide in a wardrobe and not make a sound, cautioning her not to let the monster discover her whereabouts. Juval cries, insisting that her father isn't a monster. But Amelia firmly clarifies that the monster isn't her father. Amelia seals the wardrobe with her magic, ensuring Juval's voice can't be heard from outside, all in the hope of keeping Jevil safe. Tensions escalate further, and a Floyan knight warns Amelia to flee as Legis, under the ring's control, approaches them. Without wasting any time, Legis, under Fafnir's control, forcefully breaks through the door and orders the Emperor's men to eliminate everyone in the house. Juval realizes that this is the day her mother died, but she's powerless to change anything, as this is merely a memory. Amelia feels a profound sense of helplessness as she watches her knights being killed before her eyes. When she turns to face Legis, he launches an attack at her. And even though she manages to cast a spell, she's overpowered by Legis's assault. Fafnir, who is manipulating Legis, attempts to strangle Amelia. As he raises his sword, Amelia, in tears, calls out Legis's name, touches his face, and reminds him that she's the one he wanted to protect. She implores Legis to look into her eyes, which he used to find beautiful, and she assures him that the Legis she knows loves her deeply. She states that she doesn't blame him, as it's not his fault. Legis hesitates and almost regains his composure, with tears streaming down his face. Amelia believes in Legis and urges him not to give in, declaring her unwavering love for him. Inside, Legis struggles to regain control of himself, but one of the Emperor's knights stabs Amelia from behind, preventing her from defending herself. Juval witnesses this tragic event and cries uncontrollably. As Amelia lies on the ground with her lifeblood seeping from her body, Legis comes to his senses. He is overwhelmed by despair as his aura radiates from his body, and he cries out his wife's name. In that moment, Legis undergoes a transformation, his demeanor becoming more menacing as he takes up his sword and annihilates all those responsible in a fit of rage. Amid the chaos, he returns to his dying wife, apologizing deeply. In her final moments, Amelia tells Legis that her fate was her own choice and insists that he should not blame himself. She also instructs Juval, who is still hiding in the wardrobe, to regard anything painful or sad as nothing more than a story in a book. Just before taking her last breath, she reaffirms her love for both Legis and Juval. Juval comes to her senses, tears streaming down her face as she opens her eyes. Max, who is by her side, expresses his concern. Legis, burdened with sadness and worry, realizes that Juval now remembers everything. As Legis is on the verge of leaving Juval, unable to face her disappointment, Juval calls out to him while still shedding tears. She reminds Legis of his promise to always stand by her side no matter what happened. Legis apologizes and confesses that he asked Devon to seal away Juval's memories because he lacked the courage to explain the painful truth of what had occurred. His heart is heavy with regret and anguish, and his tears seem endless. Seeing Legis consumed by remorse and the burden of guilt he carried all this time, Juval feels deep sadness. She tries to reassure him, recalling her mother's last words before she hid Juval in the wardrobe. Amelia had told her that if Legis ever faced difficult times, she should tell him that he is most beautiful when he smiles, a phrase Amelia had often used with him since he was very young. So Juval encourages Legis to smile and not cry anymore. The two of them, with puffy eyes from their emotional exchange, sit down to have tea together, and Max is still concerned about Juval's well-being. Curious, he asks Legis how he managed to break free from the Emperor's control. Legis explains that it was likely due to the mana that Amelia poured into the protection magic just before her death. As Legis resisted the Emperor's control of his own free will, he became an ascended, he also reveals that when a swordsman surpasses the limits of a human being, they stop aging, meaning that since the day of Amelia's death, Legis's time has essentially stood still. 
Recognizing that Amelia was the last surviving magician of the Empire, Max realizes that Juvelian must also possess magical abilities, a fact confirmed by Legis. Juvel is surprised because she had no knowledge of her magical powers, as Legis had sealed both her abilities and her memories. Legis goes on to explain that Juvel saved him with her magic during the hunting competition, but Juvel is still confused, as she believed this world to be a storybook realm. Legis speculates that Amelia cast an incantation on her to create that perception. Max questions why Legis had kept all of this hidden for so long, asserting that he would have assisted him if he had asked. Legis looks somewhat bitter as he points out that Max has undergone a significant transformation from his earlier self, when he didn't care for Juval. At that time, Max was a tyrant who rarely heeded Legis's advice and did as he pleased. Furthermore, Legis reveals that he was surrounded by enemies at the time and had intended to shoulder everything and end his life after arranging Juval's wedding but failed. Both Max and Juval are baffled by Legis's revelations. Legis goes on to disclose that this isn't the first time he has lived this life, it's his second. This stunning revelation leaves Max and Juval speechless as they attempt to grasp the meaning behind Legis's words. Legis continues to apologize and admits that, in a past life, Juval died because of him, which is why he put his life on the line to start over. Back in the day when Juval was wrongly accused of poisoning the princess, Legis had unwavering faith in her innocence. He knew she wouldn't do such a thing. But the situation was dire. People were already suspicious of Juval, and no one seemed interested in finding the real culprit. It seemed like the Emperor might personally interrogate Juval, accusing her of attempting to assassinate the Imperial family. This was a nightmare Legis couldn't allow to unfold. He'd successfully concealed many secrets, but he feared that if Juval's life was in danger, her magical abilities might awaken revealing her as a magician to the Emperor. The only option was to take Juval to a place where magic couldn't be used, a safe haven until Legis could rescue her and ensure the Emperor's surveillance was no longer a threat. He gave Juval a dagger, intending for her to protect herself. But she tragically misunderstood and thought it was for her to take her own life. After securing Juval in the Chamber of Shadows, Legis wasted no time and immediately sought out Max. At that time, Max was still a tyrant and challenging to approach. Legis offered to cooperate with Max's plans in exchange for saving his daughter and ensuring her safety. Max accepted the deal, characterizing it as a trade, Legis's daughter's life for Max's father's. The agonizing time Legis spent waiting after Max departed felt like an eternity. Suddenly, Victor rushed in, his panic palpable, and urged Legis to come immediately. It was a heart-wrenching moment for Legis as he discovered his beloved daughter lying lifeless. Max apologized to Legis and told him that he had tried to stop her, but Juval had taken her own life the moment he entered. Legis felt utterly powerless, blaming himself and begging her forgiveness, but his remorse couldn't breathe life back into Juval. Legis clung to her lifeless body for what seemed like an eternity, completely helpless. As her body grew cold, he ceased to be the Legis Adre Floyen he once was. He returned to the hall and unleashed his fury on those present, driven to madness. He even harmed the Emperor who tried to summon Fafnir to stop Legis. He no longer cared about his own life, for he couldn't bear to continue living in a world without his daughter. Ultimately, he struck down the Emperor himself. In his desperation, before his own demise, Legis took out a pendant and made a fervent wish to save Juvel. This pendant, a cherished Floyan family heirloom, had been passed down through generations. Legis had received it from his father during his childhood. The Empire's patron god had bestowed this treasure upon the Floyan family as a reward for their unwavering protection of the Empire. The enchanted pendant offered one chance to save the life of a true-born Floyan family member upon their death but it came with a significant cost. Legis used it in his final moments to rescue Juval, giving up everything he held dear, as she was the most precious thing in his world. After hearing everything Legis has laid bare, Max's anger flares as he clings to his unwavering resolve to confront the Emperor. Nevertheless, Juval's concern persists, knowing they cannot allow Legis to meet his demise. 
Still, Max emphatically asserts that they have a viable option, and it's en route. With her anxious expression, Beatrice arrives and inquires about Juvel's well-being. Legis then beckons Max to join him, and he bluntly questions whether the proposed solution involves using the princess. Max discloses that Beatrice has harnessed her latent powers during the recent hunting competition, with the Emperor approaching her to teach magic through Fafnir. Infuriated by this revelation, Legis contends that underestimating their adversaries is a grave mistake. He emphasizes that the Emperor and Fafnir's apparent agenda is a ruse designed to pilfer Beatrice's mana. Legis vehemently refuses to jeopardize the princess. Suddenly, Beatrice bursts into the room, surprising both Max and Legis, insisting on having a say in the discussion. The four of them converge to engage in a frank conversation. Max proceeds to outline his plan, advocating for Beatrice to assume the role of the ring's new master. Legis elucidates that Fafnir has ruthlessly extinguished the lives and mana of every magician within the Empire to emancipate himself from the ring's control. Adopting a solemn demeanor, Legis asserts that with no remaining magicians within the Empire, Beatrice is now the prey Fafnir has long coveted. He reiterates his steadfast opposition to the plan, unwilling to endanger Beatrice's life solely to preserve his own. Juvel echoes her father's sentiments, unwilling to see Beatrice's life placed in peril. Even as Max and Beatrice meticulously detail their plan, Legis remains obstinate in his dissent. Beatrice voices her apprehensions, stressing that she doesn't want Legis to die but is equally opposed to becoming a sacrificial pawn. She holds firm in her belief that the plan will succeed. Max exudes unwavering confidence in his proposed course of action. Observing Beatrice and Max's unyielding resolve to safeguard Legis, Juvel herself grows steadfast in her determination to grow stronger and ultimately save her father. Abruptly, the Emperor's knight insists on entry and, acting on the Emperor's orders, informs Legis and Max that they are to report to the palace forthwith. Should they decline, it is made clear that they will be taken by force. Juvel watches from behind with a concerned expression, while Legis notices her worry and offers reassurance that everything will be alright, promising they'll return soon. As a result, Max and Legis comply with the directive. Within the carriage, Max realizes that the individual guarding them is none other than Nicolas Marone. Max broaches the subject of Nikolai's absence during the Reagan War and his involvement in weapon supply, to which Nikola attempts to evade. However, Max employs intimidation, asserting his knowledge that they share a portion of their profits with the Emperor in exchange for service exemption and a monopoly on weapon supplies. Max uses this leverage to threaten Nikola, stating that he will expose everything during the forthcoming hearing, which will be attended by all the nobles. Feeling defeated, Nikolai implores Max and asks how he can be of service. In response, Max inquires about the individual responsible for orchestrating the noble hearing. In the Grand Palace, where nobles have convened for Max and Legis' trial for treason against the Emperor, it is revealed that Marcus Hessen is the orchestrator. Marcus Hessen starts by accusing Max of concealing his identity all this time for the sole purpose of gathering information to overthrow the Emperor. Max responds calmly, stating that wearing a helmet is simply a personal quirk. When asked about his relationship with Juvel, Max explains that Juvel assumed he was a common mercenary before he could reveal his true identity. Marcus Hessen remains skeptical, incredulous that anyone could mistake Max for a commoner. In response, Max suggests it was Mikhail, Marcus Hessen's own son, who made that mistake. Max proceeds to reveal the full extent of Mikhail's actions against him and Juvel, leaving Marquis Hessen speechless and trembling in fear. Observing the situation, Duke Elios shifts the focus from Max to Legis and questions why he allowed the relationship between Max and Juvel to continue despite Max and Legis's previous enmity. In response, Legis firmly denies ever accepting their relationship. Legis appears deeply troubled as he expresses the immense effort he invested in keeping his daughter and the prince apart. To his dismay, Juvel's affection for the prince far exceeded his expectations. He laments that no parent can resist their child's wishes and acknowledges that all he can do is quietly watch over the prince, fearing he might exploit her feelings and cause her harm. 
His pained countenance reveals a sorrowful father who feels he has lost his daughter to a malevolent force. Max, observing Legis's convincing performance, remains uncertain about whether Legis is genuinely speaking the truth or simply acting. However, the other nobles launch an offensive against Legis, interrogating him about why he dismissed the previous suitor for his daughter. Legis boldly asserts that no man within this empire meets the standards for his daughter, firmly declaring that he will never permit Juvel to marry. Max is astonished by Legis's unwavering stance, finding it difficult to believe that Legis could adopt such a demeanor. Max goes on to argue that it appears they are attempting to construe circumstantial evidence as an act of treason, and he maintains that insulting him without substantiated proof should be viewed as a manifestation of disrespect for the imperial family. Eventually, Max and Legis return home together. Inside the carriage, Max speculates that the nobles at the hearing want to make his relationship with Juvel public in order to cast Legis and Max as members of an anti-emperor faction. Max is troubled by the realization that the nobles align themselves with the emperor, and Legis assures him that the commoners hold a different perspective, supporting the hero of the Reagan War, Max. Legis proposes that they must work to sway public opinion with the help of the commoners before the anniversary of the empire's founding. At the Floyan residence, an unexpected visitor arrives to see Juvel. It is Sir Frederick Elios, the eldest son of Duke Elios, a highly regarded figure among the nobility and a frequent topic of conversation. Juvel can't help but wonder about the reason for his sudden visit. Sir Frederick soon unveils his true purpose, revealing that, as one of the most influential families, they were tasked with gathering evidence of treason involving the Floyans and the Crown Prince. However, his true quest is to uncover the mastermind behind the appearance of the monster at the previous hunting competition, as he suspects someone of extremely high rank was involved. Upon hearing this revelation, Juvel recalls that Max's associates had secretly requested Duke Elios's family to investigate the incident, aiming to obtain proof that the Emperor was responsible for the monster's appearance. Given that Duke Elios was one of the primary accusers during the previous hearing of Legis and Max's alleged treason, Juvel wonders if Sir Frederick's true intention is to test her loyalty. In response, Juvel questions why Sir Frederick is sharing such a perilous secret with her. With a serious expression, Sir Frederick explains that it's because he deeply admires Legis, and that Max doesn't seem as unhinged as the rumors suggest. Juvel is so shocked by this unexpected revelation that she accidentally spits out her drink. Sir Frederick goes on to mention that he once witnessed a private conversation between Legis and Max, leading him to believe that if Max is trusted by the person he admires, then he, too, should trust Max. Abruptly, he stands up, hands Juvel a handkerchief, and declares that the Elios family is always ready to stand by the Floyans. Leaning closer, he confides that it's their little secret. Unexpectedly, Max arrives and is infuriated to see Juvel being teased by another man. He quickly intervenes, pushing Sir Frederick away from Juvel and stating that it should be common knowledge throughout the Empire that he and Juvel are in a relationship. Max questions Sir Frederick's intentions, leading Sir Frederick to clarify that he came to see Legis, but greeted Juvel in Legis's absence and requests permission to leave. Max then presents Juvel with a unique pair of shoes, the only ones of their kind in the Empire. After trying them on, Juvel asks for Max's opinion. Max is captivated by her beauty, admits the shoes look great on her, but still inquires about her feelings for Sir Frederick. Juvel acknowledges that she holds a favorable opinion of him, considering his good reputation and good looks, and believes his support could be valuable. Max becomes frustrated, recalling other blonde attractive men, such as Rowan and Mikhail. Suddenly, Legis appears, seemingly searching for Max. Juvel greets her father while Max remains sulking about fair-haired individuals and expresses his preference for dark hair. Out of the blue, Legis instructs Max not to be ridiculous and hands him a bag. When Max opens it, he finds a blonde wig, leaving him taken aback. As Max puts on the wig, Juvel is captivated by his new look with blonde hair. Legis asserts that tonight presents their opportunity and emphasizes the need to garner public support for their cause. 
Max and Legis are in disguise, with Legis adopting the alias Leo to conceal his true identity, displaying an unexpected talent for acting. Legis guides Max to an underground bar, and Max can't help but wonder if Legis has frequented the place before, given his familiarity with it. Inside the bar, as Max surveys the surroundings, he notices a group of three individuals preparing to start a gambling game. He expresses his interest in joining them. Initially, the others are hesitant, perceiving Max and Legis as mere children playing around. However, when Legis places a bag of money on the table, introduces himself as someone with a child and reveals his age as 26, contradicting his true age of 39, they permit Max and Legis to participate and apologize for their initial misunderstanding. Max is amazed by Legis' versatility, not only as a swordmaster, but also as a lie master, given his age fabrication. Max manages to win the game, but one of the players accuses him of cheating. Max asserts that he played the game as he was taught, pointing to Legis as his source of knowledge. The accuser becomes enraged, doubting Max's claim. At this point, Legis opens his hoodie and asks the man if he recalls his face, reminding him of a time when Legis paid for his drinks while he was inebriated and complaining about the Emperor. The man is taken aback by this revelation. Max then comments that the man appears to harbor a great deal of resentment toward the Emperor. The other two players candidly admit their grievances, expressing their feelings of being treated as expendable pawns by the Emperor, who abandoned them once he no longer needed their services. They reveal that the Emperor failed to provide them with the promised payment despite risking their lives on the battlefield, with one of the mercenaries, a man with only one leg, lamenting that he lost his leg without receiving proper compensation. However, he also recall a single positive memory, after he lost his leg, the Crown Prince visited him daily and offering him treatment. The Crown Prince, they note, was the only one who took concrete action to aid a humble mercenary's recovery. With their gloomy expressions, they believe the Crown Prince probably doesn't remember them. Suddenly, Max surprises them by proclaiming that he hasn't forgotten, and he recalls every word they uttered during the war. He proceeds to mention their names one by one, stunning the mercenaries. Max removes his wig, revealing his true identity as the Crown Prince. The mercenaries bow before Max after this revelation. Max urges them to stand and apologizes for his belated response. He promises to fulfill the pledge his father couldn't keep, right there and then. Touched by Max's words, the mercenaries are deeply moved. Max implores them to join his cause as he seeks to become the rightful ruler of the Empire, ensuring that there are no more victims like them. In her chamber, Juvel is deeply engrossed in her books when she faintly perceives voices nearby. She emerges from her room and notifies the knights guarding her at the entrance. Suddenly, Geraldine approaches and mentions that he hears approaching footsteps. He advises Juvel to remain in the parlor where they can keep her safe. Juvel complies but returns to her room briefly to gather some books. While collecting her books, Juvel is suddenly surprised by the appearance of Beatrice. Beatrice explains that since the Emperor employs his agents to shadow her, she's using her magic to visit Juvel. Juvel conveys her fatigue to Geraldine and expresses her desire to retire to her room. Observing Beatrice's newfound magical abilities, Juvel discloses that despite her extensive reading of magical books, she still hasn't been able to use magic. Beatrice then imparts Fafnir's advice, explaining that magic isn't acquired solely from books. It demands imagination, vividly detailed mental images, and unwavering focus. She offers a demonstration by filling an empty cup with black tea, leaving Juvel in awe. Juvel makes an attempt, but nothing happens, leading to her frustration. Beatrice advises her not to force herself to replicate her actions, but to concentrate on what she desires most. Juvel gives it another try, and suddenly, fireworks burst into the sky. As Legis gazes at the fireworks, he recognizes that Juvel's search for him resembles Amelia's. Juvel is overjoyed that she has managed to use magic, stating that she only wished to locate Legis and Max. Beatrice shares in Juvel's happiness. However, Juvel struggles to halt the fireworks display, which finally ceases after 20 minutes. Juvel requests that Beatrice teach her a bit of magic each day in the same manner. 
Unexpectedly, Beatrice turns away and discloses her true purpose in visiting to bid farewell to Juvel because they won't be able to see each other for some time. Juvel is taken aback and inquires about the meaning of this statement. But Beatrice, with a stern expression, declares that from that moment onward, they are no longer friends. In the Ashed Imperial Palace, the engagement ceremony between the princess and Mikhail is taking place. Juvel is filled with sadness as she witnesses Beatrice going to great lengths to play along with her father's plan. The previous night, when Beatrice visited Juvel, she disclosed that Fafnir had instructed her to pretend to cooperate with the Emperor to avoid raising suspicions. She also revealed her intention to offer Fafnir her mana and win him over to secure ownership of the ring. Juvel had implored Beatrice not to go to such extremes, cautioning her about the possibility of Fafnir deceiving her. However, Beatrice insisted that if Juvel wasn't happy, she couldn't be either, and she was doing it for her own sake as well. Beatrice also gave Juvel a bracelet containing half of her mana, asserting that this would prevent the worst-case scenario and implored Juvel to trust her. Now, Max also assures Juvel that their preparations are complete, and all that remains is to wait. Observing Juvel's concern, Max provides reassurance, expressing confidence that Beatrice will be all right. He emphasizes that the formal marriage between Mikhail and Beatrice is scheduled for the Empire's founding anniversary, effectively implying that it will never occur, as that day is when the current Empire will be dismantled. Max further explains that Beatrice's engagement is merely a facade designed to lull the Emperor into believing that everything is proceeding according to his plan until that moment. Nevertheless, Juvel can't help but worry about the possibility of failure and the potential for Fafnir to deceive Beatrice. As she is about to contact Beatrice, Max intervenes, cautioning Juvel that Beatrice and Fafnir are currently sharing their mana, which means Fafnir might be privy to everything Beatrice sees and hears. It suddenly dawns on Juvel why Beatrice has declared that they can no longer be friends that night. In that moment, Juvel remembers the bracelet given to her by Beatrice, which contains Beatrice's mana. Juvel then attempts to use her magic to discern what Beatrice is currently doing. In her vision, Juvel witnesses Fafnir, the malevolent force controlling her father. Suddenly, Fafnir's glare sends a shock through Juvel, causing her to collapse. Despite her shock, Juvel manages to tell Max that she has seen their adversary, the one they will have to confront from that point on, the true form of Fafnir. Because explaining the situation to Max is challenging, Juvel employs her magic to the mirror to access the recollection of what she saw. In her vision, Fafnir is engaged in a conversation with Beatrice. Beatrice reveals to Fafnir her deep-seated loathing for Darius and her desire for vengeance against her father. She inquires about Fafnir's motive for wanting mana, specifically whether it's to escape from the basement. Fafnir discloses that his powers have diminished, limiting his freedom of movement, which is why he seeks mana to regain his liberty. Beatrice further asks him to divulge more about himself to earn her trust and share her power with him. Fafnir then begins recounting the betrayal by his son in the past, who attempted to kill him to steal his heart in pursuit of eternal life. Fafnir's intense anger causes his tears to transform into lava, which ultimately engulfs the Empire, although it wasn't his intention to destroy it. His son's avarice brought both himself and the Empire to the brink of ruin, Beatrice attempts to empathize with Fafnir's situation, explaining that she, too, harbors not just a grudge against her father, but against the entire world that forced her into a princess role she never desired. She expresses her intent to release Fafnir from the ring, but admits her uncertainty about undoing a seal cast by a god. Fafnir reassures her, pointing out that she may not be aware, but powerful mana surrounds her. Magicians often unconsciously use their mana to protect those dear to them. Fafnir recognizes the mana as Juvel's. Fafnir then reveals that if Beatrice possesses Juvel's mana, they will have enough power to break Cersei's seal. Beatrice subsequently makes a request, proposing a win-win arrangement. She asks Fafnir to let her become the new ring owner so she can exact revenge on her father, and in return, she pledges to extract Juvel's mana from her. Fafnir, however, responds in an ancient language that Jevel and Max don't comprehend. As they wonder about the significance of Fafnir's words, Legis, appearing from behind, 
translates his message. It states that, of course, they can proceed with that plan as long as Beatrice succeeds, because Juval's mana is identical to that of the goddess Circe. Legis startles them as he suddenly realizes they've decided to go along with Beatrice's plan to deceive Fafnir and become the owner of the ring. Juval, who initially believes her father will oppose this plan, questions if he will try to stop her from proceeding. Unexpectedly, Legis encourages her to go through with it, as he knows she won't listen if he says no. This revelation surprises both Max and Juval. However, Max and Legis abruptly notice something unusual as a servant approaches and appears to be eavesdropping. They quickly change the topic and suggest going for a horseback ride to get some fresh air. While they are on their ride, Legis confides in Juval that he suspected something odd about the servant, so they need to be cautious. Legis also advises Juval not to eat any food prepared by that servant and to ensure that she only has tea with him. Max corrects Legis, promising to visit her every day. Legis believes it's the best course of action, as he can now utilize Max as Juval's personal bodyguard. Upon reaching a vantage point where they can see the entire empire, Legis begins to share with them the story of how he entered into a contract with the Emperor, and why magicians disappeared during that time. 22 years ago, Darius ascended to the Imperial Throne, and Legis was appointed as a Central Army Knight at the age of 17. He was elated because he was proud to follow in the footsteps of his ancestors and become a Knight of the Empire. However, his father always disapproved of his ambition to become an Imperial Knight. At the time, Legis believed his father's disapproval stemmed from the belief that he wasn't good enough. He resolved to prove himself and earn his father's approval. When Darius offered Legis the opportunity to become his personal knight, Duke Leon Floyan, Legis' father, declined politely, citing Legis' current state. Duke Leon remained as quiet and stern as ever, but during that moment, Legis turned to find his father's hand bleeding. Later, Legis learned that the blood was from the Empire citizens who were mysteriously disappearing without a trace. Legis' father, the former Duke, had been a loyal knight serving the Imperial family for the past two decades. He was known for his meticulous and reserved nature, rarely displaying his emotions to others. When Legis observed his father's unusual hostility toward the new emperor, he couldn't simply ignore it. So, Legis decided to approach his father and inquire about the blood he had seen on his hand. After a moment of silence, Legis's father suddenly shocked him by revealing that the current emperor, Darius had issued orders for the Central Knights to capture all magicians without exception, extracting their mana and ensuring their demise. Worried about Amelia, Legis resolved to protect her. He discreetly removed Amelia's name from the list of Floyan magicians in his father's study, and fortunately, the Emperor's agents remained oblivious to this change. Time passed until Legis and Amelia came of age, and Legis proposed to her, expressing his deep love. Both Legis and Amelia were aware of the potential opposition from Legis's father, but Legis remained undeterred. To Legis's astonishment, his father granted him permission to marry Amelia. As his father left him, he muttered words that Legis couldn't comprehend. Shortly after their marriage, war erupted with Tajuria, bringing loss and hardships to Legis. His father perished in the war, and his mother, unable to cope with the grief, passed away not long after. With the Emperor's flight from the palace and the demoralization of the knights, Legis rallied the Central Knights, proclaiming that they still had people to protect and were determined to emerge victorious. There was no time to dwell on the sadness of his parents' deaths. Eventually, they emerged victorious in the war. Upon returning home, Legis was greeted by his pregnant wife, Amelia. She shared with him the name she had chosen for their child, Juvelian. When Legis heard the name, he was profoundly shocked, recalling his father's earlier words, urging him to protect Juvelian. It was astonishing that his father had known her name before she was even born. While sorting through the mementos left behind in his father's study, Legis stumbled upon his father's diary. Within its pages, Legis discovered a startling confession from his father, who described himself as an unforgivable criminal, a powerless individual who succumbed to the emperor's threats, unable to prevent the deaths of countless magicians. In his father's diary, 
Legis's father expressed profound remorse in the presence of the goddess Circe statue and was on the verge of taking his own life when he experienced a vision. In this vision, he saw a grieving girl mourning her father who turned out to be his son. The girl was crying over his son's loss and someone called out her name, Juvelian. She possessed an extraordinary amount of mana, being the first magician ever born into the Floyan lineage. Legis was left deeply shocked by this revelation. Furthermore, in the diary, Legis's father disclosed that he was aware of Legis removing Amelia's name from the list of magicians. He had overlooked this significant error out of paternal hope that Legis could find happiness with the woman he loved, inspired by the young magician he had witnessed that day. Legis's father firmly believed that Juvelian would ultimately inherit the goddess's power and hoped that Legis would endure until the end. Upon uncovering this truth, Legis found himself summoned to face the emperor. The emperor requested Legis to become the leader of the Central Knights. Although Legis initially attempted to decline politely, the emperor cut him off and commanded him to swear an oath upon Circe's ring. The emperor then threatened Legis, revealing that he knew about Amelia, Legis's wife, being a magician. He made an offer to Legis, assuring that as long as he formed the contract, nothing adverse would befall him. Darius insisted that Legis make the contract on the spot to safeguard his wife and their unborn child. After revealing these revelations to Max and Juvel, Legis also points out that Fafnir requires more than human mana to escape the ring. With a determined look, Juvel clearly comprehends that Fafnir will go to great lengths to obtain her mana, no matter the cost. In the dungeon, Fafnir extracts Juvel's mana from Beatrice. However, when Beatrice broaches the subject of becoming the ring's mistress, Fafnir defers, stating that the mana she brought is so feeble that it cannot even make Legis go berserk, let alone free him. Nevertheless, he acknowledges that he's starting to consider her a more suitable mistress of the ring, particularly since she expressed her intent to aid in the Empire's destruction. Beatrice then discloses her desire to be crowned the ring's mistress on the Empire's founding day, with a grand audience watching, where she intends to harness the ring's power to annihilate everything. While Fafnir appreciates her determination, he presents her with a single condition to meet this goal. The following day, Max meets with his father, the Emperor, to report about the monster's appearance at the hunting competition. Max reveals that the day prior to the competition, the Hessen family had paid a considerable sum to a prominent merchant to capture a specific monster, the dire wolf. Since an ordinary merchant couldn't capture such a formidable creature, the merchant acted as a supervisor while the Hessen family's knights conducted the actual hunt. Darius, the emperor, can't help but exclaim, inquiring about Max's point. Max proceeds to highlight the gravity of the situation, emphasizing that the monster intended for the knights to hunt appeared not in the forest, but in the spectator stands, causing extensive damage to the nobles. He further accuses Darius, the individual behind the Hessen family and Beatrice's engagement, of having knowledge regarding this event. This revelation causes Darius to reveal his anxiety and irritation, despite his attempts to deflect the allegations by claiming he's ignorant. Max, maintaining his composure, informs Darius that the relevant merchant is under his protection to prevent any potential assassination attempts. Unable to contain his frustration any longer, Darius explodes in anger, demanding to know what difference it would make if the Hessen family had unleashed that monster, as revealing such information would not sway the equally corrupt nobles to support Max. In response, Max contends that while the nobles may be self-centered and only concerned with their interests, they will not condone an emperor who would employ monsters to harm people. Max goes on to assert that Darius risked his own daughter's life to awaken her as a magician and murdered countless innocents to siphon their mana. Darius, upon hearing this, bursts into laughter, asserting that Max will never bring him down. He reveals the existence of a secret weapon capable of killing Max, even now, and hints at using Legis's name as a scapegoat for the Emperor's actions. Unexpectedly, Legis enters the room, and Max immediately questions him about whether he overheard the entire conversation, and if the Emperor had been threatening him all along. Legis acknowledges that he is obligated to obey the Emperor's commands, whether they be imperial decrees or threats, 
except if Darius is the ring's master, to which Darius visibly pales. Legis then announces that Fafnir is not currently residing within the ring. He should be with the princess. Consequently, Legis orders the knights to detain the still-shocked Darius. As the knights apprehend Darius, he attempts to call Fafnir, but to no avail. Max promptly removes the ring from Darius's finger. Then, Max declares that Darius is being placed under custody for his involvement in the attempted assassination of the princess during the hunting competition, as well as his complicity in harming nobles, along with charges of kidnapping, unlawful imprisonment, and the murder of commoners. He further proclaims that Darius will remain incarcerated until the day of the trial to prevent any tampering with evidence. In response to Darius invoking his authority as a member of the imperial family, Max reminds him that he too is a part of the imperial family, and they have the authority to subject Darius to a trial, drawing attention to the nation's founding, which occurred through the execution of a father. Legis then directs the knights to escort Darius to the Chamber of Shadows. While Max holds Cersei's ring in his hand, Legis begins to sense that something is amiss, suspecting that the ring might be a counterfeit. Meanwhile, Fafnir presents an offer to Beatrice. He will accept her as the ring's owner if she eliminates Juvel. Fafnir displays the ring, explaining that Darius would have inevitably lost it if left in his possession. Beatrice discerns Fafnir's intentions and plays along, asserting that she cannot approach Juvel, who is protected by Legis and Max. She elaborates that things would be different if she could control Legis. Beatrice confidently states that if Fafnir desires to kill Juvel and break free from the ring, he must first transfer ownership to her. Back at the Floyan residence, Geraldine informs Juval that the Emperor's trial has been scheduled for the day of the Empire's founding. Juval recalls that in her previous life, Beatrice had ingested poison on that day, leading to her collapse. Fortunately, Juval has already advised Beatrice not to consume any food or drink on the founding day. Observing Juval's concerned expression, Geraldine reassures her that everything is proceeding according to plan, urging her not to worry. Juval can only hope that nothing untoward occurs. Nevertheless, Juval remains deeply concerned and harbors doubts about Fafnir's cooperation. She suspects that Max and Legis might be keeping something from her. And though she feels uneasy about sneaking into Legis's study to uncover the truth, her anxiety prevails. Her quest for answers leads her to stumble upon a letter from Max to Legis, in which Max requests the deciphering of Cersei's prophecy. In the midst of her investigation, Selly, Legis's pet bird, makes an unexpected appearance carrying a letter in its beak. However, upon noticing Juvel's fear, the bird takes flight once more, inadvertently dropping the letter onto Juvel's head. Unable to resist her curiosity, Juvel opens the letter and begins to read. The letter is addressed to Fresha from Legis, instructing her to remove Juvel from the attendance list for the founding celebration. Meanwhile, in Salon Blooms, Legis is engaged in a meeting with Max, and he hands over the translation he created of Xerxes' prophecy, as per Max's request. As Max delves into the translation, he is visibly shocked. The prophecy reveals that according to the goddess of the empire, Fafnir will attempt to seduce the sons and daughters of Ashet to free himself from the ring. The prophecy serves as a warning not to succumb to Fafnir's wiles. It also hints at the possibility of the goddess sending a child who resembles her the most to reseal Fafnir in case the empire is threatened. However, this heroic child may sacrifice her life once she depletes all her mana. Max's fury mounts after reading the prophecy, unable to accept that the goddess Circe's apparent solution involves a sacrifice, and it becomes evident that he and Legis are determined to thwart Fafnir's plans without allowing Jevil to bear the burden. Little do they know that Juvel, using her magic to become invisible, overhears their discussion. When Legis admits he is willing to risk his life and explains that Max should live a happy life with Juvel, it moves Juvel to tears. Unable to fulfill Legis's wish this time, she suddenly reappears at the Floyan residence in front of the knights and tearfully implores them for assistance. Juvel, with tears in her eyes, bears her newfound knowledge to the knights, pleading for their help to infiltrate the upcoming founding celebration. In the midst of her emotional plea, Geraldine delivers a heartbreaking response. 
He explains that he cannot assist her in this matter, as it is a direct order from the Duke, emphasizing the priority of safeguarding her above all else. The knights, resolute and unwavering, echo this sentiment and assure Juval that, with the Duke and the Empire's strongest knights united, their plan is bound to succeed. Tearfully, Juval leaves them behind, feeling both frustrated and anxious. She realizes that Fafnir poses a far greater threat than they initially believed and resolves to take matters into her own hands to save everyone. Meanwhile, within her chamber, Isabel seethes with anger over the events involving the Emperor, holding Mikhail partially responsible. Mikhail, however, reveals his hidden strategy to Isabel, sharing a message from the Emperor himself. It instructs her to personally eliminate the princess, while also disclosing the intricate scenario they have devised. All that remains is for Isabel to provide Beatrice with a poisoned drink on the appointed day. On the day of the founding celebration, with Darius securely bound to a chair and his mouth gagged, Max takes the stage to commence the ceremony, declaring that this moment will forever alter the Empire's history. Seated in her place, Isabel questions Beatrice about her belief in Darius's involvement in the assassination attempt. Beatrice, with unwavering confidence, asserts that if Juvel had not intervened on that day, she would indeed have perished. In response, Isabel summons a servant to bring her a drink, which she subsequently hands to Beatrice. Observing Beatrice's immediate willingness to accept the glass, Isabel comments on her apparent trust, even after allying with the crown prince against her and the emperor. She expresses her own lack of trust in Beatrice, emphasizing her history of defying orders. However, Isabel abruptly reclaims the glass from Beatrice, beseeching her to promise survival, and proceeds to drink from it, displaying a helpless look as she does so. Meanwhile, Mikhail raises an objection, accusing Max of framing the emperor to usurp the throne for himself. He contends that he possesses evidence of Max's torture of Hessen family knights and merchants to extract information. Suddenly, Isabel approaches and instructs Mikhail to refrain from speaking. In her dying state after consuming poison, she asserts the emperor's guilt, deeming herself the proof. Isabel discloses that Darius orchestrated the attack during the hunting competition and again on that day. Not stopping there, she unveils that the Emperor was responsible for the sudden disappearances of countless innocent magicians. She bitterly curses him for conspiring to kill his own daughter and wishes him to rot in hell. Legis orders the knights to apprehend Marquis Hessen and Mikhail immediately. However, Fafnir makes an appearance, causing Max to urge everyone to follow the Central Knight's orders and evacuate the area. As people scramble to leave, Mikhail attempts an escape, but Juval captures him. The knights swiftly immobilize Mikhail, preventing him from fleeing any further. Darius then orders Fafnir to use Legis to eliminate them all. Fafnir swiftly gains control over Legis, and with Legis under his dominion, he directs his attacks toward Beatrice. In a swift response, Max steps in to shield her from Legis' assaults. After evading Legis' attacks multiple times, Max discerns a vulnerability in Legis and seizes the opportunity to counterattack. However, Legis regains his footing and launches an assault on Max, who is endeavoring to protect Beatrice. Unexpectedly, Juval materializes using her magic, shielding them from Legis's attack. In a moment of clarity, Legis attempts to warn Juval that she should not be there. Nevertheless, Juval acts without hesitation, approaching Fafnir and using her magic, takes the Circe's ring from him. Since it's not Fafnir's true form, Max's attacks are rendered ineffective. Juval conveys her disappointment to her father, expressing her disapproval of his attempts to handle such a perilous situation without her. She reveals that upon learning of Legis and Max's plan, she immediately sought an audience with the goddess. The goddess informed Juval that Fafnir's physical form is sealed within the ring, along with the goddess's power. She elaborates that Fafnir has grown so feeble that he needs to inhabit Juval's body. This revelation underscores Juval's intent to break the seal, freeing Fafnir's true form in order to confront him once and for all by harnessing the goddess's stored power within the ring. Upon hearing this, Legis is filled with concern and vehemently disagrees with the plan. However, Juval attempts to reassure him, emphasizing her love for him and the others she cares about. 
She is determined to prevent the Empire's downfall and protect her loved ones. This leads her to the decision to release Fafnir by breaking the ring's seal. As the ring shatters, Fafnir emerges from it, revealing his true form as a dragon. After absorbing the entirety of the goddess's power, Juvel falls unconscious, and they're shielded by the protective barrier cast by Beatrice. Upon regaining her consciousness, Max advises Juvel to take some time to acclimate to her new mana and assures her that he and Legis will handle Fafnir. Legis prepares himself with his sword Aura, acknowledging that their adversary is no longer human. Max responds by summoning his sword Aura and mentioning that he's accustomed to dealing with non-human entities, given his training under his non-human master. They both unleash their attacks on Fafnir in his primary form. Beatrice also plays her part, employing her magic to create a protective shield. Witnessing Beatrice's betrayal, Fafnir retaliates by launching an attack against her. However, Juvel steps in to protect Beatrice. Yet, the infusion of the goddess's power inside her has taken a toll on Juvel. The Floyan knights stand ready, employing a large chain in an attempt to immobilize Fafnir. However, Fafnir's power exceeds everyone's expectations, allowing him to break free from the chains and push them aside. This opening prompts Darius to make his escape, but when he spots Juvel, he becomes irate, blaming her for everything and charging at her with the intention of stabbing her from behind. In the nick of time, Legis intervenes and severs Darius's head from his body. He then turns to Juvel and inquires about her well-being. Juvel, however, is equally concerned for Legis. Unbeknownst to them, Fafnir seizes the opportunity to stab Legis from behind in front of Juvel. Panicked, Juvel calls out to Legis, who remains unresponsive. As Legis gradually closes his eyes, Juvel cries intensely, fearing the loss of her beloved father. Juvel desperately attempts to rouse her father, while Max and Beatrice do everything in their power to restrain Fafnir. Juvel then employs her magic to mend Legis. Observing her actions, Beatrice alerts Juvel to the fact that healing magic involves sharing her own life force with another person and cautions her against overexerting herself. However, Juvel remains undeterred, willing to make any sacrifice necessary to preserve Legis's life. Geraldine intervenes to protect Juvel and leads her away from the immediate danger. Max subsequently approaches Legis and, his face filled with profound sorrow, breaks the tragic news to Juvel that Legis has passed away. Juvel's heart shatters upon hearing the news, unable to believe what she has just been told. Acting on instinct, she seizes Legis's sword and declares her intent to slay Fafnir. With a resolute spirit, she charges at Fafnir, sword in hand. Fafnir ridicules her for attacking him with a weapon she has no training in. Max also initiates an assault on Fafnir from another angle. As he thrusts his sword into Fafnir, Max instructs Juvel to channel her mana through her sword to shatter Fafnir's barrier and aim for his heart. With unwavering determination, Juvel gathers her strength and channels her mana through the blade. Suddenly, Legis, holding her sword with his hand, appears behind Juvel. He encourages her to concentrate on the sword's tip and expresses his belief in her abilities. Tears of joy stream down Juvel's face as she witnesses her father's miraculous survival. Together, they focus their efforts on breaking through Fafnir's protective barrier with their swords. As the barrier shatters, Max wastes no time launching a relentless attack against Fafnir. Legis then insists that Juvel takes a much-needed rest, assuring her that he will take over from there. Juvel seeks confirmation from Legis once more about his well-being. Tenderly patting her head, Legis offers additional reassurance, stating that a minor injury could never defeat him, as he is the Empire's most formidable force. Reunited with Max, Legis readies himself to vanquish Fafnir once and for all. They assail Fafnir relentlessly, pushing him to the precipice of death. As Fafnir's main form teeters on the edge of dissolution, he frantically seeks refuge in a new host. Unexpectedly, Goddess Circe appears to Juvel, conveying that this is her sole opportunity to seal Fafnir while he exists in his spiritual form. With Circe's departure, Juvel's pendant begins to radiate with mana. Fafnir, in his final moments, strives to possess Juvel's body, but the pendant emits a brilliant, blinding light. 
In her dream, Amelia awakens Juval, impressing upon her the urgency of her return. Amelia reassures her that she will take charge from this point. Juval awakens to the worried voices of Beatrice, Legis, Geraldine, and Max. Legis and Max embrace her with profound relief, overjoyed to see Juval alive and well. Juval also expresses her relief that the ordeal has finally come to an end. Fafnir is successfully sealed within the necklace that Juval inherited from her mother. The malevolent dragon, which had once threatened the Empire, now lies confined deep within the Floyan residence's underground vault. The Emperor faces trial for attempting to utilize the malevolent dragon to obliterate the Empire, and is swiftly executed. Max ascends to the throne amidst the cheers of the masses. With the elimination of the evil that once plagued their family, they can now look forward to a future filled with happiness. Juval is radiant in her stunning attire, fully prepared for the grand occasion. Fresha provides her with a brief overview of the day's events, and Juval responds with a beaming smile, assuring her that she will do her utmost to avoid any mishaps. Just then, Legis appears, extending his hand and asking Juval if she's ready. As they stroll down the corridor together, Legis inquires about Juval's nerves, noticing her cold hands. Juval playfully teases him, suggesting that it's not her hands that are cold, but rather Legis's hands that are exceptionally warm. She also asks him to promise that he won't shed tears later. In a sudden turn of conversation, Legis suggests that it's not too late for Juval to reconsider, even if she chooses to remain single for the rest of her life. Juval, however, is resolute in her commitment, pointing out that the wedding has already commenced. Nevertheless, Legis persists, suggesting they still have time since she has not yet recited her vows. Upon entering the hall, Max stands there looking dashing in his attire. Legis, however, appears somewhat vexed, unwilling to release his grip on Juval's hand. After a brief internal struggle, Legis relents but his stern glances from behind convey a sense of disapproval. Max and Jubal proceed down the aisle together, moving the attendees to tears of joy. The initial event of the day is a tribute to the heroes of the founding celebration. The illustrious magician Beatrice assumes leadership of the Magic Tower, contributing to the education of young magicians. Frisha, Max's trusted right hand, is appointed as the captain of the Empress's Guard, finally reclaiming the position she was destined for. Her humorous remark about being liberated from the worst boss in the world fills the wedding hall with laughter. The five core members of the Floyan Knights, for their extraordinary efforts in suppressing Fafnir, receive high praise and are honored with positions as personal knights to the Imperial family. Every individual who has dedicated themselves to their respective roles is recognized and duly rewarded. Finally, the priest conveys his blessings on behalf of the goddess to Max and Juval, entrusting the future of the Ashet Empire to them. As the priest pronounces them husband and wife, Max seals the promise with a tender and loving kiss. A wave of emotion sweeps through all those present as they are moved by the long-awaited culmination of this momentous occasion. Max and Juval then declare their commitment to safeguard and govern the people of Ashet, officially assuming the roles of Emperor and Empress. Ready to greet the people of the Empire, they step outside, where Legis awaits, extending his loyalty to the new sovereigns. Max and Juval extend their greetings to the jubilant crowds throughout the Empire. During a lighthearted moment, Max recalls Juval's previous vow to never marry the Crown Prince, which feels like an eternity ago. Juval chuckles at the memory recalling that she initially perceived the crown prince as a villain with an unusual helmet. Max confesses that he too had no desire for marriage at the time, viewing it as a political arrangement devoid of love. Juval, on the other hand, confesses that she had once harbored dreams of marrying a prince during her childhood. In response, Max inquires about the reason behind this aspiration. Juval reminisces about her childhood when she used to read storybooks. She remembers a moment when she was curious and asked her parents what happened to the princess in the story after the defeat of the evil monster. Legis, at that time, assured her that the princess likely married the prince on the white horse whom she had always admired. Amelia chimed in, concluding that the princess then lived happily ever after. With this heartwarming tale, the series comes to a close, 
leaving everyone content. Beatrice, though somewhat bashful, appears happy with Victor by her side. Legis, who had been anxious about Juval for so long, can now relax, content in his daughter's happiness. Others have also found their own places and reasons for joy. All these feelings make Juval the happiest person in the world, as she now enjoys a blissful life with her new family, her beloved husband, and their children. Thanks for tuning in and sticking around for each part. I hope this series has brought some joy to your days. Don't forget to give that thumbs up and drop a comment below, and I'll catch you in the next one.